Analog's Lighter Side, edited by Stanley Schmidt. Copyright 1982 by Davis Publications, Incorporated. Narrated by Robertson Dean. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Annotation. Thirteen humorous and whimsical science fiction tales that have appeared in Analog Magazine over the past 50 years include stories about a radioactive goose that lays golden eggs, invading aliens thwarted by earthly weather and human illogic, and the perils of taking inventory on a spaceship, 1982. From the Book Jacket What happens when a goose really does give golden eggs, or a cow gives rocket fuel? How can a gadget which doesn't exist throw an interstellar empire into turmoil? What happens to alien invaders who come to the gentle earth and land in Tornado Alley? What is the truth about dragons? For more than 50 years, Analog, Science Fiction, Science Fact, founded in 1930 as Astounding Stories of Super Science, has been known as the leading magazine of serious science fictional speculation. But it has its lighter side, too, and here from its pages, with the original illustrations, is a smorgasbord of stories showing just how much fun speculation about the future can be. From the quietly whimsical, to the subtly satirical, to the completely outrageous, these tales, by such first-rate science fiction authors as Isaac Asimov, Lewis Paget, and Joe Haldeman, explore these questions and others of equal profundity. There are, after all, perfectly logical explanations for such things as flying saucers and the alien artifacts of ancient civilizations, to say nothing of erudite bears, and you're sure to enjoy reading about them here. About the editor. Stanley Schmidt has a varied background, including formal training and professional experience as a physicist. One of the last writers developed by legendary editor John W. Campbell, he was a frequent contributor to Analog for ten years before becoming its editor in 1978. Side 1, Tone 1, Contents. Tone 2, Introduction by Stanley Schmidt. Tone 3, Ex Machina, Lewis Paget, April 1948. Tone 4, Pate de Foie Gras, Isaac Asimov, September 1956. Side 2, Tone 1, Peak, I See You, Paul Anderson, February 1968. Side 3, Tone 1, The Exalted, L. Sprague de Camp, November 1940. Tone 2, Gone with the Gods. Andrew J. Aufoot, October 1974. Side 4, Tone 1. Male Supremacy. Hayford Pierce, March 1975. Tone 2, The Gentle Earth. Christopher Anvil, November 1957. Side 5, Tone 1. A Tangled Web. Joe Haldeman, September 1981. Side 6, Tone 1. Despoilers of the Golden Empire. David Gordon, March 1959. Side 7, Tone 1. The Present State of Igneous Research. Gordon R. Dixon, January 1975. Tone 2. Make Mine Homogenized. Rick Raphael, April 1960. Side 8, Tone 1. Alamagusa. Eric Frank Russell, May 1955. Side 9, Tone 1. Ravenshaw of WBY Incorporated. W. McFarlane, March 1970. Introduction by Stanley Schmidt Shortly after I became editor of Analog, formerly Astounding, I finally cornered a certain author, or vice versa, and we sat down for a long overdue get-acquainted chat. This author, who appears by the way in these pages, so I suppose whichever of us bought the drinks got his money's worth, is known far and wide for his wit and irrepressible good humor, but he seemed surprised to hear that I was interested in seeing humorous stories. I assured him I was and his first sale to me was a completely outrageous and thoroughly delightful three-part serial. I'm not sure exactly why this illustrious bard was so surprised to hear that I was interested in humor. Perhaps it was my inordinately dignified appearance and demeanor. My lawyers are still investigating how my name came to be attached to a story called A Midsummer Newt's Dream. More likely it has to do with the long-standing reputation of Analog as a foremost magazine of serious science fictional speculation about the future. But there's no reason why you can't speculate seriously and have fun at the same time. In fact, a lot of us are in this business precisely because speculation is so much fun. Sometimes some of us get pretty frisky about it, too. 
The fact is that humor has always been an important part of analog. I like to have at least one truly funny story in every issue, and I'm perfectly willing to have more when I can get them. If overt humor has been a relatively small part of our contents in terms of pages occupied, it's not because my predecessors or I have been averse to it, but because good humor is hard to come by. Lots of people try to write it, but it's fiendishly difficult to do really well. To me, there is no higher art than comedy at its best. It has always seemed to me unfair that awards, in this field and most others, so seldom recognize this, and I have the utmost admiration for writers who can produce stories like those in this book. Not all of these are rib ticklers or thigh slappers, though some are. The spectrum of comedy is wider than that. There are moments of broad farce, but there are also the quiet whimsy of Gordon Dixon's treatise on dragons, Isaac Asimov's scholarly discourse on the goose which laid golden eggs, and a healthy helping of satire, for which analog readers seem to have a special affinity, perhaps because so many of them are personally employed by bureaucracies suspiciously resembling those in certain stories. There's even one story here, which you may not realize is a joke at all until you reach the end, at which point you'll see that the whole thing is its own punchline. But enough of this chatter. These stories don't need me to tell you why you'll enjoy them. Gallagher, Basili Weep, Johnny Black, Ravenshaw, and all the rest speak more than adequately for themselves, and they are ably assisted by a sampling of the art which accompanied their original appearances. And if you enjoy them as much as I think you will, I hope you'll remember that there are lots more where these came from, every month in the pages of Analog. Ex Machina by Lewis Paget. I got the idea out of a bottle labeled Drink Me, Gallagher said wanly. I'm no technician except when I'm drunk. I don't know the difference between an electron and an electrode except that one's invisible. At least I do know, sometimes, but they get mixed up. My trouble is semantics. Your trouble is you're a lush, said the transparent robot, crossing its legs with a faint crash. Gallagher winced. Not at all. I get along fine when I'm drinking. It's only during my periods of sobriety that I get confused. I have a technological hangover. The aqueous humor in my eyeballs is coming out by osmosis. Does that make sense? No, said the robot, whose name was Joe. You're crying, that's all. Did you turn me on just to have an audience? I'm busy at the moment. Busy with what? I'm analyzing philosophy per se. Hideous as you humans are, you sometimes get bright ideas. The clear intellectual logic of pure philosophy is a revelation to me. Gallagher said something about a hard, gem-like flame. He still wept sporadically, which reminded him of the bottle labeled Drink Me, which reminded him of the liquor organ beside the couch. Gallagher stiffly moved his long body across the laboratory, detouring around three bulky objects, which might have been the dynamos, Monstro, and Bubbles, except for the fact that there were three of them. This realization flickered only dimly through Gallagher's mind. Since one of the dynamos was looking at him, he hurriedly averted his gaze, sank down on the couch, and manipulated several buttons. When no liquor flowed through the tube into his parched mouth, he removed the mouthpiece, blinked at it hopelessly, and ordered Joe to bring beer. The glass was brimming as he raised it to his lips, but it was empty before he drank. That's very strange, Gallagher said. I feel like Tantalus. Somebody's drinking your beer, Joe explained. Now do leave me alone. I have an idea I'll be able to appreciate my Baroque beauty even more after I've mastered the essentials of philosophy. No doubt, Gallagher said. Come away from that mirror. Who's drinking my beer, a little green man? A little brown animal, Joe explained cryptically, and turned to the mirror again, leaving Gallagher to glare at him hatefully. There were times when Mr. Galloway Gallagher yearned to bind Joe securely under a steady drip of hydrochloric. Instead, he tried another beer, with equal ill luck. In a sudden fury, Gallagher rose and procured soda water. The little brown animal had even less taste for such fluids than Gallagher himself. At any rate, the water didn't mysteriously vanish. Less thirsty, but more confused than ever, Gallagher circled the third dynamo with the bright blue eyes and morosely examined the equipment littering his workbench. There were bottles filled with ambiguous liquids, obviously non-alcoholic, but the labels meant little or nothing. Gallagher's subconscious self, liberated by liquor last night, had marked them for easy reference. Since Gallagher Plus, though a top-flight technician, saw the world through thoroughly distorted lenses, the labels were not helpful. One said, Rabbits only. Another inquired, Why not? 
A third said, Christmas night. There was also a complicated affair of wheels, gears, tubes, sprockets, and light tubes plugged into an electric outlet. Cogito ergo sum, Joe murmured softly. When there's no one around on the quad, no. <laughs> what about this little brown animal, Gallagher wanted to know. Is it real or merely a figment? What is reality, Joe inquired, thus confusing the issue still further. I haven't resolved that yet to my own satisfaction. Your satisfaction, Gallagher said. I wake up with a tenth power hangover and can't get a drink. You tell me fairy stories about little brown animals stealing my liquor. Then you quote moldy philosophical concepts at me. If I pick up that crowbar over there, you'll neither be nor think in very short order. Joe gave ground gracefully. It's a small creature that moves remarkably fast. So fast it can't be seen. How come you see it? I don't. I varish it, said Joe, who had more than the five senses normal to humans. Where is it now? It went out a while ago. Well, Gallagher sought inconclusively for words. Something must have happened last night. Naturally, Joe agreed. But you turned me off after the ugly man with the ears came in. I remember that. You were beating your plastic gums... What man? The ugly one. You told your grandfather to take a walk, too, but you couldn't pry him loose from his bottle. Grandpa? Ah. Uh. Oh. Where's he? Maybe he went back to Maine, Joe suggested. He kept threatening to do that. He never leaves till he's drunk out the cellar, Gallagher said. He tuned in the audio system and called every room in the house. There was no response. Presently, Gallagher got up and made a search. There was no trace of Grandpa. He came back to the laboratory, trying to ignore the third dynamo with the big blue eyes, and hopelessly studied the workbench again. Joe, posturing before the mirror, said he thought he believed in the basic philosophy of intellectualism. Still, he added, since obviously Gallagher's intellect was in abeyance, it might pay to hook up the projector and find out what had happened last night. This made sense. Some time before, realizing that Gallagher Sober never remembered the adventures of Gallagher Tight, he had installed a Vizio audio gadget in the laboratory, cleverly adjusted to turn itself on whenever circumstances warranted it. How the thing worked, Gallagher wasn't quite sure any more, except that it could run off miraculous blood alcohol tests on its creator and start recording when the percentage was sufficiently high. At the moment, the machine was shrouded in a blanket. Gallagher whipped this off, wheeled over a screen, and watched and listened to what had happened last night. Joe stood in a corner, turned off, probably cogitating. Grandpa, a wizened little man with a brown face like a bad-tempered nutcracker, sat on a stool cuddling a bottle. Gallagher was removing the liquor organ mouthpiece from between his lips, having just taken on enough of a load to start the recorder working. A slim, middle-aged man with large ears and an eager expression jittered on the edge of his relaxer, watching Gallagher. "'Claptrap!' Grandpa said in a squeaky voice. "'When I was a kid, we went out and killed grizzlies with our hands. "'None of these new-fangled ideas.' "'Grandpa,' Gallagher said, "'shut up. "'You're not that old, and you're a liar anyway. "'Reminds me of the time I was out in the woods and a grizzly came at me. "'I didn't have a gun. "'Well, I tell you, I just reached down his mouth. "'Your bottle's empty,' Gallagher said cleverly. "'And there was a pause while Grandpa, startled, investigated. "'It wasn't.' You were highly recommended, said the eager man. I do hope you can help me. My partner and I are about at the end of our rope. Gallagher looked at him dazedly. You have a partner? Who's he? For that matter, who are you? Dead silence fell while the eager man fought with his bafflement. Grandpa lowered his bottle and said, It wasn't empty, but it is now. Where's another? The eager man blinked. Mr. Gallagher, he said faintly, I don't understand. We've been discussing, Gallagher said. I know, I'm sorry. It's just that I'm no good on technical problems unless I'm, uh, stimulated. Then I'm a genius. But I'm awfully absent-minded. I'm sure I can solve your problem, but the fact is I've forgotten what it is. I suggest you start from the beginning. Who are you, and have you given me any money yet? I'm Jonas Harding, the eager man said. I've got 50,000 credits in my pocket— but we haven't come to any terms yet. Then give me the dough and we'll come to terms, Gallagher said with ill-concealed greed. 
I need money. You certainly do, Grandpa put in, searching for a bottle. You're so overdrawn at the bank that they lock the doors when they see you coming. I want a drink. Try the organ, Gallagher suggested. Now, Mr. Harding, I want a bottle. I don't trust that doohinkus of yours. Harding, for all his eagerness, could not quite conceal a growing skepticism. As for the credits, he said, I think perhaps we'd better talk a little first. You were very highly recommended, but perhaps this is one of your off days. Not at all. Still, why should I give you the money before we come to terms, Harding pointed out, especially since you've forgotten who I am and what I wanted. Gallagher sighed and gave up. All right. Tell me what you are and who you want. I mean, I'll go back home, Grandpa threatened. Where's a bottle? Harding said desperately, Look, Mr. Gallagher, there's a limit. I come in here and that robot of yours insults me. Your grandfather insists I have a drink with him. I'm nearly poisoned. I was weaned on corn liquor, Grandpa muttered. Young whippersnappers can't take it. Then let's get down to business, Gallagher said brightly. I'm beginning to feel good. I'll just relax here on the couch, and you can tell me everything. He relaxed and sucked idly at the organ's mouthpiece, which trickled a gin buck. Grandpa cursed. Now, Gallagher said, the whole thing, from the beginning. Harding gave a little sigh. Well, I'm half partner in Adrenals Incorporated. We run a service, a luxury service, keyed to this day and age. As I told you, I've forgotten it all. Gallagher murmured. You should have made a carbon copy. What is it you do? I've got a mad picture of you building tiny prefabricated houses on top of kidneys, but I know I must be wrong. You are, Harding said shortly. Here's your carbon copy. We're in the adrenal rousing business. Today man lives a quiet, safe life. Ha! Gallagher interjected bitterly. What with safety controls and devices, medical advances, and the general structure of social living— now the adrenal glands serve a vital functional purpose, necessary to the health of the normal man. Harding had apparently launched into a familiar sales talk. Ages ago we lived in caves, and when a saber-tooth burst out of the jungle, our adrenals, our super-renals, went into instant action, flooding our systems with adrenaline. There was an immediate explosion of action, either toward fight or flight, and such periodic flooding of the bloodstream gave tone to the whole system not to mention the psychological advantages. Man is a competitive animal. He's losing that instinct, but it can be roused by artificial stimulation of the adrenals. A drink? Grandpa said hopefully, though he understood practically nothing of Harding's explanation. Harding's face became shrewder. He leaned forward confidentially. Glamour, he said. That's the answer. We offer adventure. Safe, thrilling, Dramatic, exciting, glamorous adventure to the jaded modern man or woman. Not the vicarious, unsatisfactory excitement of television. The real article. Adrenals Incorporated will give you adventure plus, and at the same time improve your health physically and mentally. You must have seen our ads. Are you in a rut? Are you jaded? Take a hunt, and return refreshed, happy, and healthy, ready to lick the world. A hunt? That's our most popular service, Harding said, relapsing into more businesslike tones. It's not new, really. A long time ago, travel bureaus were advertising thrilling tiger hunts in Mexico. Ain't no tigers in Mexico, Grandpa said. I've been there. I warn you. If you don't find me a bottle, I'm going right back to Maine. But Gallagher was concentrating on the problem. I don't see why you need me, then. I can't supply tigers for you. The Mexican tiger was really a member of the cat family. Puma, I think. We've got special reservations all over the world, expensive to set up and maintain. And there we have our hunts, with every detail carefully planned in advance. The danger must be minimized, in fact eliminated. But there must be an illusion of danger, or there's no thrill for the customer. We've tried conditioning animals so they'll stop short of hurting anyone, but, uh, that isn't too successful. We lost several customers, I'm sorry to say. This is an enormous investment, and we've got to recoup. But we've found we can't use tigers, or in fact any of the large carnivora. It simply isn't safe. But there must be that illusion of danger. The trouble is, we're degenerating into a trap-shooting club, and there's no personal danger involved in trap-shooting. Grandpa said, Want some fun, eh? Come up to Maine with me, and I'll show you some real hunting. 
We still got bear back in the mountains, Gallagher said. I'm beginning to see. But that personal angle, I wonder, what is the definition of danger anyhow? Danger's when something's trying to get you, Grandpa pointed out. The unknown, the strange, is dangerous too, simply because we don't understand it. That's why ghost stories have always been popular. A roar in the dark is more frightening than a tiger in the daylight. Harding nodded. I see your point, but there's another factor. The game mustn't be made too easy. It's a cinch to outwit a rabbit. And naturally, we have to supply our customers with the most modern weapons. Why? Safety precautions. The trouble is, with those weapons and scanners and scent analyzers, any fool can track down and kill an animal. There's no thrill involved unless the animal's a man-eating tiger, and that's a little too thrilling for our underwriters. So what do you want? I'm not sure, Harding said slowly. A new animal, perhaps. One that fulfills the requirements of Adrenals Incorporated. But I'm not sure what the answer is, or I wouldn't be asking you. Gallagher said, you don't make new animals out of thin air. Where do you get them? I wonder. Other planets? Other time sectors? Other probability words? I got hold of some funny animals once. Liblas. By tuning in on a future time era on Mars. But they wouldn't have filled the bill. Other planets, then? Gallagher got up and strolled to his workbench. He began to piece together stray cogs and tubes. I'm getting a thought. The latent factors inherent in the human brain. My latent factors are rousing to life. Let me see. Perhaps... Under his hands, a gadget grew. Gallagher remained preoccupied. Presently he cursed, tossed the device aside, and settled back to the liquor organ. Grandpa had already tried it, but choked on his first sip of a gin buck. He threatened to go back home and take Harding with him and show him some real hunting. Gallagher pushed the old gentleman off the couch. Now look, Mr. Harding, he said. I'll have this for you tomorrow. I've got some thinking to do. Drinking, you mean, Harding said, taking out a bundle of credits. I've heard a lot about you, Mr. Gallagher. You never work except under pressure. You've got to have a deadline or you won't do a thing. Well, do you see this? Fifty thousand credits. He glanced at his wristwatch. I'm giving you one hour. If you don't solve my problem by then, the deal's off. Gallagher started up from the couch as though he had been bitten. That's ridiculous. An hour isn't time enough, Harding said obdurately. I'm a methodical man. I know enough about you to realize that you're not. I can find other specialists and technicians, you know. One hour, or I go out that door and take these 50,000 credits with me. Gallagher eyed the money greedily. He took a quick drink cursed quietly, and went back to his gadget. This time he kept working on it. After a while, a light shot up from the work table and hit Gallagher in the eye. He staggered back, yelping. Are you all right? Harding asked, jumping up. Sure, Gallagher growled, cutting a switch. I think I'm getting it. That light! Ouch! I've sunburned my eyeballs. He blinked back tears. Then he went over to the liquor organ. After a hearty swig, he nodded at Harding. I'm getting on the trail of what you want. I don't know how long it'll take, though. He winced. Grandpa, did you change the setting on this thing? I don't know. I pushed some buttons. I thought so. This isn't a gin buck. Whew! Got a wallop, has it? Grandpa said, getting interested and coming over to try the liquor organ again. Not at all, Gallagher said, walking on his knees toward the audiosonic recorder. What's this? A spy, huh? We know how to deal with spies in this house, you dirty traitor. So saying, he rose to his feet, seized a blanket, and threw it over the projector. At that point, the screen, naturally enough, went blank. I cleverly outwit myself every time, Gallagher remarked, rising to switch off the projector. I go to the trouble of building that recorder and then blindfold it, just when matters get interesting. I know less than I did before, because there are more unknown factors now. Men can know the nature of things, Joe murmured. An important concept, Gallagher admitted. The Greeks found it out quite a while ago, though. 
Pretty soon, if you keep on thinking hard, you'll come up with the bright discovery that two and two are four. Be quiet, you ugly man, Joe said. I'm getting into abstractions now. Answer the door and leave me alone. The door? Why? The bell isn't ringing. It will, Joe pointed out. There it goes. Visitors at this time of the morning, Gallagher sighed. Maybe it's Grandpa, though. He pushed a button, studied the doorplate screen, and failed to recognize the lantern-jawed, bushy-browed face. All right, he said. Come in. Follow the guideline. Then he turned to the liquor organ thirstily before remembering his current tantalus proclivities. The lantern-jawed man came into the room. Gallagher said, Hurry up. I'm being followed by a little brown animal that drinks all my liquor. I've several other troubles, too, but the little brown animal's the worst. If I don't get a drink, I'll die. So tell me what you want and leave me alone to work out my problems. I don't owe you money, do I? That depends said the newcomer with a strong Scots accent. My name is Murdoch Mackenzie, and I assume you're Mr. Gallagher. You look untrustworthy. Where is my partner and the fifty thousand credits he had with him? Gallagher pondered. Your partner, eh? Huh? I wonder if you mean Jonas Harding. That's the lad, my partner in Adrenals Incorporated. I haven't seen him. With his usual felicity, Joe remarked, the ugly man with the big ears. How hideous he was. Very true, Mackenzie nodded. I note you're using the past tense, or rather that great clanking machine of yours is. Have you perhaps murdered me partner and disposed of his body with one of your scientific gadgets? Now look, Gallagher said, what's the idea? Have I got the mark of Cain on my forehead or something? Why should you jump to a conclusion like that? You're crazy. Mackenzie rubbed his long jaw and studied Gallagher from under his bushy gray brows. It would be no great loss, I know, he admitted. Jonas is little help in the business. Too methodical. But he had fifty thousand credits on his person when he came here last night. There is also the question of the body. The insurance is perfectly enormous. Between ourselves, Mr. Gallagher... I would not hold it against you if you had murdered my unfortunate partner and pocketed the fifty thousand. In fact, I would be willing to consider letting you escape with, uh, say, ten thousand, provided you gave me the rest. But not unless you provided me with legal evidence of Jonas's death, so my underwriters would be satisfied. Logic, Joe said admiringly. Beautiful logic. It's amazing that such logic should come from such an opaque horror. I would look far more horrible, my friend, if I had a transparent skin like you, Mackenzie said, if the anatomy charts are accurate. But we were discussing the matter of me partner's body. Gallagher said wildly, This is fantastic! You're probably laying yourself open to compounding a felony or something. Then you admit the charge. Of course not! You're entirely too sure of yourself, Mr. Mackenzie. I'll bet you killed Harding yourself and you're trying to frame me for it. How do you know he's dead? Now that calls for some explanation, I admit, Mackenzie said. Jonas was a methodical man. Vera, I have never known him to miss an appointment for any reason whatsoever. He had appointments last night and more this morning. One with me. Moreover, he had fifty thousand credits on him when he came here to see you last night. How do you know he got here? I brought him in me air cab. I let him out at your door. I saw him go in. Well, you didn't see him go out, but he did, Gallagher said. Mackenzie, quite unruffled, went on checking points on his body fingers. This morning I checked your record, Mr. Gallagher, and it's not a good one. Unstable, to say the least. You have been mixed up in some shady deals, and you have been accused of crimes in the past. Nothing was ever proved, but you're a sly one, I suspect. The police would agree. They can't prove a thing. Harding's probably home in bed. He is not. Fifty thousand credits is a lot of money. My partner's insurance amounts to much more than that. The business will be tied up sadly if Jonas remains vanished, and there will be litigation. Litigation costs money. I didn't kill your partner, Gallagher cried. Ah, Mackenzie smiled. Still, if I can prove that you did, it will come to the same thing and be reasonably profitable for me. You see your position, Mr. Gallagher. 
Why not admit it? Tell me what you did with the body and escape with five thousand credits. You said ten thousand a while ago. You're daft, Mackenzie said firmly. I said nothing of the sort. At least you cannot prove that I did. Gallagher said, Well, suppose we have a drink and talk it over. A new idea had struck him. An excellent suggestion. Gallagher found two glasses and manipulated the liquor organ. He offered one drink to Mackenzie, but the man shook his head and reached for the other glass. Poison, perhaps, he said cryptically. You have an untrustworthy face. Gallagher ignored that. He was hoping that with two drinks available, the mysterious little brown animal would show its limitations. He tried to gulp the whiskey fast, but only a tantalizing drop burned on his tongue. The glass was empty. He lowered it and stared at Mackenzie. A cheap trick, Mackenzie said, putting his own glass down on the workbench. I did not ask for your whiskey, you know. How did you make it disappear like that? Furious with disappointment, Gallagher snarled. I'm a wizard. I've sold my soul to the devil. For two cents, I'd make you disappear, too. Mackenzie shrugged. I am not worried. If you could, you'd have done it before this. As for wizardry, I am far from skeptical. After seeing that monster squatting over there, he indicated the third dynamo that wasn't a dynamo. What? You mean you see it, too? I see more than you think, Mr. Gallagher, Mackenzie said darkly. In fact... I am going to the police now. Wait a minute. You can't gain anything by that. I can gain nothing by talking to you. Since you remain obdurate, I will try the police. If they can prove that Jonas is dead, I will at least collect his insurance. Gallagher said, now wait a minute. Your partner did come here. He wanted me to solve a problem for him. Ah. And have you solved it? N no. At least... Then I can get no profit from you, Mackenzie said firmly, and turned to the door. You will hear from me very soon. He departed. Gallagher sank down miserably on the couch and brooded. Presently he lifted his eyes to stare at the third dynamo. It was not, then, a hallucination, as he had at first suspected. Nor was it a dynamo. It was a squat, shapeless object like a truncated pyramid that had begun to melt down, and two large blue eyes were watching him. Eyes, or agates, or painted metal, he couldn't be sure. It was about three feet high and three feet in diameter at the base. Joe, Gallagher said, why didn't you tell me about that thing? I thought you saw it, Joe explained. I did, but what is it? I haven't the slightest idea. Where could it have come from? Your subconscious alone knows what you were up to last night, Joe said. Perhaps Grandpa and Jonas Harding know, but they're not around, apparently. Gallagher went to the teleview and put in a call to Maine. Grandpa may have gone back home. It isn't likely he'd have taken Harding with him, but we can't miss any bets. I'll check on that. One thing, my eyes have stopped watering. What was that gadget I made last night? He passed to the workbench and studied the cryptic assemblage. I wonder why I put a shoehorn in that circuit. If you'd keep a supply of materials available here, Gallagher Plus wouldn't have to depend on makeshifts, Joe said severely. Uh, I could get drunk and let my subconscious take over again. No, I can't. Joe, I can't drink any more. I'm bound hand and foot to the water wagon. I wonder if Dalton had the right idea after all. Gallagher snarled. Do you have to extrude your eyes that way? I need help. You won't get it from me, Joe said. The problem's extremely simple, if you put your mind to it. Simple, is it? Then suppose you tell me the answer. I want to be sure of a certain philosophical concept first. Take all the time you want. When I'm rotting in jail, you can spend your leisure hours pondering abstracts. Get me a beer! No, never mind, I couldn't drink it anyway. What does this little brown animal look like? Oh, use your head, Joe said. Gallagher growled. I could use it for an anchor the way it feels. You know all the answers. Why not tell me instead of babbling? Men can know the nature of things, Joe said. 
Today is the logical development of yesterday. Obviously, you've solved the problem Adrenals Incorporated gave you. What? Oh, I see. Harding wanted a new animal or something. Well? I've got two of them, Gallagher said. That little brown invisible dipsomaniac and that blue-eyed critter sitting on the floor. Oh-ho! Where did I pick them up? Another dimension? How should I know? You've got them. I'll say I have, Gallagher agreed. Maybe I made a machine that scooped them off another world. And maybe Grandpa and Harding are on that world now. A sort of exchange of prisoners. I don't know. Harding wanted non-dangerous beasts elusive enough to give hunters a thrill. But where's the element of danger? He gulped. Conceivably, the pure alienage of the critters provides that illusion. Anyway, I'm shivering. Flooding the bloodstream with adrenaline gives tone to the whole system, Joe said smugly. So I captured or got hold of those beasts somehow, apparently, to solve Harding's problem. Hmm. Gallagher went to stand in front of the shapeless, blue-eyed creature. Hey, you, he said. There was no response. The mild blue eyes continued to regard nothing. Gallagher poked a finger tentatively at one of them. Nothing at all happened. The eye was immovable and hard as glass. Gallagher tried the thing's bluish, sleek skin. It felt like metal. Repressing his mild panic, he tried to lift the beast from the floor but failed completely. It was either enormously heavy or it had sucking discs on its bottom. Eyes, Gallagher said. No other sensory organs, apparently. That isn't what Harding wanted. I think it's clever of the turtle, Joe suggested. Turtle? Oh, like the armadillo. That's right. It's a problem, isn't it? How can you kill or capture a, a beast like this? Its exoderm feels plenty hard. It's immovable. That's it, Joe. Quarry doesn't have to depend on flight or fight. The turtle doesn't, and a barracuda could go nuts trying to eat a turtle. This would be perfect quarry for the lazy intellectual who wants a thrill. But what about adrenaline? Joe said nothing. Gallagher pondered, and presently seized upon some reagents and apparatus. He tried a diamond drill, he tried acids, he tried every way he could think of to rouse the blue-eyed beast. After an hour, his furious curses were interrupted by a remark from the robot. Well, what about adrenaline? Joe inquired ironically. Shut up, Gallagher yelped. That thing just sits there looking at me. Adren... What? Anger as well as fear stimulates the superrenals, you know. I suppose any human would become infuriated by continued passive resistance. That's right, said the sweating Gallagher, giving the creature a final kick. He turned to the couch... Increase the nuisance quotient enough and you can substitute anger for fear. But what about that little brown animal? I'm not mad at it. Have a drink, Joe suggested. All right, I am mad at the kleptomaniacal so-and-so. You said it moved so fast I can't see it. How can I catch it? There are undoubtedly methods. It's as elusive as the other critter is invulnerable. Could I immobilize it by getting it drunk? Metabolism. Burns up its fuel too fast to get drunk. Probably. But it must need a lot of food. Have you looked in the kitchen lately? Joe asked. Visions of a depleted larder filling his mind, Gallagher rose. He paused beside the blue-eyed object. This one hasn't got any metabolism to speak of. But it has to eat, I suppose. Still, eat what? Air? It's possible. The doorbell sang. Gallagher moaned, What now? and admitted the guest. A man with a ruddy face and a belligerent expression came in, told Gallagher he was under tentative arrest, and called in the rest of his crew, who immediately began searching the house. Mackenzie sent you, I suppose, Gallagher said. That's right. My name's Johnson, Department of Violence, unproved. Do you want to call counsel? Yes, said Gallagher, jumping at the opportunity. He used the visor to get an attorney he knew, and began outlining his troubles. But the lawyer interrupted him. Sorry, I'm not taking any jobs on spec. You know my rates. 
Who said anything about spec? Your last check bounced yesterday. It's cash on the line this time, or no deal. I... Now, wait. I've just finished a commission job that's paying off big. I can have the money for you. When I see the color of your credits, I'll be your lawyer, the unsympathetic voice said, and the screen blanked. The detective, Johnson, tapped Gallagher on the shoulder. So, you're overdrawn at the bank, huh? Needed money? That's no secret. Besides, I'm not broke now, exactly. I finished, uh... A job, yeah, I heard that too. So you're suddenly rich. How much did this job pay you? It wouldn't be 50,000 credits, would it? Gallagher drew a deep breath. I'm not saying a word, he said, and retreated to the couch, trying to ignore the department men who were searching the lab. He needed a lawyer. He needed one bad. But he couldn't get one without money. Suppose he saw Mackenzie... The visor put him in touch with the man. Mackenzie seemed cheerful. Hello, he said. I see the police have arrived. Gallagher said, Listen, that job your partner gave me, I've solved your problem. I've got what you want. Jonas's body, you mean? Mackenzie seemed pleased. No, the animals you wanted. The perfect quarry. Oh, well, why didn't you say so sooner? Get over here and call off the police, Gallagher insisted. I tell you, I've got your ideal hunt animals for you. I dinna ken if I can call off the blood homes, Mackenzie said, but I'll be over directly. I will not pay very much, you understand. Bah! Gallagher snarled and broke the connection. The visor buzzed at him. He touched the receiver, and the woman's face came in. She said, Mr. Gallagher? With reference to your call of inquiry regarding your grandfather, we report that investigation shows that he has not returned to our main sector. That is all. She vanished. Johnson said, What's this? Your grandfather? Where's he at? I ate him, Gallagher said, twitching. Why don't you leave me alone? Johnson made a note. Your grandfather. I'll just check up a bit. Incidentally, what's that thing over there? he pointed to the blue-eyed beast. I've been studying a curious case of degenerative osteomyelitis affecting a baroque cephalopod. Oh, I see. Thanks. Fred, see about this guy's grandfather. What are you gaping at? Fred said, That screen. It's set up for projection. Johnson moved to the audiosonic recorder. Better impound it. Probably not important, but... He touched a switch. The screen stayed blank, but Gallagher's voice said, We know how to deal with spies in this house, you dirty traitor. Johnson moved the switch again. He glanced at Gallagher, his ruddy face impassive, and in silence began to rewind the wire tape. Gallagher said, Joe, get me a dull knife. I want to cut my throat and I don't want to make it too easy for myself. I'm getting used to doing things the hard way. But Joe, pondering philosophy, refused to answer. Johnson began to run off the recording. He took out a picture and compared it with what showed on the screen. That's Harding, all right, he said. Thanks for keeping this for us, Mr. Gallagher. Don't mention it, Gallagher said. I'll even show the hangman how to tie the knot around my neck. Ha, ha, ha. Taking notes, Fred. Right. The reel unrolled relentlessly, but Gallagher tried to make himself believe there was nothing really incriminating recorded. He was disillusioned after the screen went blank, at the point when he had thrown a blanket over the recorder last night. Johnson held up his hand for silence. The screen still showed nothing, but after a moment or two voices were clearly audible. You have thirty-seven minutes to go, Mr. Gallagher. Just stay where you are. I'll have this in a minute. Besides, I want to get my hands on your fifty thousand credits. But relax. I'm getting it. In a very short time, your worries will be over. Did I say that? Gallagher thought wildly. What a fool I am. Why didn't I turn off the radio when I covered up the lens? Grandpa's voice said, Trying to kill me by inches, eh, you young whippersnapper? 
All the old so-and-so wanted was another bottle, Gallagher moaned to himself. But try to make those flat feet believe that. Still, he brightened, maybe I can find out what really happened to Grandpa and Harding. If I shot them off to another world, there might be some clue. Watch closely now, Gallagher's voice said from last night. I'll explain as I proceed. Uh-oh, wait a minute. I'm going to patent this later, so I don't want any spies. I can trust you two not to talk, but that recorder's still turned on to audio. Tomorrow, if I played it back, I'd be saying to myself, Gallagher, you talk too much. There's only one way to keep a secret safe. Off it goes. Someone screamed. The shriek was cut off midway. The projector stopped humming. There was utter silence. The door opened to admit Murdoch Mackenzie. He was rubbing his hands. I came right doon, he said briskly. So you've solved our problem, eh, Mr. Gallagher? Perhaps we can do business then. After all, there's no real evidence that you killed Jonas, and I'd be willing to drop the charges if you've got what Adrenals Incorporated wants. Pass me those handcuffs, Fred, Johnson requested. Gallagher protested. You can't do this to me! A fallacious theorem, Joe said, which I note is now being disproved by this empirical method. How illogical all you ugly people are! The social trend always lags behind the technological one, and while technology tended in these days toward simplification, the social pattern was immensely complicated, since it was partly an outgrowth of historical precedent and partly a result of the scientific advance of the era. Take jurisprudence. Cockburn and Blackwood and a score of others had established certain general and specific rules, say regarding patents, but those rules could be made thoroughly impractical by a single gadget. The integrators could solve problems no human brain could manage, so, as a governor, it was necessary to build various controls into those semi-mechanical colloids. Moreover, an electronic duplicator could infringe not only on patents but on property rights, and attorneys prepared voluminous briefs on such questions as whether rarity rights are real property, whether a gadget made on a duplicator is a representation or a copy, and whether mass duplication of chinchillas is unfair competition to a chinchilla breeder who depended on old-fashioned biological principles. All of which added up to the fact that the world, slightly punch-drunk with technology, was trying desperately to walk a straight line. Eventually the confusion would settle down. It hadn't settled down yet. So legal machinery was a construction far more complicated than an integrator. Precedent warred with abstract theory as lawyer warred with lawyer, it was all perfectly clear to the technicians, but they were much too impractical to be consulted. They were apt to remark wickedly, So my gadget unstabilizes property rights. Well, why have property rights then? And you can't do that. Not to a world that had found security of a sort for thousands of years in rigid precedence of social intercourse. The ancient dyke of formal culture was beginning to leak in innumerable spots, and, had you noticed, you might have seen hundreds of thousands of frantic small figures rushing from danger spot to danger spot, valorously plugging the leaks with their fingers, arms, or heads. Some day it would be discovered that there was no encroaching ocean beyond that dike, but that day hadn't yet come. In a way, that was lucky for Gallagher. Public officials were chary about sticking their necks out. A simple suit for false arrest might lead to fantastic ramifications and big trouble, the hard-headed Murdoch Mackenzie took advantage of this situation to vise his own personal attorney and toss a monkey wrench in the legal wheels. The attorney spoke to Johnson. There was no corpse. The audiosonic recording was not sufficient. Moreover, there were vital questions involving habeas corpus and search warrants. Johnson called headquarters jurisprudence, and the argument raged over the heads of Gallagher and the imperturbable Mackenzie. It ended with Johnson leaving, with his crew, and the increasing recording, and threatening to return as soon as a judge could issue the appropriate writs and papers. Meanwhile, he said, there would be officers on guard outside the house. With a malignant glare from Mackenzie, he stamped out. "'And now to business,' said Mackenzie, rubbing his hands. "'Between ourselves,' he leaned forward confidentially, "'I'm just as glad to get rid of that partner of mine. "'Whether or no you killed him, I hope he stays vanished.' Now I can run the business my way for a change. 
It's all right about that, Gallagher said, but what about me? I'll be in custody again as soon as Johnson can wangle it. But not convicted, Mackenzie pointed out. A clever lawyer can fix you up. There was a similar case in which the defendant got off with a defense of non-esse. His attorney went into metaphysics and proved that the murdered man had never existed. Quite specious, but so far the murderer's gone free. Gallagher said, I've searched the house, and Johnson's men did too. There's simply no trace of Jonas Harding or my grandfather. And I'll tell you frankly, Mr. Mackenzie, I haven't the slightest idea what happened to them. Mackenzie gestured airily. We must be methodical. You mentioned you had solved a certain problem for Adrenals Incorporated. No, I'll admit, that interested me. Silently, Gallagher pointed to the blue-eyed dynamo. Mackenzie studied the object thoughtfully. Well, he said, that's it. The perfect quarry. Mackenzie walked over to the thing, wrapped its hide, and looked deeply into the mild azure eyes. How fast can it run? he asked shrewdly. Gallagher said, it doesn't have to run. You see, it's invulnerable. Ha! Hmm. Perhaps if you'd explain a wee bit more. But Mackenzie did not seem pleased with the explanation. No, he said. I don't see it. There would be no thrill to hunt in a critter like that. You forget our customers demand excitement, adrenal stimulation. They'll get it. Anger has the same effect as rage, Gallagher went into detail. But Mackenzie shook his head. Both fear and anger give you excess energy you've got to use up. You can't against a passive quarry. You'll just cause neuroses. We try to get rid of neuroses, not create them. Gallagher, growing desperate, suddenly remembered the little brown beast and began to discuss that. Once Mackenzie interrupted with the demand to see the creature, Gallagher slid around that one fast. Ha! Mackenzie said finally. It isn't a canny. How can you hunt something that's invisible? Oh! Ultraviolet. Scent analyzers. It's a test for ingenuity. Our customers are not ingenious. They don't want to be. They want a change and a vacation from routine, hard work, or easy work, as the case may be. They want a rest. They don't want to beat their brains working out methods to catch a thing that moves faster than a pixie. Nor do they want to chase a critter that's out of sight before it even gets there. You are a very clever man, Mr. Gallagher. But it begins to look as though Jonas's insurance is me best bet after all. Now, wait, Mackenzie pursed his lips. I'll admit the beasties may, I say may, have some possibilities. But what good is quarry that can't be caught? Perhaps if you'd work out a way to capture these otherworldly animals of yours, we might do business. At present, I will not buy a pig in a poke. I'll find a way, Gallagher promised wildly, but I can't do it in jail. Ah, I am a little irritated with you, Mr. Gallagher. You tricked me into believing you had solved our problem, which you have not done. Yet. Consider the thought of jail. Your adrenaline may stimulate your brain into working out a way to trap these animals of yours. Though, even so, I can make no rash promises. Murdoch Mackenzie grinned at Gallagher and went out, closing the door softly behind him. Gallagher began to dine off his fingernails. Men can know the nature of things, Joe said, with an air of solid conviction. At that point matters were complicated even further by the appearance on the televisor screen of a grey-haired man who announced that one of Gallagher's checks had just bounced. Three hundred and fifty credits, the man said, and how about it? Gallagher looked dazedly at the identification card on the screen. You're with United Cultures? What's that? The gray-haired man said silkily, Biological and medical supplies and laboratories, Mr. Gallagher. What'll I order from you? We have a receipt for six hundred pounds of vitaplasm, first grade. We may deliver you within an hour. And when? The gray-haired man went into more detail. Finally, Gallagher made a few lying promises and turned from the blanking screen. He looked wildly around the lab. Six hundred pounds of artificial protoplasm, he murmured, ordered by Gallagher Plus. He's got delusions of economic grandeur. It was delivered, Joe said. 
You signed the receipt the night Grandpa and Jonas Harding disappeared. But what could I do with the stuff? It's used for plastic surgery and for humano prosthesis, artificial limbs and stuff. It's cultured cellular tissue, this vitoplasm. Did I use it to make some animals? That's biologically impossible, I think. How could I have molded vitoplasm into a little brown animal that's invisible? What about the brain and the neural structure? Joe, six hundred pounds of vitoplasm has simply disappeared. Where is it gone? But Joe was silent. Hours later, Gallagher was furiously busy. The trick is, he explained to Joe, to find out all I can about those critters. Then maybe I can tell where they came from and how I got them. Then perhaps I can discover where Grandpa and Harding went. Then why not sit down and think about it? That's the difference between us. You've got no instinct of self-preservation. You could sit down and think while a chain reaction took place in your toes and worked up, but not me. I'm too young to die. I keep thinking of Redding Jail. I need a drink. If I could only get high, my demon subconscious could work out the whole problem for me. Is that little brown animal around? No, Joe said. Then maybe I can steal a drink. Gallagher exploded after an abortive attempt that ended in utter failure. Nobody can move that fast! Accelerated metabolism. It must have smelled the alcohol. Or perhaps it has additional senses. Even I can scarcely varish it. If I mixed kerosene with the whiskey, maybe the dipsomaniac a little monster wouldn't like it. Still, neither would I. Ah, well, back to the mill, Gallagher said, as he tried reagent after reagent on the blue-eyed dynamo, without any effect at all. Men can know the nature of things, Joe said irritatingly. Shut up! I wonder if I could electroplate this creature. That would immobilize it all right. But it's immobilized already. How does it eat? Logically, I'd say osmosis. Very likely osmosis of what? Joe clicked irritatedly. There are dozens of ways you could solve your problem. Instrumentalism, determinism, vitalism. Work from a posteriori to a priori. It's perfectly obvious to me that you've solved the problem Adrenals Incorporated set you. I have? Certainly. How? Very simple. Men can know the nature of things. Will you stop repeating that outmoded basic and try to be useful? You're wrong, anyway. Men can know the nature of things by experiment and reason combined. Joe said, Ridiculous. Philosophical incompetence. If you can't prove your point by logic, you're failed. Anybody who has to depend on experiment is beneath contempt. Why should I sit here arguing philosophical concepts with a robot? Gallagher demanded of no one in particular. How would you like me to demonstrate the fact that ideation is dependent on your having a radioatomic brain that isn't scattered all over the floor? Kill me, then, Joe said. It's your loss and the world's. Earth will be a poorer place when I die. But coercion means nothing to me. I have no instinct of self-preservation. Now look, Gallagher said, trying a new tack. If you know the answer, why not tell me? Demonstrate that wonderful logic of yours. Convince me without having to depend on experiment. Use pure reason. Why should I want to convince you? I'm convinced, and I'm so beautiful and perfect that I can achieve no higher glory than to admire me. Narcissus, Gallagher snarled. You're a combination of Narcissus and Nietzsche's Superman. Men can know the nature of things, Joe said. The next development was a subpoena for the transparent robot. The legal machinery was beginning to move, an immensely complicated gadget that worked on a logic as apparently twisted as Joe's own. Gallagher himself, it seemed, was temporarily inviolate, through some odd interpretation of jurisprudence. But the state's principle was that the sum of the parts was equal to the whole. Joe was classified as one of the parts, the total of which equaled Gallagher. Thus the robot found itself in court listening to a polemic with impassive scorn. Gallagher, flanked by Murdoch Mackenzie and a corps of attorneys, was with Joe. This was an informal hearing. Gallagher didn't pay much attention. He was concentrating on finding a way to put the bite on the recalcitrant robot, who knew all the answers but wouldn't talk. He had been studying the philosophers with an eye toward meeting Joe on his own ground, 
but so far had succeeded only in acquiring a headache and an almost unendurable longing for a drink. Even out of his laboratory, though, he remained tantalous. The invisible little brown animal followed him around and stole his liquor. One of Mackenzie's lawyers jumped up. I object, he said. There was a brief wrangle as to whether Joe should be classified as a witness or as Exhibit A. If the latter, the subpoena had been falsely served. The justice pondered. As I see it, he declared, the question is one of determinism versus voluntarism. If this, uh, robot has free will, ha, Gallagher said, and was shushed by an attorney. He subsided rebelliously. Then it, or he, is a witness. But on the other hand, there is the possibility that the robot, in acts of apparent choice, is the mechanical expression of heredity and past environment. For heredity, read, uh, initial mechanical basics. Whether or not the robot is a rational being, Mr. Justice, is beside the point, the prosecutor put in. I do not agree. Law is based on recent... Joe said, Mr. Justice, may I speak? Your ability to do so rather automatically gives you permission, the Justice said, studying the robot in a baffled way. Go ahead. Joe had seemingly found the connection between law, logic, and philosophy. He said happily, I figured it all out. A thinking robot is a rational being. I am a thinking robot. Therefore, I am a rational being. What a fool, Gallagher groaned, longing for the sane logics of electronics and chemistry. The old Socratic syllogism. Even I could point out the flaw in that. Quiet, Mackenzie whispered. All the lawyers really depend on is tying up the case in such knots nobody can figure it out. Your robot is perhaps not such a fool as you think. An argument started as to whether thinking robots really were rational beings. Gallagher brooded. He couldn't see the point, really. Nor did it become clear until, from the maze of contradictions, there emerged the tentative decision that Joe was a rational being. This seemed to please the prosecutor immensely. Mr. Justice, he announced, we have learned that Mr. Galloway Gallagher, two nights ago, inactivated the robot before us now. Is this not true, Mr. Gallagher? But Mackenzie's hand kept Gallagher in his seat. One of the defending attorneys rose to meet the question. We admit nothing, he said. However, if you wish to pose a theoretical question, we will answer it. The query was posed theoretically. Then the theoretical answer is yes, Mr. Prosecutor. A robot of this type can be turned on and off at will. Can the robot turn itself off? Yes. But this did not occur. Mr. Gallagher inactivated the robot at the time Mr. Jonas Harding was with him in his laboratory two nights ago? Theoretically, that is true. There was a temporary inactivation. Then, said the prosecutor, we wish to question the robot, who has been classed as a rational being. The decision was tentative, a defense attorney objected. Accepted. Mr. Justice? All right, said the justice, who was still staring at Joe. You may ask your questions. Ah, ah, the prosecutor, facing the robot, hesitated. Call me Joe, Joe said. Thank you. Ah, uh, is this true? Did Mr. Gallagher inactivate you at the time and place stated? Yes. Then, the prosecutor said triumphantly, I wish to bring a charge of assault and battery against Mr. Gallagher. Since this robot has been tentatively classed as a rational being, any activity causing him or it to lose consciousness or the power of mobility is contra bonus moris and may be classified as mayhem. Mackenzie's attorneys were ruffled. Gallagher said, What does that mean? A lawyer whispered, They can hold you and hold that robot as a witness. He stood up. Mr. Justice, our statements were in reply to purely theoretical questions. The prosecutor said, But the robot's statement answered a non-theoretical question. The robot was not on oath. Easily remedied, said the prosecutor, while Gallagher saw his last hope slipping rapidly away. He thought hard while matters proceeded. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Gallagher leaped to his feet. Mr. Justice, I object. Indeed. To what? To the validity of that oath. Mackenzie said, Ah-ha. The justice was thoughtful. 
Will you please elucidate, Mr. Gallagher? Why should the oath not be administered to this robot? Such an oath is applicable to man only. And? It presupposes the existence of the soul. At least it implies theism, a personal religion. Can a robot take an oath? The justice eyed Joe. It's a point, certainly. Uh, Joe, do you believe in a personal deity? I do. The prosecutor beamed. Then we can proceed. Wait a minute, Murdoch Mackenzie said, rising. May I ask a question, Mr. Justice? Go ahead. Mackenzie stared at the robot. Well, now, will you tell me, please, what this personal deity of yours is like? Certainly, Joe said. Just like me. After a while, it degenerated into a theological argument. Gallagher left the attorneys debating the apparently vital point of how many angels could dance on the head of a pin, and went home temporarily scot-free with Joe. Until such points as the robot's religious basics were settled, nothing could be done. All the way, in the air cab, Mackenzie insisted on pointing out the merits of Calvinism to Joe. At the door, Mackenzie made a mild threat. I did not intend to give you so much rope, you understand, but you will work all the harder with the threat of prison hanging over your head. I don't know how long I can keep you a free man. If you can work out an answer quickly, what sort of answer? I am easily satisfied. Jonas's body, now, bah, Gallagher said, and went into his laboratory and sat down morosely. He siphoned himself a drink before he remembered the little brown animal. Then he lay back, staring from the blue-eyed dynamo to Joe and back again. Finally, he said, There's an old Chinese idea that the man who first stops arguing and starts swinging with his fists admits his intellectual defeat. Joe said, Naturally, reason is sufficient. If you need experiment to prove your point, you're a lousy philosopher and logician. Gallagher fell back on casuistry. First step, animal. Fist swinging. Second step, human. Pure logic. But what about the third step? What third step? Men can know the nature of things, but you're not a man. Your personal deity isn't an anthropomorphic one. Three steps, animal, man, and what we'll call for convenience Superman, though man doesn't necessarily enter into it. We've always attributed godlike traits to the theoretical superbeing. Suppose, just for the sake of having a label, we call this third-stage entity Joe. Why not, Joe said. Then the two basic concepts of logic don't apply. Men can know the nature of things by pure reason, and also by experiment and reason. But such second-stage concepts are as elementary to Joe as Plato's ideas were to Aristotle. Gallagher crossed his fingers behind his back. The question is, then... What's the third stage operation for Joe? Godlike, the robot said. You've got special senses, you know. You can varish, whatever that is. Do you need ordinary logical methods? Suppose, yes, Joe said. I can varish, all right. I can scren, too. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Gallagher abruptly rose from the couch. What a fool I am. Drink me. That's the answer. Joe, shut up. Go off in a corner and varish. I'm screnning, Joe said. Then scren, I finally got an idea. When I woke up yesterday, I was thinking about a bottle labeled Drink Me. When Alice took a drink, she changed size, didn't she? Where's that reference book? I wish I knew more about technology. Vasoconstrictor, hemostatic, here it is. Demonstrates the metabolic regulation mechanisms of the vegetative nervous system. Metabolism. I wonder now. Gallagher rushed to the workbench and examined the bottles. Vitalism. Life is the basic reality of which everything else is a form or manifestation. Now, I had a problem to solve for Adrenals Incorporated. Jonas Harding and Grandpa were here. Harding gave me an hour to fill the bill. The problem, a dangerous and harmless animal. Paradox. That isn't it. Harding's clients wanted thrills and safety at the same time. I've got no lab animals on tap at the moment. Joe! Well, watch, Gallagher said. He poured a drink and watched the liquid vanish before he tasted it. 
Now, what happened? The little brown animal drank it. Is that little brown animal by any chance Grandpa? That's right, Joe said. Gallagher blistered the robot's transparent hide with sulfurous oaths. Why didn't you tell me you... I answered your question, the robot said smugly. Grandpa's brown, isn't he? And he's an animal. But little! I thought it was a critter about as big as a rabbit. The only standard of comparison is the majority of the species. That's the yardstick. Compared to the average height of humans, Grandpa is little. A little brown animal. So it's Grandpa, is it? Gallagher said, returning to the workbench. And he simply speeded up. Accelerated metabolism. Adrenaline. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Now I know what to look for, maybe. He fell, too. But it was sundown before Gallagher emptied a small vial into a glass, siphoned whiskey into it, and watched the mixture disappear. A flickering began. Something flashed from corner to corner of the room. Gradually it became visible as a streaking brownness that resolved itself, finally, into Grandpa. He stood before Gallagher, jittering like mad as the last traces of the accelerated formula wore off. Hello, Grandpa, Gallagher said placatingly. Grandpa's nutcracker face wore an expression of malevolent fury. For the first time in his life the old gentleman was drunk. Gallagher stared in utter amazement. I'm going back to Maine! Grandpa cried, and fell over backwards. Never seen such a lot of slow pokes in my life, Grandpa said, devouring a steak. My, I'm hungry. Next time I let you stick a needle in me, I'll know better. How many months have I been like this? Two days, Gallagher said, carefully mixing up a formula. It was a metabolic accelerator, Grandpa. You just lived faster, that's all. All? Bah! Couldn't eat nothing. Food was solid as a rock. Only thing I could get down my gullet was liquor. Oh? Hard chewing. Even with my store teeth. Even whiskey tasted hotter. As for a steak like this, I couldn't have managed it. You were living faster. Gallagher glanced at the robot, who was still quietly screnning in a corner. Let me see. The antithesis of an accelerator is a decelerator. Grandpa, where's Jonas Harding? In there. Grandpa said, pointing to the blue-eyed dynamo and thus confirming Gallagher's suspicion. Vitaplasm. So that was it. That's why I had a lot of vitaplasm sent over a couple of nights ago. Mm hmm Gallagher examined the sleek, impermeable surface of the apparent dynamo. After a while he tried a hypodermic syringe. He couldn't penetrate the hard shell. Instead, using a new mixture he had concocted from the bottles on his workbench, he dripped a drop of the liquid on the substance. Presently it softened. At that spot Gallagher made an injection and was delighted to see a color change spread out from the locus until the entire mass was pallid and plastic. Vitaplasm, he exulted. Ordinary artificial protoplasm cells, that's all. No wonder it looked hard. I'd given it a decelerative treatment. An approach to molecular stasis. Anything metabolizing that slowly would seem hard as iron. He wadded up great bunches of the surrogate and dumped it into a convenient vat. Something began to form around the blue eyes, the shape of a cranium, broad shoulders, a torso. Freed from the disguising mass of vitaplasm, Jonas Harding was revealed crouching on the floor, silent as a statue. His heart wasn't beating, he didn't breathe. The decelerator held him in an unbreakable grip of passivity. Not quite unbreakable. Gallagher, about to apply the hypodermic, paused and looked from Joe to Grandpa. Now why did I do that? he demanded. Then he answered his own question. The time limit. Harding gave me an hour to solve his problem. Time's relative, especially when your metabolism is slowed down. I must have given Harding a shot of the decelerator so he wouldn't realize how much time had passed. Let's see. Gallagher applied a drop to Harding's impermeable skin and watched the spot soften and change hue. Uh-huh. With Harding frozen like that, I could take weeks to work on the problem. And when he woke up, he'd figure only a short time had passed. But why did I use the vitaplasm on him? Grandpa downed a beer. When you're drunk, you're apt to do anything, he contended, reaching for another steak. True, true, but Gallagher Plus is logical. 
a strange, eerie kind of logic, but logic nevertheless. Let me see. I shot the decelerator into Harding, and then there he was, rigid and stiff. I couldn't leave him kicking around the lab, could I? If anybody came in, they'd think I had a corpse on my hands. You mean he ain't dead? Grandpa demanded. Of course not. Merely decelerated. I know. I camouflaged Harding's body. I sent out for vitaplasm, molded the stuff around his body, and then applied the decelerator to the vitaplasm. It works on living cellular substance, slows it down, and slowed down to that extent, it's impermeable and immovable. You're crazy, Grandpa said. I'm short-sighted, Gallagher admitted. At least Gallagher Plus is. Imagine leaving Harding's eyes visible so I'd be reminded the guy was under that pile when I woke up from my binge. What did I construct that recorder for, anyhow? The logic Gallagher Plus uses is far more fantastic than Joe's. Don't bother me, Joe said. I'm still screnning. Gallagher put the hypodermic needle into the soft spot on Harding's arm. He injected the accelerator, and within a moment or two, Jonas Harding stirred, blinked his blue eyes, and got up from the floor. Ouch, he said, rubbing his arm. Did you stick me with something? An accident, Gallagher said, watching the man warily. Uh, this problem of yours. Harding found a chair and sat down, yawning. Solved it? You gave me an hour. Oh, yes, of course. Harding looked at his watch. It stopped. Well, what about it? Just how long a time do you think has elapsed since you came into this laboratory? Half an hour, Harding hazarded. Two months, Grandpa snapped. You're both right, Gallagher said. I'd have another answer, but I'd be right, too. Harding obviously thought that Gallagher was still drunk. He stayed doggedly on the subject. What about that specialized animal we need? You still have half an hour. I don't need it, Gallagher said, a great white light dawning in his mind. I've got your answer for you, but it isn't quite what you think it is. He relaxed on the couch and considered the liquor organ. Now he could drink again. He found he preferred to prolong the anticipation. I came upon no wine so wonderful as thirst, he remarked. Claptrap, Grandpa said. Gallagher said, The clients of Adrenals Incorporated want to hunt animals. They want a thrill, so they need dangerous animals. They have to be safe, so they can't have dangerous animals. It seems paradoxical, but it isn't. The answer doesn't lie in the animal. It's in the hunter. Harding blinked. Come again? Tigers. Ferocious, man-eating tigers. Lions, jaguars, water buffalo. The most vicious, carnivorous animals you can get. That's part of the answer. Uh, listen, Harding said. Maybe you've got the wrong idea. The tigers aren't our customers. We don't supply clients to the animals. It's the other way around. I must make a few more tests, Gallagher said. But the basic principle's right here in my hand. An accelerator. A latent metabolic accelerator with a strong concentration of adrenaline as the catalyst. Like this, he sketched a vivid verbal picture. Armed with a rifle, the client wandered through the artificial jungle, seeking quarry. He had already paid his fee to Adrenals Incorporated and got his intravenous shot of the latent accelerator. That substance permeated his bloodstream, doing nothing as yet, waiting for the catalyst. The tiger launched itself from the underbrush. It shot toward the client like catapulted murder fangs bared. As the claws neared the man's back, the suprarenal shot adrenaline into the bloodstream in strong concentration. That was the catalyst. The latent accelerative factor became active. The client speeded up tremendously. He stepped away from the body of the tiger, apparently frozen in midair, and did what seemed best to him before the effect of the accelerator wore off. When it did, he returned to normal, and by that time he could be in the supply station of Adrenals Incorporated getting another intravenous shot unless he decided to bag his tiger the easy way. It was as simple as that. Ten thousand credits, Gallagher said, happily counting them. The balance due as soon as I work out the catalytic angle, which is a cinch. Any fourth-rate chemist could do it. What intrigues me is the forthcoming interview between Harding and Murdoch Mackenzie. When they compare the time element, it's going to be funny. I want a drink, Grandpa said. Where's a bottle? Even in court, I think I could prove I only took an hour or less to solve the problem. It was Harding's hour, of course, but time is relative. Entropy. Metabolish. What a legal battle that would be. Still, it won't happen. I know the formula for the accelerator, and Harding doesn't. He'll pay the other 40000 
and Mackenzie won't have any kicks. After all, I'm giving Adrenals Incorporated the success factor they needed. Well, I'm still going back to Maine, Grandpa contended. Least you can do is give me a bottle. Go out and buy one, Gallagher said, tossing the old gentleman several credits. Buy several. I often wonder what the vintners buy. Eh? One half so precious as the stuff they sell. No, I'm not tight, but I'm going to be. Gallagher clutched the liquor organ's mouthpiece in a loving grip and began to play alcoholic arpeggios on the keyboard. Grandpa, with a parting sneer at such newfangled contraptions, took his departure. Silence fell over the laboratory. Bubbles and Monstro, the two dynamos, sat quiescent. Neither of them had bright blue eyes. Gallagher experimented with cocktails and felt a warm, pleasant glow seep through his soul. Joe came out of his corner and stood before the mirror, admiring his gears. Finished screnning? Gallagher asked sardonically. Yes. Rational being, forsooth. You and your philosophy. Well, my fine robot, it turned out I didn't need your help after all. Pose away. How ungrateful you are, Joe said, after I've given you the benefit of my super logic. Your what? You've slipped a gear. What super logic? The third stage, of course. What we were talking about a while back. That's why I was scredding. I hope you didn't think all your problems were solved by your feeble brain and that opaque cranium of yours. Gallagher sat up. What are you talking about? Third stage logic? You didn't. I don't think I can describe it to you. It's more abstruse than the noumenon of Kant, which can't be perceived except by thought. You've got to be able to scren to understand it, but, well, it's the third stage. It's, let's see, demonstrating the nature of things by making things happen by themselves. Experiment? No. By screnning, I reduce all things from the material plane to the realm of pure thought and figure out the logical concepts and solutions. But, wait, things have been happening. I figured out about Grandpa and Harding and worked out the accelerator. You think you did, Joe said. I simply screnned, which is a purely super-intellectual process. After I'd done that, things couldn't help happening. But I hope you don't think they happened by themselves, Gallagher said. What's screnning? You'll never know. But you're contending you're the first cause. No. It's voluntarism. Third stage logic? No. Gallagher fell back on the couch, staring. Who do you think you are, deus ex machina? Joe glanced down at the conglomeration of gears in his torso. What else? he asked smugly. Pâté de foie gras by Isaac Asimov I couldn't tell you my real name if I wanted to, and under the circumstances I don't want to. I'm not much of a writer myself unless you count the kind of stuff that passes muster in a scientific paper, so I'm having Isaac Asimov write this up for me. I've picked him for several reasons. First, he's a biochemist, so he understands what I tell him, some of it anyway. Secondly, he can write, or at least he has published considerable fiction, which may not, of course, be the same thing. But most important of all, he can get what he writes published in science fiction magazines, and he has written two articles on thiotimaline, and that is exactly what I need for reasons that will become clear as we proceed. I was not the first person to have the honor of meeting the goose. That belongs to a Texas cotton farmer named Ian Angus McGregor, who owned it before it became government property. The names, places, and dates I use are deliberately synthetic. None of you will be able to trace anything through them. Don't bother trying. McGregor apparently kept geese about the place because they ate weeds, but not cotton. In this way, he had automatic weeders that were self-fueling and, in addition, produced eggs, down, and, at judicious intervals, roast goose. By summer of 1955, he had sent an even dozen of letters to the Department of Agriculture requesting information on the hatching of goose eggs. The department sent him all the booklets on hand that were anywhere near the subject, but his letters simply got more impassioned and freer in their references to his friend, the local congressman. My connection with this is that I am in the employ of the Department of Agriculture. I have considerable training in agricultural chemistry, plus a smattering of vertebrate physiology. This won't help you. If you think you can pin my identity out of this, you are mistaken. Since I was attending a convention at San Antonio in July of 1955, my boss asked me to stop off at McGregor's place and see what I could do to help him. We're servants of the public, and besides, we had finally received a letter from McGregor's congressman. 
On July 17, 1955, I met the goose. I met McGregor first. He was in his fifties, a tall man with a lined face full of suspicion. I went over all the information he had been given, explained about incubators, the values of trace minerals in the diet, plus some late information on vitamin E, the cobalamins, and the use of antibiotic additives. He shook his head. He had tried it all, and still the eggs wouldn't hatch. What could I do? I'm a civil service employee and not the Archangel Gabriel. I told him all I could, and if the eggs still wouldn't hatch, they wouldn't, and that was that. I asked politely if I might see his geese, just so no one could say afterward I hadn't done all I possibly could. He said, It's not geese, mister, it's one goose. I said, May I see the one goose? Rather not. Well, then, I can't help you any further. If it's only one goose, then there's just something wrong with it. Why worry about one goose? Eat it. I got up and reached for my hat. He said, Wait. And I stood there while his lips tightened and his eyes wrinkled, and he had a quiet fight with himself. He said, If I show you something, will you swear to keep it secret? He didn't seem like the type of man to rely on another's vow of secrecy, but it was as though he had reached such a pit of desperation that he had no other way out. I said, If it isn't anything criminal, nothing like that, he snapped. And then I went out with him to a pen near the house, surrounded by barbed wire with a locked gate to it, and holding one goose, the goose. That's the goose, he said. The way he said it, I could hear the capitals. I stared at it. It looked like any other goose. Heaven help me. Fat, self-satisfied, and short-tempered. I said, Mm-hmm, in my best professional manner. McGregor said, And here's one of its eggs. It's been in the incubator. Nothing happens. He produced it from a compacious overall pocket. There was a queer strain about his manner of holding it. I frowned. There was something wrong with the egg. It was smaller and more spherical than normal. McGregor said, Take it. I reached out and took it, or tried to. I gave it the amount of heft an egg like that ought to deserve, and it just sat where it was. I had to try harder, and then up it came. Now I knew what was queer about the way McGregor held it. It weighed nearly two pounds. To be exact, when we weighed it later, we found its mass to be 852.6 grams. I stared at it as it lay there pressing down the palm of my hand, and McGregor grinned sourly. Drop it, he said. I just looked at him. So he took it out of my hand and dropped it himself. It hit soggy. It didn't smash. There was no spray of white and yolk. It just lay where it fell with the bottom caved in. I picked it up again. The white eggshell had shattered where the egg had struck. Pieces of it had flaked away, and what shone through was a dull yellow in color. My hands trembled. It was all I could do to make my fingers work. But I got some of the rest of the shell flaked away and stared at the yellow. I didn't have to run any analyses. My heart told me. I was face to face with the goose. The goose that laid the golden eggs. You don't believe me. I'm sure of that. You've got this tabbed as another Thiotimeline article. Good. I'm counting on your thinking that. I'll explain later. Meanwhile, my first problem was to get McGregor to give up that golden egg. I was almost hysterical about it. I was almost ready to clobber him and make off with the egg by force if I had to. I said, I'll give you a receipt. I'll guarantee you payment. I'll do anything in reason. Look, Mr. McGregor, they're no good to you anyway. You can't cash the gold unless you can explain how it came into your possession. Holding gold is illegal. And how do you expect to explain... If the government... I don't want the government butting in, he said stubbornly. But I was twice as stubborn. I followed him about. I pleaded. I yelled. I threatened. It took me hours. Literally. In the end, I signed a receipt, and he dogged me out to my car and stood in the road as I drove away, following me with his eyes. He never saw that egg again. Of course, he was compensated for the value of the gold. $656.47 after taxes had been subtracted, but that was a bargain for the government. When one considers the potential value of that egg, the potential value, that's the irony of it. That's the reason for this article. The head of my section at the Department of Agriculture 
is Louis P. Bronstein. Don't bother looking him up. The P stands for Pitfield if you want more misdirection. He and I are on good terms, and I felt I could explain things without being placed under immediate observation. Even so, I took no chances. I had the egg with me, and when I got to the tricky part, I just laid it on the desk between us. Finally, he touched it with his finger as though it were hot. I said, pick it up. It took him a long time, but he did, and I watched him take two tries at it as I had. I said, it's a yellow metal, and it could be brass, only it isn't, because it's inert to concentrated nitric acid. I've tried that already. There's only a shell of gold, because it can be bent with moderate pressure. Besides, if it were solid gold, the egg would weigh over ten pounds. Bronstein said, It's some sort of hoax. It must be. A hoax that uses real gold? Remember, when I first saw this thing, it was covered completely with authentic, unbroken eggshell. It's been easy to check a piece of the eggshell, calcium carbonate. That's a hard thing to gimmick. And if we look inside the egg, I don't want to do that on my own, Chief, and find real egg, then we've got it, because that would be impossible to gimmick. Surely this is worth an official project. How can I approach the secretary with... He stared at the egg. But he did in the end. He made phone calls and sweated out most of a day. One or two of the department brass came to look at the egg. Project Goose was started. That was July 20th, 1955. I was the responsible investigator to begin with and remained in titular charge throughout, though matters quickly got beyond me. We began with the one egg. Its average radius was 35 millimeters, major axis 72 millimeters, minor axis 68 millimeters. The gold shell was 2.45 millimeters in thickness. Studying other eggs later on, we found this value to be rather high. The average thickness turned out to be 2.1 millimeters. Inside was egg. It looked like egg and it smelled like egg. Aliquots were analyzed and the organic constituents were reasonably normal. The white was 9.7% albumin. The yolk had the normal complement of vitellin, cholesterol, phospholipid, and carotenoid. We lacked enough material to test for trace constituents, but later on with more eggs at our disposal we did, and nothing unusual showed up as far as the contents of vitamins, coenzymes, nucleotides, sulfur drill groups, etc., etc., were concerned. One important gross abnormality that showed was the egg's behavior on heating. A small portion of the yolk heated hard-boiled almost at once. We fed a portion of the hard-boiled egg to a mouse. It survived. I nibbled at another bit of it. Too small a quantity to taste, really, but it made me sick. Purely psychosomatic, I'm sure. Boris W. Finley of the Department of Biochemistry of Temple University, a department consultant, supervised these tests. He said, referring to the hard-boiling, the ease with which the egg proteins are heat-denatured indicates a partial denaturization to begin with and... Considering the nature of the shell, the obvious guilt would lie at the door of heavy metal contamination. So a portion of the yolk was analyzed for inorganic constituents, and it was found to be high in chlorate ion, which is a singly charged ion containing an atom of gold and four of chlorine, the symbol for which is AuCl4. The Au symbol for gold comes from the fact that the Latin word for gold is aurum. When I say the chlorate ion content was high, I mean it was 3.2 parts per thousand, or 0.032%. That's high enough to form insoluble complexes of gold protein, which would coagulate easily. Finley said, It's obvious this egg cannot hatch, nor can any other such egg. It is heavy metal poisoned. Gold may be more glamorous than lead, but it's just as poisonous to proteins. I agreed gloomily. At least it's safe from decay, too. Quite right. No self-respecting bug would live in this chloriferous soup. The final spectrographic analysis of the gold of the shell came in virtually pure. The only detectable impurity was iron, which amounted to 0.23% of the whole. The iron content of the egg yolk had been twice normal also. At the moment, however, the matter of the iron was neglected. One week after Project Goose was begun, an expedition was sent into Texas. Five biochemists went, the accent was still on biochemistry, you see, along with three truckloads of equipment and a squadron of army personnel. I went along, too, of course. As soon as we arrived, we cut McGregor's farm off from the world. That was a lucky thing, you know, the security measures we took right from the start. The reasoning was wrong at first, but the results were good. 
The department wanted Project Goose kept quiet at the start simply because there was always the thought that it might still be an elaborate hoax and we couldn't risk the bad publicity, if it were. And if it weren't a hoax, we couldn't risk the newspaper hounding that would definitely result over any Goose and Golden Egg story. It was only well after the start of Project Goose, well after our arrival at McGregor's farm, that the real implications of the matter became clear. Naturally, McGregor didn't like the men and equipment settling down all about him. He didn't like being told the goose was government property. He didn't like having his eggs impounded. He didn't like it, but he agreed to it, if you can call it agreeing when negotiations are being carried on while a machine gun is being assembled in a man's barnyard and ten men, with bayonets fixed, are marching past while the arguing is going on. He was compensated, of course. What's money to the government? The goose didn't like a few things either, like having blood samples taken. We didn't dare anesthetize it for fear of doing anything to alter its metabolism, and it took two men to hold it each time. Ever try to hold an angry goose? The goose was put under a 24-hour guard with a threat of summary court-martial to any man who let anything happen to it. If any of those soldiers read this article, they may get a sudden glimmering of what was going on. If so, they will probably have the sense to keep shut about it. At least, if they know what's good for them, they will. The blood of the goose was put through every test conceivable. It carried two parts per hundred thousand, 0.002 percent, of chlorate ion. Blood taken from the hepatic vein was richer than the rest, almost four parts per hundred thousand. Finley grunted. The liver, he said. We took x-rays. On the x-ray negative, the liver was a cloudy mass of light gray, lighter than the viscera in its neighborhood, because it stopped more of the x-rays, because it contained more gold. The blood vessels showed up lighter than the liver proper, and the ovaries were pure white. No x-rays got through the ovaries at all. It made sense, and in an early report, Finley stated it as bluntly as possible. Paraphrasing the report, it went, in part, The chlorate ion is secreted by the liver into the bloodstream. The ovaries act as a trap for the ion, which is there reduced to metallic gold and deposited as a shell about the developing egg. Relatively high concentrates of unreduced chlorate ion penetrate the contents of the developing eggs. There is little doubt that the goose finds this process useful as a means of getting rid of the gold atoms which, if allowed to accumulate, would undoubtedly poison it. Excretion by eggshell may be novel in the animal kingdom, even unique, but there is no denying that it is keeping the goose alive. Unfortunately, however, the ovary is being locally poisoned to such an extent that few eggs are laid, probably not more than will suffice to get rid of the accumulating gold, and those few eggs are definitely unhatchable. That was all he said in writing. But to the rest of us, he said, that leaves one peculiarly embarrassing question. I knew what it was. We all did. Where was the gold coming from? No answer to that for a while, except for some negative evidence. There was no perceptible gold in the goose's feed, nor were there any gold-bearing pebbles about that it might have swallowed. There was no trace of gold anywhere in the soil of the area, and a search of the house and grounds revealed nothing. There were no gold coins, gold jewelry, gold plate, gold watches, or gold anything. No one on the farm even had as much as gold fillings in his teeth. There was Mrs. McGregor's wedding ring, of course, but she had only had one in her life, and she was wearing that one. So where was the gold coming from? The beginnings of the answer came on August 16, 1955. Albert Nevis of Purdue was forcing gastric tubes into the goose, another procedure to which the bird objected strenuously, with the idea of testing the contents of his alimentary canal. It was one of our routine searches for exogenous gold. Gold was found, but only in traces, and there was every reason to suppose those traces had accompanied the digestive secretions and were, therefore, endogenous, from within, that is, in origin. However, something else showed up, or the lack of it, anyway. I was there when Nevis came into Finley's office, in the temporary building we had put up overnight, almost, near the goose pen. Nevis said, The goose is low in bile pigment. Duodenal contents show about none. Finley frowned and said, Liver functions probably knocked loop-the-loop -loop because of its gold concentration. It probably isn't secreting bile at all. It is secreting bile, said Nevis. Bile acids are present in normal quantity, near normal anyway, it's just the bile pigments that are missing. I did a fecal analysis, and that was confirmed. No bile pigments. Let me explain something at this point. Bile acids are steroids secreted by the liver into the bile, and via that are poured into the upper end of the small intestine. 
These bile acids are detergent-like molecules which help to emulsify the fat in our diet, or the gooses, and distribute them in the form of tiny bubbles through the watery intentional contents. This distribution, or homogenization if you'd rather, makes it easier for the fat to be digested. Bile pigments, the substance that was missing in the goose, are something entirely different. The liver makes them out of hemoglobin, the red oxygen-carrying protein of the blood. Worn-out hemoglobin is broken up in the liver, the heme part being split away. The heme is made up of a squarish molecule called a porphyrin with an iron atom in the center. The liver takes the iron out and stores it for future use, then breaks the squarish molecule that is left. This broken porphyrin is bile pigment. It is colored brownish or greenish depending on further chemical changes and is secreted into the bile. The bile pigments are of no use to the body. They are poured into the bile as waste products. They pass through the intestines and come out with the feces. In fact, the bile pigments are responsible for the color of the feces. Finley's eyes began to glitter. Nevis said, It looks as though porphyrin catabolism isn't following the proper course in the liver. Doesn't it to you? It surely did. To me, too. There was tremendous excitement after that. This was the first metabolic abnormality, not directly involving gold, that had been found in the goose. We took a liver biopsy, which means we punched a cylindrical sliver out of the goose reaching down into the liver. It hurt the goose, but it didn't harm it. We took more blood samples, too. This time, we isolated hemoglobin from the blood and small quantities of the cytochromes from our liver samples. The cytochromes are oxidizing enzymes that also contain heme. We separated out the heme, and in acid solution, some of it precipitated in the form of a brilliant orange substance. By August 22, 1955, we had five micrograms of the compound. The orange compound was similar to heme, but it was not heme. The iron in heme can be in the form of a doubly charged ferrous ion, Fe++, or a triply charged ferric ion, Fe++, in which latter case, the compound is called hematin. Ferrous and ferric, by the way, come from the Latin word for iron, which is ferrum. The orange compound we had separated from heme had the porphyrin portion of the molecule all right, but the metal in the center was gold, to be specific, a triply charged auric ion, Au++. We called this compound aureme, which is simply short for auric heme. Aureme was the first naturally occurring gold-containing organic compound ever discovered. Ordinarily, it would rate headline news in the world of biochemistry, but now it was nothing, nothing at all in comparison to the further horizons its mere existence opened up. The liver, it seemed, was not breaking up the heme to bile pigment. Instead, it was converting it to aureme. It was replacing iron with gold. The aureme, in equilibrium with chlorate ion, entered the bloodstream and was carried to the ovaries where the gold was separated out and the porphyrin portion of the molecule disposed of by some as yet unidentified mechanism. Further analyses showed that 29% of the gold in the blood of the goose was carried in the plasma in the form of chlorate ion. The remaining 71% was carried in the red blood corpuscles in the form of automoglobin. An attempt was made to feed the goose traces of radioactive gold so that we could pick up radioactivity in plasma and corpuscles and see how readily the aurimoglobin molecules were handled in the ovaries. It seemed to us the aurimoglobin should be much more slowly disposed of than the dissolved chlorate ion in the plasma. The experiment failed, however, since we detected no radioactivity. We put it down to inexperience since none of us were isotope men, which was too bad since the failure was highly significant, really, and by not realizing it we lost several weeks. The aurimoglobin was, of course, useless as far as carrying oxygen was concerned, but it only made up about 0.1% of the total hemoglobin of the red blood cells, so there was no interference with the respiration of the goose. This still left us with the question of where the gold came from, and it was Nevis who first made the crucial suggestion. Maybe, he said at a meeting of the group held on the evening of August 25, 1955, the goose doesn't replace the iron with gold. Maybe it changes the iron to gold. Before I met Nevis personally that summer, I had known him through his publications. His field is bile chemistry and liver function, and had always considered him a cautious, clear-thinking person, almost overcautious. One wouldn't consider him capable for a minute of making any such completely ridiculous statement. It just shows the desperation and demoralization involved in Project Goose. The desperation was due to the fact that there was nowhere, literally nowhere, that the gold could come from. The goose was excreting gold at the rate of 38.9 grams of gold a day 
and had been doing it over a period of months. That gold had to come from somewhere, and failing that, absolutely failing that, it had to be made from something. The demoralization that led us to consider the second alternative was due to the mere fact that we were face to face with the goose that laid the golden eggs, the undeniable goose. With that, everything became possible. All of us were living in a fairy tale world, and all of us reacted to it by losing all sense of reality. Finley considered the possibilities seriously. Hemoglobin, he said, enters the liver, and a bit of a remoglobin comes out. The gold shell of the eggs has iron as its only impurity. The egg yolk is high in only two things, in gold, of course, and also somewhat in iron. It all makes a horrible kind of distorted sense. We're going to need help, man. We did, and it meant a third stage of the investigation. The first stage had consisted of myself alone. The second was the biochemical task force. The third, the greatest, the most important of all, involved the invasion of the nuclear physicists. On September 5, 1955, John L. Billings of the University of California arrived. He had some equipment with him, and more arrived in the following weeks. More temporary structures were going up. I could see that within a year we would have a whole research institution built about the goose. Billings joined our conference the evening of the 5th. Finley brought him up to date and said, There are a great many serious problems involved in this iron-to-gold idea. For one thing, the total quantity of iron in the goose can only be of the order of half a gram, yet nearly 40 grams of gold a day are being manufactured. Billings had a clear, high-pitched voice. He said, There's a worse problem than that. Iron is about at the bottom of the packing fraction curve. Gold is much higher up. To convert a gram of iron to a gram of gold takes just about as much energy as is produced by the fissioning of one gram of U-235. Finley shrugged. I'll leave the problem to you. Billings said, Let me think about it. He did more than think. One of the things done was to isolate fresh samples of heme from the goose, ash it, and send the iron oxide to Brookhaven for isotopic analysis. There was no particular reason to do that particular thing. It was just one of a number of individual investigations, but it was the one that brought results. When the figures came back, Billings choked on them. He said, There's no Fe-56. What about the other isotopes? asked Finley at once. All present, said Billings, in the appropriate relative rations. But no detectable Fe-56. I'll have to explain again. Iron, as it occurs naturally, is made up of four different isotopes. These isotopes are varieties of atoms that differ from one another in atomic weight. Iron atoms with an atomic weight of 56, or Fe56, make up 91.6% of all the atoms in iron. The other atoms have atomic weights of 54, 57, and 58. The iron from the heme of the goose was made up only of Fe54, Fe57, and Fe58. The implication was obvious. Fe56 was disappearing while the other isotopes weren't and this meant a nuclear reaction was taking place. A nuclear reaction could take one isotope and leave others be. An ordinary chemical reaction, any chemical reaction at all, would have to dispose of all isotopes equally. But it's energetically impossible, said Finley. He was only saying that in mild sarcasm with Billings' initial remark in mind. As biochemists, we knew well enough that many reactions went on in the body which required an input of energy and that this was taken care of by coupling the energy-demanding reaction with an energy-producing reaction. However, chemical reactions gave off or took up a few kilocalories per mole. Nuclear reactions gave off or took up millions. To supply energy for an energy-demanding nuclear reaction required, therefore, a second and energy-producing nuclear reaction. We didn't see Billings for two days. When he did come back, it was to say, See here. The energy-producing reaction must produce just as much energy per nucleon involved as the energy-demanding reaction uses up. If it produces even slightly less, then the overall reaction won't go. If it produces even slightly more, then considering the astronomical number of nucleons involved, the excess energy produced would vaporize the goose in a fraction of a second. So, said Finley, so the number of reactions possible is very limited. I have been able to find only one plausible system. Oxygen-18, if converted to iron-56, will produce enough energy to drive the iron-56 onto gold-197. 
It's like going down one side of a roller coaster and then up the other. We'll have to test this. How? First, suppose we check the isotopic composition of the oxygen in the goose. Oxygen is made up of three stable isotopes, almost all of it O16. O18 makes up only one oxygen atom out of 250. Another blood sample. The water content was distilled off in vacuum, and some of it put through a mass spectrograph. There was O18 there, but only one oxygen atom out of 1,300. Fully 80% of the O18 we expected wasn't there. Billings said, that's corroborative evidence. Oxygen 18 is being used up. It is being supplied constantly in the food and water fed to the goose, but it is still being used up. Gold 197 is being produced. Iron 56 is one intermediate, and since the reaction that uses up iron 56 is faster than the one that produces it, it has no chance to reach significant concentration, and isotopic analysis shows its absence. We weren't satisfied, so we tried again. We kept the goose on water that had been enriched with O18 for a week. Gold production went up almost at once. At the end of a week, it was producing 45.8 grams a day, while the O18 content of its body water was no higher than before. There's no doubt about it, said Billings. He snapped his pencil and stood up. That goose is a living nuclear reactor. The goose was obviously a mutation. A mutation suggested radiation, among other things, and radiation brought up the thought of nuclear tests conducted in 1952 and 1953 several hundred miles away from the site of McGregor's farm. If it occurs to you that no nuclear tests have been conducted in Texas, it just shows two things. I'm not telling you everything, and you don't know everything. I doubt that at any time in the history of the atomic era was background radiation so thoroughly analyzed and the radioactive content of the soil so rigidly sifted. Back records were studied. It didn't matter how top secret they were. By this time, Project Goose had the highest priority that had ever existed. Even weather records were checked in order to follow the behavior of the winds at the time of the nuclear tests. Two things turned up. One, the background radiation at the farm was a bit higher than normal. Nothing that could possibly do harm, I hasten to add. There were indications, however, that at the time of the birth of the goose, the farm had been subjected to the drifting edge of at least two fallouts. Nothing really harmful, I again hasten to add. Second, the goose, alone of all geese on the farm, in fact, alone of all living creatures on the farm that could be tested, including the humans, showed no radioactivity at all. Look at it this way. Everything shows traces of radioactivity. That's what is meant by background radiation. But the goose showed none. Finley sent one report on December 6, 1955, which I can paraphrase as follows. The goose is a most extraordinary mutation, born of a high-level radioactivity environment, which at once encouraged mutations in general, and which has made this particular mutation a beneficial one. The goose has enzyme systems capable of catalyzing various nuclear reactions. Whether the enzyme system consists of one enzyme or more than one is not known, nor is anything known of the nature of the enzymes in question, nor can any theory be yet advanced as to how an enzyme can catalyze a nuclear reaction, since these involve particular interactions with forces five orders of magnitude higher than those involved in the ordinary chemical reactions commonly catalyzed by enzymes. The overall nuclear change is from oxygen-18 to gold-197. The oxygen-18 is plentiful in its environment, being present in significant amounts in water and all organic foodstuffs. The gold-197 is excreted via the ovaries. One known intermediate is iron-56, and the fact that aremoglobin is formed in the process leads us to suspect that the enzyme or enzymes involved may have heme as a prophetic group. There has been considerable thought devoted to the value this overall nuclear change might have to the goose. The oxygen-18 does it no harm, and the gold-197 is troublesome to be rid of, potentially poisonous, and a cause of its sterility. Its formation might possibly be a means of avoiding greater danger. This danger... But just reading it in the report, friend, makes it all seem so quiet almost pensive. Actually, I never saw a man come closer to apoplexy and survive than Billings did when he found out about our own radioactive gold experiments, which I told you about earlier, the ones in which we detected no radioactivity in the goose, so that we discarded the results as meaningless.
Many times over he asked how we could possibly consider it unimportant that we had lost radioactivity. You're like the cub reporter, he said, who was sent to cover a society wedding and on returning said there was no story because the groom hadn't shown up. You fed the goose radioactive gold and lost it. Not only that, you failed to detect any natural radioactivity about the goose, any carbon-14, any potassium-40, and you called it failure. We started feeding the goose radioactive isotopes, cautiously at first, but before the end of January of 1956, we were shoveling it in. The goose remained non-radioactive. What it amounts to, said Billings, is that this enzyme-catalyzed nuclear process of the goose manages to convert any unstable isotope into a stable isotope. Useful, I said. Useful? It's a thing of beauty. It's the perfect defense against the atomic age. Listen, the conversion of oxygen-18 to gold-197 should liberate eight and a fraction positrons per oxygen atom. That means eight and a fraction gamma rays as soon as each positron combines with an electron. No gamma rays either. The goose must be able to absorb gamma rays harmlessly. We irradiated the goose with gamma rays. As the level rose, the goose developed a slight fever and we quit in panic. It was just fever, though, not radiation sickness. A day passed, the fever subsided, and the goose was as good as new. Do you see what we've got? demanded Billings. A scientific marvel, said Findlay. Man, don't you see the practical applications? If we could find out the mechanism and duplicate it in the test tube, we've got a perfect method of radioactive ash disposal. The most important drawback preventing us from going ahead with a full-scale atomic economy is the headache of what to do with the radioactive isotopes manufactured in the process. Sift them through an enzyme preparation in large vats, and that would be it. Find out the mechanism, gentlemen, and you can stop worrying about fallouts. We would find a protection against radiation sickness. Alter the mechanism somehow, and we can have geese excreting any element needed. How about uranium-235 eggshells? The mechanism! The mechanism! We sat there, all of us, staring at the goose. If only the eggs would hatch. If only we could get a tribe of nuclear reactor geese. It must have happened before, said Finley. The legends of such geese must have started somehow. Do you want to wait? asked Billings. If we had a gaggle of such geese, we could begin taking a few apart. We could study its ovaries. We could prepare tissue slices and tissue homogenates. That might not do any good. The tissue of a liver biopsy did not react with oxygen-18 under any conditions we tried. But then we might perfuse an intact liver. We might study intact embryos, watch for one to develop the mechanism. But with only one goose, we could do none of that. We don't dare kill the goose that lays the golden eggs. The secret was in the liver of that fat goose. Liver of fat goose. Pâté de foie gras. No delicacy to us. Nevis said thoughtfully, We need an idea. Some radical departure. Some crucial thought. Saying it won't bring it, said Billings despondently. And in a miserable attempt at a joke, I said, We could advertise in the newspapers. And that gave me an idea. Science fiction, I said. What? said Finley. Look, science fiction magazines print gag articles. The readers consider it fun. They're interested. I told them about the Thiotimaline articles Asimov wrote, and which I had once read. The atmosphere was cold with disapproval. We won't even be breaking security regulations, I said, because no one will believe it. I told them about the time in 1944 when Cleve Cartmill wrote a story describing the atom bomb one year early, and the FBI kept its temper. And science fiction readers have ideas. Don't underrate them. Even if they think it's a gag article, they'll send their notions into the editor. And since we have no ideas of our own, since we're up a dead-end street, what can we lose? They still didn't buy it. So I said, And you know, the goose won't live forever. That did it, somehow. We had to convince Washington. Then I got in touch with John Campbell, and he got in touch with Asimov. Now the article is done. I've read it, I approve, and I urge you all not to believe it. Please don't. Only... any ideas? Peak 
I See You by Paul Anderson The father of Sean F.X. Lindquist was an amiable, easygoing Boston Swede. His mother was, as might be guessed, an O'Kelly with a will of her own. Their genes combined to produce a son who was good-natured, a bit raffish, intelligent, disinclined to toil, but on occasion stubborn as Lucifer, and thereby hangs a tale. Being expelled from college for reasons having less to do with his grades than the president's daughter, he was drafted. Presently he was shipped to Asia. Though the general truce there had now lasted for several years, it was chronically unstable, and everyone concerned maintained large forces close to hand. In due course, however, and with a certain feeling of mutual relief, the army gave Lindquist his honorable discharge. He was enchanted with Bangkok, where he had been spending his leaves, and pulled wires to be demobbed in that city. The enchantment wore off. She married someone else, and he made a leisurely way home around the world. Whenever his funds ran out, he did odd jobs. Some were very odd indeed. He was twenty-six before he reached the States again, and long out of touch. So he might have caught up on newspapers and technical journals, but he went instead to Las Vegas and updated himself in other fields. A true cliché calls luck a lady, apt to smile most upon men who do not pursue her. Lindquist departed with several thousand dollars in his pocket. At this time the southwestern tourist boom was entering the steep part of its exponential curve. Lindquist remembered boyhood camping trips in the area. It occurred to him that he could make a pleasant living and have his winters free by starting an air ferry service. The Four Corners country is famous for the grandeur and solitude of its uplands, but the time, effort, and expense of packing into those roadless mountains discouraged most potential visitors. Now, if they and their gear could be flown in and out again at an agreed-on time, if the pilot was available by radio in the meanwhile to handle emergencies like lost can openers, he took lessons and got his license. Then he bought himself a used VTOL aircraft and went out to scout the territory. Thus it was that he saw the spaceship. He was droning leisurely along at about 12,000 feet. The peaks were not extremely far below him. Their landscape was awesome, vast, steep, ragged, a ruddiness slashed by mineral ochres and blues, a starkness little relieved by scattered mesquite, greasewood, and sagebrush. Here and there a streamlet turned the bottom of a canyon green, but mostly this was desert land, people empty land, hawk, buzzard, jackrabbit, and coyote land. The sun was westering in a deep, almost purple sky. Updrafts boomed briefly and trickily, shaking the plain in its course. Linquist's lean, sandy-haired, shabby-clad form sat relaxed. He puffed a corncob pipe and hummed a body song. But alertness was in him. Before he tried carrying passengers, he must get familiar with this kind of flying, and he needed a place to roost for the night, preferably containing water and firewood. His eyes roved. The vision slanted down before him. It moved at incredible speed, banked at impossible angles. Yet its passage was so silent that his own motor, his very pulse, hammered at him. The shape, as nearly as he could tell, was roughly like a disc thickened in the middle. But the lambent, shifting colors that played across it, enveloped it in aurora, made such things hard to gauge. It swung around, slid near, and his magnetic compass went crazy. For a moment he stared at what seemed to be a row of ports, glowing as if furnaces burned behind them. Far in the back of his mind, a reckoner clicked. Diameter something like a hundred feet. Otherwise he felt sandbagged. The thing spun off. He grew aware that the pipe had dropped from his jaws. No matter. His hands were a dance across the radar controls. He locked on. Reflection, yes. His compass steadied again. The vision dwindled, a mile away, two miles, three, shrinking to a rainbow dot, like the diffraction dots you see when you look sunward through your lashes, vanishing to nothing against mountain flanks and canyon shadows. But it was real. Not just his rocking mind said so, his instruments did. Other memories from boyhood and youth boiled up. Judas Priest, he whispered. That's a show enough flying saucer. He opened the throttle. His plane leaped forward, roaring and shivering with power. He hadn't a chance of overhauling in such a flat-out chase. But the thing did seem to be on a long downward track. Could he but stay within range? Would it but land? Well, what then, Bimbo? He challenged himself. He didn't know. 
but he relived vividly the arguments that had once fascinated him. The radicals had insisted that flying saucers were ships from outer space, operated by benevolent though little green men. The conservatives denied that anyone had ever seen anything. In this hour, he, SFX Lindquist, had been handed a chance to investigate personally. He had nothing to lose, and perhaps, if he could solve the mystery, a great deal to gain, like fame and money. Though no intellectual, he followed the news around him. Had he not spent the past several years in out-of-the-way places, he would have known that pursuit was a waste of time, that the riddle had, in fact, already been answered. But no one had mentioned this to him. Quite simply and naively, he lined out after the vision. In the different cultures of the galaxy, Doric's law is known by many different names. Some call it Schepelor's rule, some the basic law of thermodynamics, some the principle of most effort, and so on for millions of languages. But the formulation is invariant, because we all inhabit the same universe. Everything that can go wrong will. On their present voyage, the partners in the hypership had seen it in full glorious operation, there is no need to detail their woes with rickety hull, asthmatic engines, and senile computer, nor need to describe what cargoes they carried, with what infinite trouble from planet to planet. A tramp has to take anything she can get, and this is apt to be stuff too weird for the sleek cargo liners. But they did think their fortunes had turned when they reached Xandar. A message from the brokers lay waiting for them. After discharging their load of Sandarads, and hopefully getting most of the mercaptan odor out of the vessel. They were to pick up some machine tools for new Yastani Kini Kintantuvo. Plain machine tools, harmless crated metal. Of course, the destination was far out on the rim. So much the better, though. It would be a peaceful haul, with lovely pay accumulating, and then, having been gone as long as they'd signed for, they would head home, loaded or not, and the flesh pots of the Corps had better be filled in advance for them but a summons came from the port coordinator. Paziliweep Finison went along to the office. The coordinator was not of any species he recognized, possessing three eyes and a good many tentacles. They studied each other for a few seconds. The spacefarer was from Ensicht. He was a diopt himself, though his eyes were quite large and dark, contrasting with blue stripes upon glabrous orange skin. The air being thicker, wetter, and hotter than he was used to, he went nude except for a musette bag. His body was slender, centeroid, with a gracefully waving tail. He breathed through rows of gill-like organs on either side of his long neck, which alternated with aural tympani. Albeit he thus had no nose, he did sport a muscular trunk above his mouth. It split into two arms that ended in boneless, four-fingered hands. This was entirely practical on Ensicht where gravity is comparatively weak and animals comparatively small. Paziliweep stood three feet high at the rump. Ah, Navigator Pilot Finnison, H.S. Grumdell Castle. Yes, yes, welcome, said the coordinator in Interlingo 5 with a flatulent accent. He punched a button on his data screen and regarded what appeared. Yes, correct, what I was informed. You are clearing for, yes, that part of the rim with a stop over at, what is the name of the planet? Paziliweep automatically jerked his tail, then said in haste, My gesture indicated indifference. Were you afraid it might be objectionable in my culture? No, we have no tails. Now about this, yes, confounded planet. Never heard of it till the other day. Catalogued as, but what's the name? Tierra, Earth, Mir, Jordan, De Erd, etc., etc., Paziliweep's vocal apparatus formed the sounds rather well, except for a lack of nasal quality. Hundreds of autochthonous words, most of them translate as dirt. So, yes, I see. The coordinator had kept one eye on the unrolling data. Primitive world, what do you call it? Restocking station 143. The coordinator waved a tentacle in the air. I indicate assent and understanding. Well, navigator pilot, this is quite fortunate. Yes, fortunate. You came at, shall we say, the strategic moment. You are, therefore, able to be of material assistance to the Galactic Federation, Intergovernmental Department of Planetary Development, Bureau of Supervisions, to be exact. Uh-oh, thought Pazili Weep, and braced himself for bad news. 
but it was worse than he feared. Yes, you can, and therefore you are herewith instructed to furnish transportation and every necessary assistance to the sector inspector. No, Pazilliweep cried. His four hooves clattered on the floor when he sprang backward. Not the sector inspector. Yes, the sector inspector. New one, you know, anxious to make a good showing in this latest assignment. Came here to check local records. Found no official investigation of that particular planet had been made for a long time. Yes, much overdue. Entire intelligent species being neglected. Perhaps even slyly exploited by the less scrupulous, eh? Exploited my lowest left operculum, Faziliwi protested. What the entropy would there be to exploit? Besides, their principal culture belongs to the Federation. If they have any complaints, they can go through regular channels, can't they? And say... Why doesn't the inspector go in his own ship? Remorselessly, the coordinator answered. Economy drive at GHQ. Inspectors for outlying regions do not, shall we say, rate their own vessels any longer. They use available transportation. Yes, I know, they're always behindhand anyway. Too many planets, and a sector like this, not even important enough for records on it to clutter central data banks on any core world. Do you see? But, listen... The Grumdle's an old wreck. We've got the stingiest owners in the galaxy. My engineer's trying to repair a fusion tube right now. The interior maintenance units keep breaking down, too. Our top hyperspeed is a hypercrawl. Anything would be better. No doubt, no doubt. But nothing else available. Not soon. Every other vessel due here within the next several weeks is a liner or else on time charter. Or, of course, not crewed by oxygen breathers. You may be old, Navigator Pilot Finnison. You may be rusty, you may be underpowered, vermin-infested, and all but certifiably unspaceworthy, but you are the best I can do for the sector inspector. And yes, my own career, promotion off this dreary mud ball, his reports to GHQ. You understand. Yes. You are hereby commandeered. And the coordinator handed over the official orders with a flourish. Thus hypership Rumdel Castle departed Xandar with a third being aboard. The inspector was a good fellow at heart, young, inclined to take himself and his work overly seriously, but well-intentioned. He apologized for the trouble he was causing, and reminded his hosts that their owners would be compensated according to law. His hosts showed no great enthusiasm at this. He explained that a major reason for his having picked their ship was that she was already scheduled to lay over on 143. And might I inquire, out of a wish to become more intimately acquainted with my companions as well as for the technical information itself, not to mention simple curiosity, what activities you have planned on this planet. He used Interlingo 12 rather than any language of his own world, Etatic. Unfortunately, Pazilliweep did not speak Interlingo 12. Engineer supercargo Ergo the Red did, more or less, and translated into his version of Interlingo 7. He says, what are we going to do there? Well, no reason not to tell him the truth, Pazilliweep replied unless you've got some other little racket you haven't told me about. When we touch maybe once in three years, don't make me laugh. It hurts. In point of fact, Pazilliweep had a racket of his own. It was a mild one, and might even be legal for all he knew. He swapped small quantities of Andan oil, which had turned out to have powerful aphrodisiac effects on the natives of 143, for kitchenware. The latter was unusual and artistic enough to command good prices on several more advanced worlds, this was one reason he did his restocking on 143 whenever possible. Let's answer his question by reciting common elementary knowledge, he suggested to Ergo. Might put him to sleep, at least. Is any knowledge common, wondered the engineer supercargo. Like, it's a big galaxy. I never heard of what's-his-name's muckin' civilization till now. And still, he says, it fills a whole muckin' star cluster. Maybe he don't know how we operate in this spiral arm. Oh, I suppose the basic procedures are similar everywhere. If nothing else, in the course of ten thousand years, or however long it's been around, wouldn't the Federation have had some leveling influence on the member species? Pazilliweep tail shrugged. We haven't anything better to do. Suppose you translate as I talk. He filled his lungs and began. It's a long way between stars in this thin outer part of the galaxy, and it's even longer between up-to-date systems that are normal ports of call, so ships are apt to need fresh supplies en route. 
Maybe the deuterium runs low, or the protein, or lots of things. Or else, because no ship has perfect biochemical balance, it's necessary to stop on a home-like world and flush out accumulated byproducts with fresh air. Planets suitable for the various types of space-going life forms are listed in the pilot's data bank and ephemerides for each region. He says we gotta tank up, Ergo told the inspector. Clack to clack a Vitatic nodded, signifying assent in the same way as most 143 in cultures. The head he used for this purpose also resembled the 143 in, and those of both his shipmates, in that it had two eyes and a mouth. However, mouth and nostrils were set in a beak that brought the narrow skull to a point. A fleshy aileron grew from the top, counterpart to the rudder-like fluke at the end of a thin tail. The body in between had, like Basiliweeps, evolved from a hexapod, but on Etotic, the rear limbs had become legs terminating in claws to grasp branches. The middle limbs had become skinny arms with six-digited hands. The forelimbs were now leathery wings. A keel bone jutted from the deep-chested torso. When he stood erect, Clack de Clack's nude, gray-skinned frame was of slightly less stature than Pazilliweep's, but his wingspan was easily twelve feet. Nonetheless, he could not fly here. The ship's G-field was set lower than his home gravity, but the air was so much thinner that he couldn't stay healthy without artificial help. This took the form of a pomander, which he kept lifting to his face. The oxygen-generating biochemicals within smelled like rich swamp ooze. The requirement is understood, he said, and obviously biological maintenance problems alone suffice to compel your descent into the planetary atmosphere. The point, however, which it was desired to make, is that a primary reason for the selection of this vessel as my transport was that you were, indeed, planning to restock on the world in question. Furthermore, your cargo was not perishable nor urgently required by the consignee. Thus, the sum total of inconvenience and delay is minimized. Admittedly, I may be the cause of your remaining for more than the few 37.538 hour periods you presumably reckoned with, but if all appears to be in order, if there is no clear need at this point in time for further investigation of the possibility that ameliorative action may be required somewhere upon the globe, then we should be able to proceed within two or three months. I will not insist upon being returned to Xandar, but will rather continue with you to the Rim, where I shall debark in order to instigate a study of conditions prevailing upon that frontier. Oh, said Ergo, to Pazilliweep, he says we'll be stuck there for at least two or three months. Oh, said the navigator pilot, rather more pungently, will you ask his unblessed bureaucrat ship why the inferno he wants to excrete away so loving much time on one unseemly little ball of fertilizer? Likewise, rather more pungently. No fair, grumbled Ergo. I can't talk to him like that. Clack to clack explained. He wasn't really much interested in 143. His primary mission was to make sure that things were going well on the civilized planets of the Rim, and recommend remedies to the Federation authorities for whatever he found amiss. Still, 143 was overdue for inspection, seeing that it housed one nation that belonged to the great confraternity. Such membership confers certain privileges. They are not many, because a galactic-scale league is necessarily a loose one, little more than a set of agencies serving the common interests of wildly diverse cultures. But a member is entitled to some things, for example technical assistance, if it wishes to modernize in any way. No, said Pazilliweep, our friends on 143 aren't what you would call the go-getter type. They're content to sell us their services, use of landing space, a few kinds of goods. Mainly they take biologicals in exchange, you know, longevity pills and, uh, other medicines. Ask them yourself if you doubt my word. I do not, of course, Clack to Clack answered through Ergo, but I gather the planet holds numerous cultures. Perhaps they are being treated unfairly. Might they not, for example, be worthy of Federation membership too? Chaos, no, Pazilliweep paused. Well, I suppose they're no worse than some I could name, but no better either. We do make spot checks, we traders, in the hope of finding new potential markets, but the majority of 143ians haven't shown an improvement in the better than two centuries that the blob's been visited. They've got a drab, fragmented, quarrelsome, early mechanical kind of civilization. Last time I was there, we noticed traces of manned landings on the single moon. That indicates the stage they're at. If they learned the Federation exists, they would have to be admitted to membership if they asked. Exactly. And can you imagine the results? 
those dismal characters would yell for so much technical assistance that their whole planet would be one gigantic college for the next fifty years. Sector taxes would go up ten percent, I'll bet, to finance it. We'd have to stop using our base, probably because of their confounded nationalistic regulations about passports and I don't know what other nonsense, and there isn't as handy a planet for us within a hundred light years. Pazili Weep gestured violently. And all this sacrifice on our part for what? To add one more lousy space-traveling species, competing right in our trade lanes to the rim. You are satisfied with the status quo, then? Right. The 143ians who do know about us, and do have membership, are friendly, dignified, unaggressive, mind-their-own-business people who will work for us when we need help, at an honest wage for honest labor, and who produce saleable handicrafts. Do you wonder that we hide our existence from everyone else? No. Frankly, I cannot help suspecting you underpay your native help. That is what honest wage for honest labor usually means. But I am more concerned with ascertaining whether the planet has other civilizations that would, on balance, prove an asset to the Federation. Rather than read the sporadic reports of untrained and biased observers, I want to investigate and decide for myself. Even through Ergo's translation, Pazilliweep noted how Clacticlac had dropped his elegant periods for shorter sentences in a sharper tone. The navigator pilot sighed and resigned his soul. All right, he'd be hung up for a while on 143, chauffeuring the sector inspector around, assisting with instruments, catching natives for interviews. This was done in such wise that, after they were released, no one believed their story. Experience had shown that the best ploy on 143 was the benign observers of elder race. He and Ergo would be at once busy and bored. Yet... Eventually they'd start drawing overtime pay, and the mission on 143 wouldn't likely be prolonged. If nothing else, Grumdel Castle was uncomfortable. Her cramped cabins, vibrating decks, rusty metal, chipped plastic, wheezy ventilators, and uninspired galley saw to that. In addition, she carried so few books and tapes suitable for clack-to-clack that he would have them memorized in weeks. Pazilliweep and Urgo always laid in recreational materials before a voyage, but what use to an Etatican were in Sicton murder mysteries and Bancho in pornography? And so Grumdel Castle creaked and groaned the long, dark way to the solar system. She took up orbit around the third planet, while Pazilliweep checked for indications of excessive radioactivity, smog, and other hazards of an early mechanical culture. Meanwhile, Ergo the Red went outside to install camouflage tubes on the hull. His shipmates saw his fur as bright blue, but then... They didn't use a visual spectrum identical with the Bonchuan. The engineer's supercargo was a tailless biped, eight feet tall and broad to match. His head was round, short-muzzled, big-eyed, fuzzy, and rather endearing. His hands were five-fingered, his feet four-toed. In spite of his hirsute skin, he affected white coveralls, sandals, and an ornate belt. He clumped in again and shed his spacesuit. "'Guess they'll hang together a while,' he reported." but if the owners don't spring for a new set when we get home, I'm going to look for another berth. How's the planet doing? About as before. I note more air traffic each time, though, damn it, Pazilli Weep said. Also, today, what appears to be a manned orbital satellite. We'll have to wait here till the stupid thing's on the opposite side of the globe. Clacticlac inquired why they lingered. Ergo explained. Grumdel Castle used a camouflage standard on worlds of this atmospheric type where it was desired to fly unbeknownst. The natives could not detect an operating hyperdrive. If they had had that capability, they'd soon be making their own starships. And anti-radiation screens served to control air molecules as well as atomic particles, making even the fastest travel soundless. But you were still stuck with the fact that your ship was a solid, visible, radar-reflecting object. So you wrapped her in the gaudiest ionized gas discharge effect you could generate— you added powerful magnetic and electrostatic fields and varied them randomly. You sailed in, alerting every eye and every instrument for a hundred miles around, just like a natural traveling plasmoid. But since those erratic masses of molecules and electrons occur in atmosphere and the ship was in space, she must first sneak down. Presently she did. Near her destination, she spied a native aircraft. At Clacticlac's request, she veered close so he could get a good look. Then she headed off for the home of that 143 and people who, during the past two hundred years, had been members in good standing of the Galactic Federation.
On the assumption that the flying saucer would continue in a straight line, Sean Lindquist zigzagged along the same general path. After half an hour, he was rewarded. He crossed above an immense red ridge. Its farther slope tumbled into a canyon whose bottom was the most vivid green he'd spied in a long while. Squarish adobe buildings were stacked against one rock wall, overlooking a stream lined with trees. But what made his pulses jump afresh was the object that lay before the houses. The dazzling, confusing play of colors was gone. The shape had definite outlines and a dark gray hue, but it was surely the thing that had buzzed him. And by all the saints and any heathen gods who cared to join in, it was a vessel. He tilted his airplane's wings, crammed on power, and whipped back the way he had come. A thermal nearly tossed him from control, but he must get out of sight before he was observed, and... And what? Some kind of ray gun shot him down? He ran his tongue across lips gone sandpapery. The ship had to be from outer space, real outer space, the unimaginable abysses that held the stars. He'd followed the progress of flybys and landings within the solar system, hence he knew that, while the Saucerians might be little and emerald-colored, they were not from any neighborhood planet. He also knew enough aerodynamics to be sure no terrestrial organization was experimenting with stuff that advanced. Even if he had been ignorant of the engineering requirements, he was learned in the ways of public relations offices. Stop maundering, will you? he croaked. What to do? He kept the plane wobbling back and forth on the far side of the mountain while, feverishly, he studied his charts and tried to discover where he was. Uh, yes. Wu Simpti. Plus the symbol for population zero to one thousand. Evidently a Pueblo. And lonely as hell to judge from the fact that nothing led away from it except a dim mule trail. Numbly like parts of a machine rather than a body, his fingers activated the radio. If he could raise, oh, Gallup or Durango or wherever, make his location known so it wouldn't do the aliens any good to destroy him, a distant seething filled his earphones. Whether atmospherics or they were responsible, he couldn't get through. He got his pipe off the floor, reloaded and relit it, and fumed himself into a measure of calm. A long gulp from a bottle that lived in his sleeping bag was equally helpful. Consider, Lindquist, he thought. You've stumbled on a secret to shake the world. But this is hardly our first visit from yonder. Leaving aside the mistakes, the hoaxes, and the claims of the nut cults, there always was a certain amount of saucer observation that couldn't be explained away. At least it was easier to believe in spaceships than in some of those concatenations of coincidences that the orthodox scientists postulated— and now you've got proof that the ship hypothesis is right. Only who's going to take your unsupported word? Supposing you could go fetch witnesses. The thing's bound to be gone when you return. You'd get class with Adamski and his breed. For which same reason, you'll keep your mouth shut. Hey, he reflected with rising eagerness, how many people have actually met Saucerians and been disbelieved afterwards? And on that account... How many more have met them and, not wanting to be laughed at, simply kept mum? After all, what little consistent evidence there is indicates the Saucerians aren't evil. They're shy or snobbish or something, but I can't remember anyone ever claiming that they do any deliberate harm. So maybe, this time, I can... Allowing himself no second thoughts, Lindquist brought the plane about. He roared back over the mountain chose his position, tilted wings, and commenced vertical descent. Updrafts were tricky, and this was a somewhat battered, cranky craft he had. For a while he was too occupied with controls, instruments, hiss, and shudder around him to heed much else. He did see how the saucer squatted imperturbable in the bright late sunlight. Tawny mud-brick walls, red canyon sides, deep blue sky, green meadows and cornfields, green cottonwoods and willows along the quicksilver stream— dusty sage and juniper farther back, and in the middle, a spaceship from the stars. His landing gear touched. He cut the power. Silence hit him like a thunderclap. He unharnessed, opened the door, and sprang shakily forth. The air was thin, dry, pungent with resinous odors. Except for a breeze, tinkle of water, bleating from a pasture shared by sheep and goats, the silence continued. It was not broken by the approaching locals. They were ordinary Pueblo types, 
a few hundred medium-sized, dark-complexioned folk of every apparent age. Men and women both wore their hair in braids. Clothing varied, from more or less traditional breech clouts, gowns, and blankets, to Levi's and sports shirts. Lindquist's sharpened perceptions noted that the people were better clad, seemed more healthy and prosperous than the average Southwest Indian, and they were strangely uncordial. Not that they threatened him, but they drew up in a kind of phalanx and stared and said never a word. Even the littlest children sucked their thumbs in a marked manner. Lindquist gulped. Ah, uh, hello, he said. His voice sounded very small to him. I'm afraid I, uh, don't speak your language. They might know Spanish. Buenos dias, mis amigos. Trouble was, that damn near exhausted his Spanish. A grizzled, weather-beaten man called softly, Sik yabotama. Lindquist said, I beg your pardon, but decided it was the name of a young man who stepped to the elder. They put heads together and conferred in mutters. Lindquist gulped again, nodded, pasted on a smile, and started toward the flying saucer. At once he grew so conscious of it, so astonished, for instance, at the pitted, corroded metal of what had once been a smooth, unitized shape, that the Indians faded from his mind. Colliding with them was a shock. Several had moved to intercept him. They were embarrassed. The Pueblo dwellers are among the politest beings on earth. They smiled in a forced way, bobbed their heads and waved their hands. They pushed gently on Lindquist's arms, as if to urge him toward their houses. Anger flared. No thanks, he snapped and planted his heels. The young man rescued the situation. He was among those who wore modern clothes, including the gaudiest sombrero Lindquist had ever met. He sauntered forth, tapped the newcomer on the back, and said, Excuse me, buddy, that's not the way. What? Lindquist whirled to confront him. Welcome to Wuwu Simti Pueblo, the Indian said. I'm Sikya Botama, but in the army I use the name Joe Andrews. Pick that because it's handy being near the head of the alphabet. So, if you want, call me Joe. Come on inside and have a drink. I... I thought... you... You needn't be surprised. Sure, the Hopi don't approve of liquor as a rule, but they need somebody like me who's equipped to handle white men. Like I interpret when we take the mules to town and stock up on things. And I did do a military hitch, so I've gotten a few outside habits. It's good bourbon. But, I mean... Lindquist twisted his neck to goggle at what now lay behind his back. I never imagined... Yes, it is unusual, Sikyabotama agreed cordially. He linked arms with Lindquist, who must needs come along as he ambled in the direction of the village. We're the most isolated Pueblo in the country. Not awful old. A bunch of Shoshonean-speaking Hopi moved here to get away from the Spaniards after the revolt of 1680 was put down. So we have a tradition of minding our own affairs, and we discourage visitors. Nothing rude, you understand. We just don't do anything interesting when the anthropologists come, and we got rid of the missionaries by telling the last padre who showed that we'd already been converted to hard-shell Baptists. The other Indians trailed after at some distance. They kept their silence. Please, don't think we're hostile, Sikyabotama urged. We're only satisfied. We combine the old and the new as suits us best, and we do quite well for ourselves on the whole, and everybody among us knows it. Regular contact with the outside world would upset our apple cart. So we act pretty unanimously to defend our privacy. Unanimity comes natural in the Hopi culture anyhow. If you're in trouble, we'll help you, Mr... Uh... Lindquist, said Lindquist feebly. We'll do what we can for you. But if you dropped in out of curiosity, well, I hate to sound inhospitable. But the fact is you'd find Wuwu Simti a mighty dull place... Lively young fellow like you, huh? I'd suggest you proceed right away. And, uh, I'd take it as a favor if you don't mention this stop you made. We're not after tourist business, and that's that. You savvy? Dull! Lindquist tore loose. He spun, flung out both arms toward the great spaceship, and shouted, You call that dull? So echoes rang. Well, not to me, of course, Sikyabotama said. I get my kicks, and the average Pueblo dweller is stayed by nature. Flying saucers and... and... Sikyabotama regarded Lindquist narrowly. Do you feel okay? he asked. 
Sure, I feel okay. What about that flying saucer over there? Sikibotama squinted. What flying saucer? What do you mean? I... I... I chased it to here, and there it sits. Awatsire, called Sikibotama. Do you see a flying saucer? A middle-aged Indian looked solemnly back and shook his head. No, he grunted. No see fly saucer. I'll ask the others in Hopi if you want, Sikibotama offered. But you know, Mr. Lindquist, when people aren't used to this thin air and sun glare, they can mistake mirage effects for some of the damnedest things. I'd be careful about that if I were you. Flitting around in an aeroplane, a guy has to be mighty sure what's real and what's an optical illusion, doesn't he? Lindquist stared for an entire minute into the broad, bland face. The others moved closer, and had also begun to smile and murmur soothing words. Briefly, in his tottering mind, he wondered if he was not indeed the crazy one. No. He sprang back and launched himself. His legs flew, dust spurted, the footfall slammed through his shins, and he made an end run around the tribe. Meanwhile, he bawled, Do radars have illusions? Do compasses? By heaven, let me at my instruments, and I'll show you. He reached the ship. Its curves swelled immense above him, casting a knife-edged shadow. He snatched a rock and pounded the metal. It boomed. A lizard ran away. The sandstone crumpled under repeated impacts. Is that optical? he screamed. The Hopi had been running toward him. But once more they halted at a distance. Sikyabotama came nearer. The young Indian stopped, regarded Lindquist, and sighed. Okay, he said. I didn't really expect it at work. Have your way, Charlie. He semaphored with his arms. Lindquist stepped back from the ship, panting, sweating, trembling. The canyon brooded in a quiet, immense, and eternal. Only the wind had voice. Then came a rusty creak. Someone had been watching from inside, through some kind of television, and in some fashion a part of the hull detached itself on three sides and unrolled to make a gangway to the ground. Three creatures came forth. Lindquist saw them and strangled on an oath that was half a prayer. Sikyabotama took a philosophical attitude. You ought to see what membership in the Galactic Federation has done to our Kachina dolls, he remarked. The real ones, that we don't show the anthropologists. This is most annoying, Clack de Clack said. He flapped his wings. They made a parchment rustle where he squatted in the sunshine, under the spaceship, confronting the bug-eyed 143-an. Sure is, Ergo the Red agreed. We gotta get rid of this bum. And then we gotta stay away from here for several days, probably go into orbit, in case he does somehow talk somebody into coming back with him, right when I was hoping to get that number three regulator tuned. I was thinking more personally, the inspector admitted. I am not prepared to conduct interviews. That is, my translating computer has not yet assimilated the records of this planet's dominant languages, which the Atokthons brought me from their, uh, what did they call it, their kiva, and I hate working through interpreters. So don't. No, as long as we have captured this being, I feel my duty is to examine him for whatever information he can give, and two, I should endeavor to allay his fears. To this poor, unsophisticated semi-savage, we must resemble veritable demons. Consider how he staggered to his aircraft for that bottle of tranquilizing medication he now clutches so tightly. Ergo waved a massive blue hand. Pazilliweef trotted over, using his nose tendrils, in turn, to summon one of the Indians. I don't speak this barbarian's jabber, the navigator pilot explained, but Sikyabotama does. Ergo passed on the datum. The Galactics, including the Pueblo man, formed a semicircle confronting Linquist. The rest of the village watched aloofly. Clack to clack lifted one gaunt arm. Greeting to you, O native, he said in Interlingo 12. Rest assured that you are in the grasping organs of civilized and benevolent entities who intend you no harm, who may indeed prove to be the promoters of a benign revolution upon your planet. Whether this eventually materializes or not is dependent upon my official judgment as to whether a general announcement of the existence of a galaxy-wide federation of technologically or sociologically advanced races will serve the larger good, including your own good. 
Hence, the outcome is to a small extent dependent upon what you yourself individually today choose to give me in the way of information. May I therefore initially request, request, mind you, we shall not compel you, and advise that you relate to me in circumstantial detail what I wish to be apprised of, beginning with the events which led to your untoward arrival. He wants to know how the bum got here, Ergo said in Interlingo 7. The Honorable Envoy of the Federation's Guiding Council asks what gods led hither the stranger's path, Pazilliweep said in Hopi. The paradactyl character is a kind of inspector, Sikivotama said in English. He won't hurt you, but he would like to know a few things. Like, how come you stopped by? Linquist took another pull on his bottle. I... I saw the flying saucer and followed it, he whispered. Yeah, sure. Look, pal, I don't believe you can tell him a thing that I can't, but let's go through with the game and make him happy, okay? The other two are plain merchant sailors, old buddies of mine. I even made a voyage with them once to help establish an outplanet market for our local handicrafts. But Beacon Wings, he's come to find out whether the Galactics ought to let the rest of Earth know about them whether they should invite every country to join their federation. In other words, he's one of those do-gooder types. You don't think we should join? Linquist got forth. Frankly, no, Sikyabotama shrugged. Not that this Pueblo is selfish, or holds a deep grudge against the white man or anything. However, you can't expect we'll fall over ourselves to do the white man a favor, can you? especially when that'd end our own comfortable monopoly on trade and services with the galaxy. We're not ostentatious about it, and, of course, we're pretty small potatoes in the Federation, but you'd be surprised at some of the stuff we keep in our adobes. Lindquist braced himself. I look at the matter differently, he said. Can I trust you to give him my side of the story? Sure. I may be prejudiced, but I'm honest. Besides, he figures to study the whole planet. Don't loft your hopes, though. One dollar gets you ten that he turns thumbs down. How can he? Linquist cried. Sikyabotama looked closer. I'll be damned, you're right. He has thumbs on both sides of his palms. Oh. You mean how can he refuse the USA and the USSR and France and Britain and China and... Well, it's easy. They haven't anything unique to offer. Not in a galaxy loaded with civilizations. All that Wu Simti has, really, is a convenient location, and people who don't swarm over every ship that lands, stealing things and asking stupid questions. You start letting in the riffraff, and first you've got to disestablish institutions like war, and then you've got to give them technical assistance, and then... Anyhow, it's a mess. That's why secrecy is preserved, you know. If you guys ever found out the truth, collectively, you'd have to be invited to join. Otherwise, the do-gooders say your precious little egos would be so bruised that what culture you have would fall to pieces. I hope he checked himself. Sorry, I didn't mean to sound smug or malicious. It's just the way the ball bounces. How about my ego? Linquist demanded, close to tears. Sikibotama patted his shoulder. Nothing personal, Charlie, he said. Individual humans who got interviewed in the past don't seem to have suffered harm. Look at it this way. You won't be any worse off than you were, huh? I'll tell the world, Linquist said furiously. I'll call in the FBI, the news reporters, the... For both our sakes, the Indian answered. I wish you wouldn't. You'd only make a fool of yourself. At most, you'd bring in somebody else, and the village would have to go through the same old cover-up as before. You wouldn't do that to us, would you now? A nice guy like you? No. I'll keep watch. Linquist snapped his mouth shut. Till another ship arrives, huh? Sikibotama chuckled. You'd wait a mighty long time, partner. Not many come? Well, it varies. With thousands of shipping outfits plying these lanes, we can expect several craft per year to stop by, though we never know in advance. However... What we do know is if anybody's within twenty, thirty miles, a little gadget that detects thoughts. So you can't monitor us unbeknownst. We can warn off ships. They do radio us from orbit before landing. Chances are they'd come down anyway, but maintain camouflage. All you'd observe or photograph would be a colored blur like ordinary ball lightning. If worse comes to worst, 
A bunch of us can deal with a spy. Nothing violent, understand. We kind of escort him away, no more. If we have to break his camera, we'll pay him full value. You see, we're Federation members, so we live by Federation rules. The inspector spoke words which went along the chain of interpreters. Sikyabotama nodded and sat down on his haunches. You might as well relax, he said, over here in the shade. You're about to be interviewed. Time passed. Shadows lengthened. The Pueblo women cooked dinner. They brought some to Linquist. It was Hopi food, based on cornmeal tortillas, but the filling was like nothing on earth, quite literally so. Sikyabotama explained that a lot of interstellar trade was in spices. When the sun went below the mountains, stars leaped arrogantly forth. Coyotes yipped across a gigantic silence. Linquist stared heavenward, shivering in the cold. Sikyabotama rose, yawning. That's that, he said. They'll fly you out now, to make sure you don't hang around. Any special place you'd like to go? Colorado Springs, Linquist faltered. I wouldn't. NORAD headquarters, remember. If they spot your plane on their radars without any flight plan filed, they might get a little unpleasant. That's my problem. Linquist could scarcely keep his tone level. He had not dared hope his precarious plan would work to this extent. Okay, so tis. Hmm, I think I'll ride along. You might enjoy being shown around a genuine hypership. Something to tell your grandchildren, if you don't mind them thinking you're an awful liar. The three aliens embarked. Linquist and Sikibotama followed, after the village elders had bidden the former goodbye with every ritual courtesy. A large opening gaped elsewhere in the hall. The aircraft rose on some silent, invisible beam of force. It was stowed aboard. The great ship closed herself, soundlessly, but swathed again in rainbow haze. She lifted and swung north. Inside she was less impressive. In fact, she was grimy, battered, noisy, and ill-smelling. Sikyabotama shrugged when Linquist dared remark on it. So what do you expect in an old tramp with cheapskate owners? Red plush toilet seats? Come on, we better stash you in your plane. Be over Pike's Peak soon. When Linquist was harnessed, the Hopi stuck a hand through the open cabin door of the aircraft. His brown face was bent in a wry smile. Shake, he offered. I hope there aren't any hard feelings. You're a right Kai. I could damn near wish Birdbrain does certify this whole planet for membership, but I know we won't. So long, Charlie, and good luck to you. He closed the door. For a minute Linquist sat alone in the thrumming, coldly lit cavern of the hold. The hull opened. Stars glittered in the aperture, brilliant against crystalline black. Air puffed outward, popping his eardrums, and cold flowed inward. He started his engine but it was the impalpable force beam that carried him forth and released him. Town lights glittered far beneath. The spaceship hovered close like a swirling, shifting, many-hued light fog. She departed, gathering speed until no human-built rocket could have paced her. Night swallowed the vision. Lindquist shuddered. His radio earphone squawked with challenge. An interceptor jet winged toward him. Sure, he said. I'll come down. Any place you want. Excitement torrented through him. And then, take me to your leader. In the morning they turned him over to Lieutenant Harold Quimby. Maybe that press officer could get rid of him. Sunlight slanted through a window, beyond which stretched the neat buildings and walked the neat personnel of the United States Air Force Base. Light glowed on immaculate office furniture, on Quimby's polished insignia and practiced toothpaste smile. Lindquist grew doubly aware of how unshaven, sweaty, and haggard he was. His eyes burned. The lids felt like sandpaper. Cigarette, Quimby invited. Coffee? No, Lindquist grated. Some common sense, that's all I ask. The common sense and common decency of listening to me. Why, surely our people... Yeah, they grilled me for most of the night. Oh, polite enough, but they kept after me and after me. Well, you must realize, Mr. Lindquist, when you suddenly appear over a sensitive area like this, you must expect that men charged with the national defense will ask for details. Damn it, I gave them details, every last stinking detail I could dredge up. 
Look, the fact that I did appear, without your fool radars registering me until I was there, doesn't that mean anything? It means that the plasmoid blanketed your approach. Not unknown. An unusually fine plasmoid, wasn't it? Quimby leaned forward with a sympathetic air. I can easily understand why you would follow such a beautiful and fascinating object. And ah, how the interplay of colors, hypnotic, even epileptogenic effects. Mistaking a vivid dream for reality. No, wait, he lifted his hand. The Air Force is not calling you a lunatic, Mr. Lindquist. What happened to you could happen to anyone. I talked with Major Williams of our psychiatric division before my appointment with you today. He assured me that illusion and confusion are the normal result of lengthy exposure to certain optical phenomena. We lodged you overnight precisely so that our intelligence officers could make a few phone calls, checking on your background and recent activities. I assure you, Mr. Lindquist, we are careful here. We have established that you are sane and well-intentioned. We appreciate the patriotism that led you to seek us out, even in your, uh, slightly delirious condition. You are free to go home, Mr. Lindquist, with the warmest thanks of the United States Air Force. Quimby paused for breath. But you saw the spaceship yourselves, Lindquist groaned. You radared the thing. You recorded electric and magnetic effects. Your technical man admitted as much to me. How can you call it an illusion? We don't, sir. We don't, Quimby beamed. It was absolutely real. The Air Force is not dogmatic. Also, the Air Force has been interested in this subject for many years. When the first so-called flying saucer reports were made in the 1940s, the Air Force mounted its own official investigation. Here, he handed Lindquist a glossy paper pamphlet off a stack on his desk, a brief summary of Project Blue Book. Certain people remained unsatisfied. They charged, quite wrongly, I assure you, distortion and suppression of evidence. Accordingly, to clear its good name, in the late 1960s the Air Force commissioned a new investigation by independent scientific organizations and reputable unaffiliated individuals. An unclassified project, mind you. He gave Lindquist another pamphlet. Here is a history of that effort. It was crowned by success. Here is a summary of the technical findings. Here is a somewhat more popular account. And here is a reprint of what proved to be the key physical data. And here is a... Lindquist slumped. I know, he said. They told me last night what they believe. Ball lightning. Well, no, not exactly that, Quimby said. The subject is pretty complicated. Yes, sir, pretty complicated, if I do say so myself. Flying saucer reports had many different sources. Early during the Fuhrer, it was shown that most were caused by sightings of weather balloons or mirages or reflections or Venus or any of several other things. There did remain a certain small percentage which could not be accounted for in that way. But then it was shown, about 1965 or 70, as I recall, that nature can generate plasmoids in the atmosphere. You know, traveling masses of ionized gas held together for a few hours by a kind of self-generated magnetic bottle. Ball lightning is one kind of plasmoid. There are others, including the kind that signs, produces erratic magnetic and electric fields, reflects radar, shuttles about at incredible speed but with never a sound, and is roughly disc-shaped. In short, the classical flying saucer apparition. This was proven, Mr. Lindquist. It was observed, analyzed, and reproduced in the laboratory. By now, any good electrophysicist who wanted to take the trouble could fake his own flying saucer. Here, take this account by the Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Never mind, Lindquist mumbled. I don't doubt there are natural neon signs zipping around. So the saucerians don't need anything for camouflage except a false one. Well, Mr. Lindquist, Quimby replied the least bit severely, don't you believe it's high time you looked at the matter like the reasonable man you are? You had a, a, an involuntary psychedelic experience. You would not have had it if you had known the truth. Then you would have realized there was no point in chasing that plasmoid. Nobody does any more, you know. Because of your uh, long foreign residence, you weren't kept up to date. But the truth is that the flying saucer hysteria vanished years ago. Once the clear light of science was thrown on this murky subject, the American people realized that everything had been due to an easily explainable natural phenomenon. They turned their attention to better topics. You won't find anyone any longer who claims that flying saucers are uh, spaceships crewed by little green men. Would you believe a surly blue giant? 
No, Mr. Lindquist, I would not. Nor, uh, paradactyls and centaurs with arms on their noses. Least of all that a bunch of poverty-stricken, mostly illiterate Pueblo Indians are... Well, you have a very imaginative subconscious mind, sir, but I'm afraid no one cares to listen. So you had better settle for reality. Lindquist raised eyes in which hope still struggled with exhaustion. No one? he asked. Absolutely no one in the world? Oh, I suppose a few cranks are left. Like in California, Quimby laughed. People to whom the outer space visitor's idea became a sort of religion that they still can't bear to give up? His tone sharpened. It would not be advisable to prey on their gullibility. Not that you would, Mr. Lindquist. But some confidence man who, uh, tried to squeeze a dollar from those poor deluded souls. Yes, I think the authorities might deal rather harshly with him. Lindquist rose. I know when I'm licked, he said bitterly. I won't take any more of your time. Well, thank you, that's appreciated. Quimby stood, too, with almost indecent haste. We are rather busy at the moment, preparing press kits about General Robinson's promotion to four-star rank. Lindquist ignored the proffered hand and shambled toward the door. Too busy to bring Earth into the Galactic Federation, he spat. That's not the job of the Air Force, Quimby reminded him. Foreign relations belong to the State Department. The bar which Lindquist found was noisy with college students. He didn't mind that. For the most part, he sat hunched over his beer. When his awareness did occasionally return from interstellar immensities to order more beer, he got a little encouragement from the sight of coeds passing by. A universe which had produced girls couldn't be all bad. Contrarywise, it must be a hell of a good universe. Rich, wonderful, various, exciting, mind-expanding, soul-uplifting, if only you could get out into it. Rats! Linquist muttered around his pipe stem. Got to be some way to make a buck with what I know. He wasn't entirely cynical. The Galactics were, he thought. They denied to the human race every marvel, opportunity, insight, help, comfort that a millennia-old science must have to give. Not that they were monsters. With how many suns in the galaxy? A hundred billion? They rated intelligent species at a dime a dozen, and probably this was inevitable. Indeed, it was astonishing how altruistic they were. They could have conquered Earth in an afternoon, but instead they slunk about in disguise for fear of what the knowledge of their presence might do to men, if, following the revelation, they did not promptly act to lift man to their own level. Sure, you can't blame them. Why should they solve our problems for us? Especially when it would be a lot of trouble and expense for them. What did we ever do for the Galactics? Lindquist fumed smoke into the racketing, beer-laden air. That's not the point, he thought grimly. The point, as far as I'm concerned, is that I and my whole ever-loving species will keep on being poor, ignorant, war-plagued, tyrannized, restricted, short-lived, and I don't know what else, unless the Federation can be forced to take us in. Which it can be, if we, the people of the United States, learn for sure that the Federation exists. How? The Galactics, including those engines, understand how to keep us blindfolded. They didn't even bother to silence me. Who'd listen? Maybe momentarily the chance had existed. In 1950, or whenever the flying saucer craze started, human civilization had advanced to the point where it could imagine extraterrestrial visitors, and it had not yet gotten the idea of plasmoids, or rather, it was denying that any such thing could be. So the standard spaceship disguise had been ineffective for a decade or two. Unfortunately, though, no one had happened to catch a sitting spaceship during those years. At least, not enough people had happened to do so, and their unsupported word was insufficient. Now research had established that flying saucers could be plasmoids. Therefore, humankind concluded, they were plasmoids, as the Galactics had foreseen. Today, no one would believe the crazy truth except maybe some pathetic remnants of the discredited saucer cults. They might. But what could they do, except invite the narrator into their mutual admiration society? What could they do? Sean Lindquist leaped to his feet. His table went over, scattering beer and broken glass. His pipe fell to the floor. Eureka! he bellowed. The bartender approached. 
You had enough, Buster, he said ominously. Start taking off your clothes and I call a cop. The Reverend Jackson Muir, pastor of the First United Church of the Cosmic Brotherhood, was a surprise. Though Lindquist had done considerable research beforehand, he had expected someone more, well, far out. Reverend Muir was soft-spoken, self-contained, and conventionally dressed, for Los Angeles at least. He lived with his wife in an apartment near the shop that earned him his daily bread. The place could have belonged to any middle-class, middle-aged couple. Only the books were unusual. They formed probably as complete a library of Saucerianna as existed anywhere on earth. Please sit down, Mr. Lindquist, he invited. Would you care for some coffee? Smoke, if you wish. It's bad for the health, but until the elder brethren see fit to raise us to the next rung of evolution's ladder, we can't much help our frailties. Pardon me. I didn't intend to preach at you. You came to tell me something, not vice versa. Lindquist wondered what his best gambit was. From what he could learn of the C.B. Church, its few score active members, and its influence on several hundred sorcerists of other kinds, he didn't believe that he could be entirely truthful. Muir's credo held that the extraterrestrials were the benevolent, well-nigh omnipotent agents of a civilization which was the chosen instrument of God. That wouldn't fit so well with a rusty old tramp ship, pinchpenny owners, and so forth, would it? I've had an experience, he said. Really? Muir's tone did not alter. Do you know, I never have been vouchsafed one. Few who were are left alive. The last confirmed report of a talk with them was fifteen years ago. His gaze was quite steady. Traffic noises came through the window to underscore his voice with muted thunder. Hoaxes are not unheard of. Lindquist achieved a smile. You're skeptical, Reverend? Well, let us say I'm open-minded. I've often stated in sermons and articles that I think the elders have abandoned us for a while because we grew too skeptical. They will come back when faith has come back. But, forgive me, there have been deliberate frauds, and there have been far more honest mistakes. For your sake, as well as ours, we must sift your story carefully, whatever you tell. You're very tactful, sir. Lindquist's lanky frame relaxed in the armchair. As he felt his way into the situation, he gained confidence. And I might as well confess at the outset. I want money. Furthermore, I haven't a scrap of physical evidence. Only the recent sighting over Colorado Springs, which thousands of people saw. He drew a breath. However, if I can get financing, your auditors will keep track of every nickel. What we need is to build and transport a certain device which the elders have described to me. For this, we'll have to buy materials and hire expensive technicians. We'll have to do a little R&D, perhaps, because the elders didn't give me any blueprint, only a general verbal account. We'll have to do this on the QT until we're ready to roll, or you can imagine what a field day the news media will have. Muir opened his mouth. Lindquist hurried on. In earnest of my sincerity, as well as to help, I can mortgage what little I own and toss several thousand dollars into the kitty. If you can double that, I believe we'll have the necessary. I checked on your people before I phoned you. They're not rich by a long shot. But between your congregation and, uh, its sympathizers, if you launch an appeal yourself, a few dollars contributed per person, the thing can be swung financially without hurting any individual, except me, if it fails. He paused. I do not guarantee success, he finished. Muir sat quiet for a long time. His eyes never left his visitor. Finally he whispered, you're not a con artist. You may be a crank, but you're honest. Go on, in God's name. Lindquist saw tears. However noble his purpose, he felt a touch guilty as he gave his doctored account. The benevolent elders had returned. They found earth in dire straits. Disaster was imminent. Yet they could not destroy the human spirit by acting as dictators. They could only work through such persons as had faith in them. Nor could they linger here. Other planets also needed their attention. But if enough humans had faith, if the veritable mustard seed existed upon earth, then they could manifest themselves at last and lead mankind to salvation. To this end, let the faithful build a communication device such as they demonstrated and explained to Sean F. X. Lindquist. In time, 
they would receive its message, and they would come. Did no such call reach them, they would sadly know that man was beyond redemption. Passing through the ship's observation veranda, an elegant phrase for a crummy little cabin outfitted with an exterior visit screen and a few seats adjustable to most species, Ergo the Red saw clack to clack The sector inspector stood hunched before the view that slid beneath. The scene was of high desert, raw mineral hues under a blazing sun. His winged shape was etched in black by contrast, and yet he looked so frail, bowed, utterly tired and discouraged, that Ergo's equivalent of a heart went out to him. The engineer supercargo had grumbled at length during the past tedious weeks. Nevertheless, against his will, he had come to like the official passenger. It hurt him now to see the little Etatican stand thus alone. He went and joined him. You really quittin', huh? he asked inanely. Clack to clack uttered a mournful whistle. Yes. Not that the natives have no potential. They seem about average, in so far as any such concept is meaningful, but I could not justify a recommendation that missions be sent to elevate them. Troublemakers, yeah. I could have told you that right off, Ergo rumbled. No, not really. Clack spread his wings and folded them again. They would not be a detriment to the Federation, but neither would they be an outstanding asset, as far as I can judge on the basis of my examinations. They would, in short, be merely one more member species. Therefore, as long as they remain in happy ignorance of us, I cannot honestly say that the Federation taxpayer should be burdened with the cost of incorporating them. Let them invent the hyperdrive for themselves in a thousand or two years. Ergo belched, which out of him corresponded to a sigh of relief. That's the spirit, Inspector. I knew you'd decide right. But how come are you looking so down in the chops you haven't got? I don't rightly know, Clack to Clack said. Depression, I suppose. So much time, effort, expense, inconveniencing you and navigator pilot Finnison. You've been extraordinarily kind, you two, and I won't forget it when I write my official report. But for nothing. Ergo spread his mighty arms. Ah, don't worry. The job was a drag, sure, but it's over with now. We'll stop off at the Pueblo to snatch a rest and some trade goods, then ho for the rim. At that moment the buzzer sounded. Pazilliweep's voice followed. Attenta! He had amused himself by acquiring a few 143 in phrases as Grumdle Castle prowled around the globe. Pericolo! All hands to stations! What the blazes? Ergo was already loping for the engine room. Clack to clack flapped and hopped toward his quarters, where he would at least be out of the way. You don't argue when someone calls emergency on a hypership. The deck gong to the engineer supercargo's footfalls. What's the matter? he roared. I don't know, Pazilliweep said tautly over the intercom. Electromagnetic field, variable, registered a few seconds ago. Might be a natural plasmoid, but we'd better have a look. Ergo felt relieved. The news could have been something nasty, like the bottom dropping out of this hull. Where are we, anyhow? he asked. About fifty miles west of Bubu Sinti, which is to say, the emanations could be from a galactic ship in distress, a little ways beyond mine detector range from the Pueblo. Pazilli Weep swung his craft through a ninety-degree turn. The acceleration compensators were so badly out of phase that Ergo slipped on the deck and hit his nose. Nevertheless, the engineer supercargo confined his remarks to a muttered, snag a bag bart bass That was cruel country below, especially for beings who had not evolved on this planet. A vessel grounded helpless in those arid mountains and canyons might soon be crewless, and that, aside from every moral consideration, invited the disaster of discovery by non-Hopi autochthons. It was well that Grumdal Castle had happened by in time. Once in the engine room, Ergo activated his own business screen. He saw a wild landscape, heat shimmers and dust devils, and, yes, a saucer shape on a small mesa. Its outlines were blurred by a weak camouflage field, and neither he nor Pazilliweep could identify the make of ship, but with millions of different makes. Why aren't they transmitting? Pazilliweep wondered. Transmitter busted, I guess, Ergo said. They could have lain here for comet fire days or weeks, you know. 
aiming to land at Wubu Simti, but not making it, expecting somebody else to come by eventually and keeping their field going so as they'd be detectable at a distance, but not daring to strike out on foot for the Pueblo, Pazilliwee batted. Right you are. Let's get down. Grumdal Castle descended to the mesa and cut her own camouflage and her engines. The Galactics emerged into brilliant, silent, sagebrush pungent air, hulking ergo, graceful Pazilli weep, broad-winged clack to clack moved across the sand toward the beached hypership. Only, now that they were close, it looked less and less like a hypership. It looked more like, Surprise! Surprise! caroled a native voice. Sean F. X. Lindquist's lean form sprang from the false hull. He ran to meet them, arms spread in welcome, face wide open in a silly grin. Am I glad to see you? Two weeks waiting, and you turn out to be the very same guys who... Come on and have a cold beer. Clack de Clack had brought his translator machine, which was keyed to several Federation as well as 143 in languages, but it was his pomander behind which he retreated. His eyes rolled, he gasped, Ergo bawled, Oh, no! And Pizzilliweep looked ill. Other humans emerged. So did a television camera on a dolly. We alerted the news services, Lindquist said happily. Of course, they thought this was a lunatic fringe project, but they did agree to stand by in case we came up with anything good for laughs. Smile, you're on candid camera. Now we better break the news gently to my assistants that you aren't quite the godlike beings most of them think you are. He stopped, blushed through his stubble, and beckoned to a companion. Pardon me. I was so excited I forgot. Here's Professor Rastavsid of Colorado U. He speaks Hopi. Clack de Clack had already adjusted his machine to English. He turned it off for a minute while he expressed himself in his own tongue. Then he closed the circuit again. Never mind, he said resignedly. Welcome to the Galactic Federation. THE EXALTED by L. Sprague de Camp The stork-like man with the gray goatee shuffled the twelve black billets about on the tabletop. Try it again, he said. The undergraduate sighed. Okay, Professor Methuen. He looked apprehensively at Johnny Black, sitting across the table with one claw on the button of the stop clock. Johnny returned the look impassively through the spectacles perched on his yellowish muzzle. Go, said Ira Methuen. Johnny depressed the button. The undergraduate started the second run of his wiggle block test. The twelve billets formed a kind of three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. When assembled, they would make a cube. But the block had originally been sawn apart on wavy, irregular lines, so that the billets had to be put together just so. The undergraduate fiddled with the billets, trying this one and that one against one he held in his hand. The clock ticked round. In four minutes, he had all but one in place. This one, a corner piece, simply would not fit. The undergraduate wiggled it and pushed it. He looked at it closely and tried again. But its maladjustment remained. The undergraduate gave up. What's the trick? he asked. Methuen reversed the billet, end for end. It fitted. Oh, heck, said the undergraduate. I could have gotten it if it hadn't been for Johnny. Instead of being annoyed, Johnny Black twitched his mouth in a bear's equivalent of a grin. Methuen asked the student why. He distracts me somehow. I know he's friendly and all that, but it's this way, sort of. Here I come to Yale to get to be a psychologist. I hear all about testing animals, chimps and bears and such, and when I get here I find a bear testing me. It's kind of upsetting. That's all right, said Methuen, just what we wanted. We're after not your wiggly block score by itself, but the effect of Johnny's presence on people taking the test. We're getting Johnny's distraction factor, his ability to distract people. We're also getting the distortion factor of a lot of other things, such as various sounds and smells. I didn't tell you sooner because the knowledge might have affected your performance. I see. Do I still get my five bucks? Of course. Good day, Kitchell. Come on, Johnny. We've just got time to make Psychobiology 100. We'll clean up the stuff later. On the way out of Methuen's office, Johnny asked, Hey, boss, do you fear any effect yet? Not a bit, said Methuen. I think my original theory was right. 
that the electrical resistance of the gaps between human neurons is already as low as it can be, so the Methuen injections won't have any appreciable effect on a human being. Sorry, Johnny, but I'm afraid your boss won't become any great genius as a result of trying a dose of his own medicine. The Methuen treatment had raised Johnny's intelligence from that of a normal black bear to that of, or more exactly to the equivalent of that of, a human being. It had enabled him to carry out those spectacular coups in the Virgin Islands in the Central Park Zoo. It had also worked on a number of other animals in the said zoo, with regrettable results. Johnny grumbled in his Urso-American accent, Sir, I don't think it is smart to teach a class when you are fur of that stuff. You never know. But they had arrived. The class comprised a handful of grave graduate students, on whom Johnny's distraction factor had little effect. Ira Methuen was not a good lecturer. He put in too many uhs and errs and tended to mumble. Besides, Psychobiology 100 was an elementary survey, and Johnny was pretty well up in the field himself. So he settled himself to a view of the Grove Street Cemetery across the street, and to melancholy reflections on the short lifespan of his species compared with that of men. Ouch! R. H. Wimpus, B.S. 68, jerked his backbone from its normally nonchalant arc into a quivering reflex curve. His eyes were wide with mute indignation. Methuen was saying, whereupon it was discovered that the, uh, paralysis of the pes resulting from excision of the corresponding motor area of the cortex was much more lasting among the simidae than among the other catarine primates, that it was more lasting among these than among the platyrines. Mr. Wimpus? Nothing, said Wimpus. I'm sorry. And that the platyrines, in turn, suffered more than the lemuroids and tarsioids. When, ugh! Another graduate student jerked upright. While Methuen paused with his mouth open, a third man picked a small object off the floor and held it up. Really, gentlemen, said Methuen, I thought you'd outgrown such amusements as shooting rubber bands at each other. As I was saying when Wimpus gave another grunt and jerk, he glared about him. Methuen tried to get his lecture going again, but as rubber bands from nowhere continued to sting the necks and ears of the listeners, the classroom organization visibly disintegrated, like a lump of sugar in a cup of weak tea. Johnny had put on his spectacles and was peering about the room, but he was no more successful than the others in locating the source of the bombardment. He slid off his chair and shuffled over to the light switch. The daylight through the windows left the rear end of the classroom dark. As soon as the lights went on, the source of the elastics was obvious. A couple of the graduates pounced on a small wooden box on the shelf beside the projector. The box gave out a faint whirr and spat rubber bands through a slit, one every few seconds. They brought it up and opened it on Methuen's lecture table. Inside was a mass of machinery apparently made of the parts of a couple of alarm clocks and a lot of hand-whittled wooden cams and things. My, my, said Methuen, a most ingenious contraption, isn't it? The machine ran down with a click. While they were still examining it, the bell rang. Methuen looked out the window. A September rain was coming up. Ira Methuen pulled on his topcoat and his rubbers and took his umbrella from the corner. He never wore a hat. He went out and headed down Prospect Street, Johnny padding behind. Hi, said a young man, a fat young man in need of a haircut. Got any news for us, Professor Methuen? I'm afraid not, Bruce, replied Methuen, unless you call Ford's giant mouse news. What? What giant mouse? Dr. Ford has produced a 300-pound mouse by orthogonal mutation. He had to alter its morphological characteristics. It's what? It's shape to you. He had to alter it to make it possible for it to live. Where? Where is it? Osborne Labs. If... But Bruce Inglehart was gone up the hill toward the science buildings. Methuen continued. With no war on, and New Haven as dead a town as it always has been, they have to come to us for news, I suppose. Come on, Johnny. Getting garrulous in my old age. A passing dog went crazy at the sight of Johnny, snarling and snapping. Johnny ignored it. They entered Woodbridge Hall. Dr. Wendell Cook, president of Yale University, had Methuen sent in at once. Johnny, excluded from the sanctum, went up to the president's secretary. 
He stood up and put his paws on her desk. He leered. You have to see a bear leer to know how it is done, and said, How about it, kid? Miss Prescott, an unmistakable Boston spinster, smiled at him. Certainly, Johnny, just a moment. She finished typing a letter, opened a drawer, and took out a copy of Hecht's Fantasius Malare. This she gave Johnny. He curled up on the floor, adjusted his glasses, and read. After a while he looked up, saying, Miss Prescott, I am halfway through this, and I stir don't see why they call it obscene. I think it is just dirty. Can't you get me a really dirty book? Well, really, Johnny, I don't run a pornography shop, you know. Most people find that quite strong enough. Johnny sighed. People get excited over the funniest things. Meanwhile, Methuen was closeted with Cook and Dalrymple, the prospective and dower, in another of those interminable and indecisive conferences. Our Hanscom Dalrymple looked like a statue that the sculptor had never gotten around to finishing. The only expression the steel chairman ever allowed himself was a canny, secretive smile. Cook and Methuen had a feeling he was playing them on the end of a long and well-knit fish line made of U.S. Federal Reserve notes. It was not because he wasn't willing to part with the damned endowment, but because he enjoyed the sensation of power over these oh-so-educated men. And in the actual world, one doesn't lose one's temper and tell Croesus what to do with his loot. One says, Yes, Mr. Dalrymple, my, my, that is a brilliant suggestion, Mr. Dalrymple. Why didn't we think of it ourselves? Cook and Methuen were both old hands at this game. Methuen, though otherwise he considered Wendell Cook a pompous ass, admired the President's endowment-snagging ability. After all, wasn't Yale University named after a retired merchant on the basis of a gift of 562 pounds 12 shillings? Say, Dr. Cook, said Dalrymple, why don't you come over to the Taft and have lunch on me for a change? You too, Professor Methuen. The academics murmured their delight and pulled on their rubbers. On the way out, Dalrymple paused to scratch Johnny behind the ears. Johnny put his book away, keeping the title on the cover out of sight, and restrained himself from snapping at the steel man's hand. Dalrymple meant well enough, but Johnny did not like people to take such liberties with his person. So three men and a bear slopped down College Street. Cook paused now and then, ignoring the sprinkle, to make studied gestures toward one or another of the units of the great souffle of Georgian and collegiate Gothic architecture. He explained this and that. Dalrymple merely smiled his blank little smile. Johnny, plodding behind, was the first to notice that passing undergraduates were pausing to stare at the President's feet. The word feet is meant literally, for Cook's rubbers were rapidly changing into a pair of enormous pink bare feet. Cook himself was quite unconscious, until quite a group of undergraduates had collected. These gave forth the catteral snorts of men trying unsuccessfully not to laugh. By the time Cook had followed their stares and looked down, the metamorphosis was complete. That he should be startled was only natural. The feet were startling enough. His face gradually matched the feet in redness, making a cheerful note of color in the gray landscape. Our Hanscom Dalrymple lost his reserve for once. His howls did nothing to save Prexy's now apoplectic face. Cook finally stooped and pulled off the rubbers. It transpired that the feet had been painted on the outside of the rubbers and covered over with lamp black. The rain had washed the lamp black off. Wendell Cook resumed his walk to the Hotel Taft in gloomy silence. He held the offensive rubbers between thumb and finger, as if they were something unclean and loathsome. He wondered who had done this dastardly deed. There hadn't been any undergraduates in his office for some days, but you never wanted to underestimate the ingenuity of undergraduates. He noticed that Ira Methuen was wearing rubbers of the same size and make as his own, but he put suspicion in that direction out of his mind before it had fully formed. Certainly Methuen wouldn't play practical jokes with Dalrymple around, when he'd be the head of the new Department of Biophysics, when, if, Dalrymple came through with the endowment. The next man to suspect that the Yale campus was undergoing a severe pixelation was John Duggan, the tall, thin one of the two campus cops. He was passing Christ Church, which is so very high church Episcopal that they refer to Charles I of England as St. Charles the Martyr, on his way to his lair in Phelps Tower, a still, small voice spoke in his ear. Beware, John Duggan. 
Your sins will find you out. Duggan jumped and looked around. The voice repeated its message. There was nobody within fifty feet of Duggan. Moreover, he could not think of any really serious sins he had committed lately. The only people in sight were a few undergraduates and Professor Methuen's educated black bear trailing after his boss as usual. There was nothing for John Duggan to suspect but his own sanity. R. Hanscom Dalrymple was a bit surprised at the grim earnestness of the professors in putting away their respective shares of the James Pierpont dinner. They were staying the eternal gnaw of hunger that afflicts those who depend on a college commissary for sustenance. Many of them suspected a conspiracy among college cooks to see that the razor edge wasn't taken off students' and instructors' intellects by overfeeding. They knew that conditions were much the same in most colleges. Dalrymple sipped his coffee and looked at his notes. Presently, Cook would get up and say a few pleasant things. Then he would announce Dalrymple's endowment, which was to be spent in building a Dalrymple biophysical laboratory and setting up a new department. Everybody would applaud and agree that biophysics had floated in the void between the domains of the departments of zoology, psychology, and the physiological sciences long enough. Then Dalrymple would get up and clear his throat and say, though in much more dignified language, Shucks, fellas, it really isn't nothing. Dr. Wendell Cook duly got up, beamed out over the ranked shirt fronts, and said his pleasant nothings. The professors exchanged nervous looks when he showed signs of going off into his favorite oration, There is no conflict between science and religion. They had heard it before. He was well launched into version 3A of this homily, when he began to turn blue in the face. It was not the dark purplish-gray called loosely blue that appears on the faces of Strang Lees, but a bright, cheerful cobalt. Now, such a color is all very well in a painting of a ship sailing under a clear sky, or in the uniform of a movie theater doorman, but it is distinctly out of place in the face of a college president. Or so felt the professors. They leaned this way and that, their boiled shirts bulging, popping and gaping as they did so, and whispered. Cook frowned and continued. He was observed to sniff the air as if he smelled something. Those at the speaker's table detected a slight smell of acetone, but that seemed hardly an adequate explanation of the robin's egg hue of their prexy's face. The color was now quite solid on the face proper. It ran up into the area where Cook's hair would have been, if he had had some. His collar showed a trace of it, too. Cook, on his part, had no idea of why the members of his audience were swaying in their seats like saplings in a gale and whispering. He thought it very rude of them, but his frowns had no effect. So presently he cut version 3A short. He announced the endowment in concise, business-like terms and paused for the expected thunder of applause. There was none. To be exact, there was a feeble patter that nobody in his right mind would call a thunder of anything. Cook looked at R. Hanscom Dalrymple, hoping that the steel man would not be insulted. Dalrymple's face showed nothing. Cook assumed that this was part of his general reserve, the truth was that Dalrymple was too curious about the blue face to notice the lack of applause. When Cook introduced him to the audience, it took him some seconds to pull himself together. He started rather lamely. Gentlemen and members of the Yale faculty, uh, I mean, of course, you're all gentlemen. I am reminded of a story about the poultry farmer who got married. I mean, I'm not reminded of that story but the one about the divinity student who died and went to... Here Dalrymple caught the eye of the dean of the divinity school. He tacked again. Maybe I'd, uh, better tell the one about the Scotchman who got lost on his way home, and... It was not a bad story, as such things go, but it got practically no laughter. Instead, the professors began swaying like a roomful of boiled-shirted Eastern ascetics at their prayers and whispering again. Dalrymple could put two and two together. He leaned over and hissed into Cook's ear. Is there anything wrong with me? Yes. Your face has turned green. Green? Bright green. Like grass. Nice young grass. Well, you might like to know that yours is blue. Both men felt their faces. There was no doubt. They were masked with coatings of some sort of paint, still wet. Dalrymple whispered, What kind of gag is this? I don't know. Better finish your speech. Dalrymple tried, but his thoughts were scattered beyond recovery. 
He made a few remarks about how glad he was to be there amid the elms and ivy and traditions of old Eli, and sat down. His face looked rougher hewn than ever. If a joke had been played on him, well, he hadn't signed any checks yet. The lieutenant governor of the state of Connecticut was next on the list. Cook shot a question at him. He mumbled, But if I'm going to turn a funny color when I get up, the question of whether his honor should speak was never satisfactorily settled. For at that moment a thing appeared on one end of the speaker's table. It was a beast the size of a St. Bernard. It looked rather the way a common bat would look if, instead of wings, it had arms with disc-shaped pads on the ends of the fingers. Its eyes were as big around as luncheon plates. There was commotion. The speaker sitting nearest the thing fell over backward. The lieutenant governor crossed himself. An English zoologist put on his glasses and said, By Jove, a spectral tarsier, but a bit large. What? A natural-sized tarsier would fit in your hand comfortably, and is rather cute, if a bit spooky. But a tarsier the size of this one is not the kind of thing one can glance at and then go on reading the adventures of Ali Oop. It breaks one's train of thought. It disconcerts one. It may give one the screaming memes. This tarsier walked gravely down the twenty feet of table. The diners were too busy going away from there to observe that it upset no tumblers and kicked no ashtrays about, that it was, in fact, slightly transparent. At the other end of the table it vanished. Johnny Black's curiosity wrestled with his better judgment. His curiosity told him that all these odd happenings had taken place in the presence of Ira Methuen. Therefore, Ira Methuen was at least a promising suspect. So what? said his better judgment. He's the only man you have a real affection for. If you learned that he was the pixie in the case, you wouldn't expose him, would you? Better keep your muzzle out of this. But in the end his curiosity won, as usual. The wonder was that his better judgment kept on trying. He got hold of Bruce Inglehart. The young reporter had a reputation for discretion. Johnny explained, He gave himself the misuant treatment, you know, the spiner injection, to see what it would do to a man. That was a week ago. Should have worked by now. But he says it had no effect. Maybe not. But day after the dose, are these things start happening. Very elaborate jokes. Kinda crazy scientific genius would do. If it's him, I must stop him before he makes rear trouble. You will help me? Sure, Johnny. Shake on it. Johnny extended his paw. It was two nights later that Durfee Hall caught fire. Yale had been discussing the erasure of this singularly ugly and useless building for forty years. It had been vacant for some time, except for the bursar's office in the basement. About ten o'clock an undergraduate noticed little red tongues of flame crawling up the roof. He gave the alarm at once. The New Haven Fire Department was not to be blamed for the fact that the fire spread as fast as if the building had been soaked in kerosene. By the time they and about a thousand spectators had arrived, the whole center of the building was going up with a fine roar and crackle. The assistant bursar bravely dashed into the building and reappeared with an armful of papers, which later turned out to be a pile of quite useless examination forms. The fire department squirted enough water onto the burning section to put out Mount Vesuvius. Some of them climbed ladders at the ends of the building to chop holes in the roof. The water seemed to have no effect, so the fire department called some more apparatus, connected up more hoses, and squirted more water. The undergraduates yelled, Ra ra fire department! Ra ra fire! Go get him, department! Hold that line, fire! Johnny Black bumped into Bruce Inglehart, who was dodging about in the crowd with a pad and pencil, trying to get information for his New Haven courier. Inglehart asked Johnny whether he knew anything. Johnny, in his deliberate manner, said, I know one thing. That is the first heatress fire I have seen. Inglehart looked at Johnny then at the conflagration. My gosh, he said, we ought to feel the radiation here, oughtn't we? Heatless fire is right. Another super scientific joke, you suppose? We can rook around, said Johnny, turning their backs on the conflagration. They began searching among the shrubbery and railings along Elm Street. Woof, said Johnny. Come here, Bruce. 
In a patch of shadow stood Professor Ira Methuen and a tripod whereon was mounted a motion picture projector. It took Johnny a second to distinguish which was which. Methuen seemed uneasily poised on the verge of flight. He said, Why, hello, Johnny. Why aren't you asleep? I just found this, uh, this projector. Johnny, thinking fast, slapped the projector with his paw. Methuen caught it as it toppled. Its whir ceased. At the same instant the fire went out, vanished utterly. The roar and crackle still came from the place where the fire had been, but there was no fire. There was not even a burned place in the roof, off which gallons of water were still pouring. The fire department looked at one another foolishly. While Johnny's and Ingelhardt's pupils were still expanding in the sudden darkness, Methuen and his projector vanished. They got a glimpse of him galloping around the College Street corner, lugging the tripod. They ran after him. A few undergraduates ran after Johnny and Ingelhardt, being moved by the instinct that makes dogs chase automobiles. They caught sight of Methuen, lost him, and caught sight of him again. Ingelhardt was not built for running, and Johnny's eyesight was an affair of limited objectives. Johnny opened up when it became evident that Methuen was heading for the old Phelps mansion, where he, Johnny, and several unmarried instructors lived. Everybody in the house had gone to see the fire. Methuen dashed in the front door three jumps ahead of Johnny and slammed it in the bear's face. Johnny padded around in the dark with the idea of attacking a window, but while he was making up his mind, something happened to the front steps under him. They became slicker than the smoothest ice. Down the steps went Johnny, bump, bump, bump. Johnny picked himself up in no pleasant mood. So this was the sort of treatment he got from the one man. But then he reflected, if Methuen was really crazy, you couldn't blame him. Some of the undergraduates caught up with them. These crowded toward the mansion, until their feet went out from under them as if they were wearing invisible roller skates. They tried to get up and fell again, sliding down the slight grade of the crown of the road into heaps in the gutter. They retired on hands and knees, their clothes showing large holes. A police car drove up and tried to stop. Apparently neither brakes nor tires would hold. It skidded about, banged against the curb once, and finally stopped down the street beyond the slippery zone. The cop, he was a fairly important cop, a captain, got out and charged the mansion. He fell down, too. He tried to keep going on hands and knees, but every time he applied a horizontal component of force to a hand or knee, the hand or knee simply slid backward. The sight reminded Johnny of the efforts of those garter snakes to crawl on the smooth concrete floor of the Central Park Zoo monkey house. When the police captain gave up and tried to retreat, the laws of friction came back on. But when he stood up, all his clothes below the waist, except his shoes, disintegrated into a cloud of textile fibers. My word, said the English zoologist, who had just arrived. Just like one of those Etruscan statues, don't you know? The police captain bawled at Bruce Engelard. Hey, you! For God's sakes, give me a handkerchief! What's the matter? Got a cold? asked Engelard innocently. No, you dope! You know what I want it for! Engelard suggested that a better idea would be for the captain to use his coat as an apron. While the captain was knotting the sleeves behind his back, Engelard and Johnny explained their version of the situation to him. Hmm, said the captain. We don't want nobody to get hurt or the place to get damaged. But suppose he's got a death ray or something. I don't think so, said Johnny. He has not hurt anybody. Just pray jokes. The captain thought for a few seconds of ringing up headquarters and having them send an emergency truck. But the credit for overpowering a dangerous maniac single-handed was too tempting. He said, How'll we get into the place if he can make everything so slippery? They thought. Johnny said, can you get one of those things with a wood stick and a rubber cup on end? The captain frowned. Johnny made motions. Ingelart said, Oh, you mean the plumber's friend? Sure, you wait. I'll get one. See if you can find a key to the place. The assault on Methuen's stronghold was made on all fours. The captain in front jammed the end of the plumber's friend against the rise of the lowest front step. If Methuen could abolish friction... He had not discovered how to get rid of barometric pressure. The rubber cap held, and the cop pulled himself, Ingelart, and Johnny after him. By using the instrument on successive steps, they mounted them. Then the captain anchored them to the front door and pulled them up to it. 
He hauled himself to his feet by the door handle and opened the door with a key borrowed from Dr. Wendell Cook. At one window, Methuen crouched behind a thing like a surveyor's transit. He swiveled the thing toward them and made adjustments. The captain and Inglehart, feeling their shoes grip the floor, gathered themselves to jump, but Methuen got the contraption going and their feet went out from under them. Johnny used his head. He was standing next to the door. He lay down, braced his hind feet against the door frame, and kicked out. His body whizzed across the frictionless floor and bowled over Methuen and his contraption. The professor offered no more resistance. He seemed more amused than anything, despite the lump that was growing on his forehead. He said, My, my, you fellows are persistent. I suppose you're going to take me off to some asylum. I thought you and you, he indicated Ingallard and Johnny, were friends of mine. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. The captain growled. What did you do to my pants? Simple. My telelubricator here neutralizes the interatomic bonds on the surface of any solid on which the beam falls. So the surface, to a depth of a few molecules, is put in the condition of a supercooled liquid as long as the beam is focused on it. Since the liquid form of any compound will wet the solid form, you have perfect lubrication. But my pants! They were held together by friction between the fibers, weren't they? And I have a lot more inventions like that. My soft speaker and my three-dimensional projector, for instance, are... Inglehart interrupted. Is that how you made that phony fire? And that whatchamacallit that scared the people at the dinner? With a three-dimensional projector? Yes, of course. Though, to be exact, it took two projectors at right angles, and a phonograph and amplifier to give the sound effect. It was amusing, wasn't it? But, wailed Johnny, why do you do these things? You trying to ruin your career? Methuen shrugged. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters, Johnny as you'd know if you were in my, uh, condition. And now, gentlemen, where do you want me to go? Wherever it is, I'll find something amusing there. Dr. Wendell Cook visited Ira Methuen on the first day of his incarceration in the New Haven Hospital. In ordinary conversation, Methuen seemed sane enough and quite agreeable. He readily admitted that he had been the one responsible for the jokes. He explained, I painted your and Dalrymple's face with a high-powered needle sprayer I invented. It's a most amusing little thing. Fits in your hand and discharges through a ring on your finger. With your thumb, you can regulate the amount of acetone mixed in with the water, which in turn controls the surface tension, and therefore the point at which the needle spray breaks up into droplets. I made the spray break up just before it reached your face. You were a sight, Cook, especially when you found out what was wrong with you. You looked almost as funny as the day I painted those feet on my rubbers and substituted them for yours. You react so beautifully to having your dignity pricked. You always were a pompous ass, you know. Cook puffed out his cheeks and controlled himself. After all, the poor man was mad. These absurd outbursts about Cook's pompousness proved it. He said sadly, Dalrymple's leaving tomorrow night. He was most displeased about the face-painting episode and when he found that you were under observation, he told me that no useful purpose would be served by his remaining here. I'm afraid that's the end of our endowment, unless you can pull yourself together and tell us what's happened to you and how to cure it. Ira Methuen laughed. Pull myself together? I am all in one piece, I assure you. And I've told you what's the matter with me, as you put it. I gave myself my own treatment. As for curing it... I wouldn't tell you how, even if I knew. I wouldn't give up my present condition for anything. I at last realize that nothing really matters, including endowments. I shall be taken care of, and I will devote myself to amusing myself as I see fit. Johnny had been haunting Cook's office all day. He waylaid the president when the latter returned from the hospital. Cook told Johnny what had happened. He said, He seems to be completely irresponsible. We'll have to get in touch with his son and have a guardian appointed. And we'll have to do something about you, Johnny. Johnny didn't relish the prospect of the something. He knew he had no legal status other than that of a tamed wild animal. The fact that Methuen technically owned him was his only protection if somebody took a notion to shoot him during bear hunting season. And he was not enthusiastic about Ralph Methuen. Ralph was a very average young schoolteacher without his father's scientific acumen or whimsical humor. Finding Johnny on his hands, his reaction would be to give Johnny to a zoo or something. 
He put his paws on Miss Prescott's desk and asked, Hey, good looking, will you call up Bruce Inglehart at the courier? Johnny, said the President's secretary, you get fresher every day. The bad influence of the undergraduates. Will you call Mr. Inglehart beautiful? Miss Prescott, who was not, did so. Bruce Inglehart arrived at the Phelps mansion to find Johnny taking a shower. Johnny was also making a horrible bawling noise. Wah! he howled. Who? You? Wah! What you doing? yelled Inglehart. Taking a bass, replied Johnny. Whoa! Are you sick? No, just singing in bass. People sing while taking bass. Why shouldn't I? Yah! Well, for Pete's sakes, don't. It sounds like you were having your throat cut. What's the idea of three bath towels spread all over the floor? I show you. Johnny came out of the shower, lay down on the bath towels, and rolled. When he was more or less dry, he scooped up the towels in his forepaws and hove them into a corner. Neatness was not one of Johnny's strong points. He told Inglehart about the Methuen situation. Look here, Bruce, he said. I think I can fix him, but you will have to help me. Okay, count me in. Pop! The orderly looked up from his paper, but none of the buttons showed a light, so presumably none of the patients wanted attention. He went back to his reading. Pop! It sounded a little like a breaking light bulb. The orderly sighed, put away his paper, and began prowling. As he approached the room of the mad professor, number 14, he noticed a smell of Limburger. Pop! There was no doubt that the noise came from number 14. The orderly stuck his head in. At one side of the room sat Ira Methuen. He held a contraption made of a length of glass rod and assorted wires. At the other side of the room, on the floor, lay a number of crumbs of cheese. A cockroach scuttled out of the shadows and made for the crumbs. Methuen sighted along his glass rod and pressed a button. Pop! A flash, and there was no more cockroach. Methuen swung the rod toward the orderly. Stand back, sir. I'm Buck Rogers, and this is my disintegrator. Hey, said the orderly feebly. The old goof might be crazy, but after what happened to the roach, he ducked out and summoned a squad of interns. But the interns had no trouble with Methuen. He tossed the contraption on the bed, saying, If I thought it mattered, I'd raise a hell of a stink about cockroaches in a supposedly sanitary hospital. One of the interns protested. But I'm sure there aren't any here. What do you call that? asked Methuen dryly, pointing at the shattered remains of one of his victims. It must have been attracted in from the outside by the smell of that cheese. Phew! Judson, clean up the floor. What is this, Professor? He picked up the rod and the flashlight battery attached to it. Methuen waved a deprecating hand. Nothing important. Just a little gadget I thought up. By applying the right EMF to pure crown glass, it's possible to raise its index of refraction to a remarkable degree. The result is that light striking the glass is so slowed up that it takes weeks to pass through it in the ordinary manner. The light that is thus trapped can be released by making a small spark near the glass. So I simply lay the rod on the window sill all afternoon to soak up sunlight, a part of which is released by making a spark with that button. Thus I can shoot an hour's accumulated light energy out of the front end of the rod in a very small fraction of a second. Naturally, when this beam hits an opaque object, it raises its temperature. So I've been amusing myself by luring the roaches in here and exploding them. You may have the thing. Its charge is about exhausted. The intern was stern. That's a dangerous weapon. We can't let you play with things like that. Oh, can't you? Not that it matters. But I'm only staying here because I'm taken care of. I can walk out any time I like. No, you can't, Professor. You're under a temporary commitment for observation. That's all right, son. I can still walk out whenever I feel like it. I just don't care much whether I do or not. With which Methuen began tuning the radio by his bed, ignoring the interns. Exactly twelve hours later, at ten a.m., Ira Methuen's room in the hospital was found to be vacant. A search of the hospital failed to locate him. The only clue to his disappearance was the fact that his radio had been disemboweled. Tubes, wires, and condensers lay in untidy heaps on the floor. 
The New Haven police cars received instructions to look for a tall, thin man with gray hair and goatee, probably armed with death rays, disintegrators, and all the other advanced weapons of fact and fiction. For hours they scoured the city with screaming sirens. They finally located the menacing madman sitting placidly on a park bench three blocks from the hospital and reading a newspaper. Far from resisting, he grinned at them and looked at his watch. Three hours and forty-eight minutes. Not bad, boys, not bad, considering how carefully I hid myself. One of the cops pounced on a bulge in Methuen's pocket. The bulge was made by another wire contraption. Methuen shrugged. My hyperbolic solenoid gives you a conical magnetic field and enables you to manipulate ferrous objects at a distance. I picked the lock of the door to the elevators with it. When Bruce Ingelard arrived at the hospital about four, he was told Methuen was asleep. That was amended to the statement that Methuen was getting up and could see a visitor in a few minutes. He found Methuen in a dressing gown. Methuen said, Hello, Bruce. They had me wrapped up in a wet sheet like a mummy. It's swell for naps, relaxes you. I told them they could do it whenever they liked. I think they were annoyed about my getting out. Ingelart was slightly embarrassed. Methuen said, Don't worry, I'm not mad at you. I realize that nothing matters, including resentments. And I've had a most amusing time here. Just watch them fizz the next time I escape. But don't you care about your future, said Ingelart. They'll transfer you to a padded cell at Middletown. Methuen waved a hand. That doesn't bother me. I'll have fun there, too. But how about Johnny Black and Dalrymple's endowment? I don't give a damn what happens to them. Here the orderly stuck his head in the door briefly to check up on this unpredictable patient. The hospital, being short-handed, was unable to keep a continuous watch on him. Methuen continued, Not that I don't like Johnny, but when you get a real sense of proportion like mine, you realize that humanity is nothing but a sort of skin disease on a ball of dirt, and that no effort beyond subsistence, shelter, and casual amusement is worthwhile. The state of Connecticut is willing to provide the first two for me, so I shall devote myself to the third. What's that you have there? Ingelart thought. They're right. He's become a childishly irresponsible scientific genius. Keeping his back to the door, the reporter brought out his family heirloom, a big silver pocket flask dating back to the fabulous Prohibition period. His Aunt Martha had left it to him, and he himself expected to will it to a museum. Apricot brandy, he murmured. Johnny had tipped him off to Methuen's tastes. Now, Bruce, that's something sensible. Why didn't you bring it out sooner instead of making futile appeals to my sense of duty? The flask was empty. Ira Methuen sprawled in his chair. Now and then he passed a hand across his forehead. He said, I can't believe it. I can't believe that I felt that way half an hour ago. Oh, Lord, what have I done? Plenty, said Ingelhardt. Methuen was not acting at all drunk. He was full of sober remorse. I remember everything. Those inventions that popped out of my mind, everything. But I didn't care. How did you know alcohol would counteract the Methuen injection? Johnny figured it out. He looked up its effects and discovered that in massive doses it coagulates the proteins in the nerve cells. He guessed it would lower their conductivity to counteract the increased conductivity through the gaps between them that your treatment causes. So, said Methuen, when I'm sober I'm drunk, and when I'm drunk I'm sober. But what'll we do about the endowment, my new department and the laboratory and everything? I don't know. Dalrymple's leaving tonight. He had to stay over a day on account of some trustee business, and they won't let you out for a while yet, even when they know about the alcohol counter-treatment. Better think of something quick, because the visiting period is pretty near up. Methuen thought. He said, I remember how all those inventions work, though I couldn't possibly invent any more of them unless I went back to the other condition. He shuddered. There's the soft speaker, for instance. What's that? It's like a loudspeaker, only it doesn't speak loudly. It throws a supersonic beam, modulated by the human voice, to give the effect of audible sound frequencies when it hits the human ear. Since you can throw a supersonic beam almost as accurately as you can throw a light beam, you can turn the soft speaker on a person, who will then hear a still, small voice in his ear, apparently coming from nowhere. I tried it on Duggan the other day. It worked. Could you do anything with that? I don't know. Maybe. I hope you can. 
This is terrible. I thought I was perfectly sane and rational. Maybe I was. Maybe nothing is important, but I don't feel that way now, and I don't want to feel that way again. The omnipresent ivy, of which Yale is so proud, affords splendid handholds for climbing. Bruce Inglehart, keeping an eye peeled for campus cops, swarmed up the big tower at the corner of Bingham Hill. Below, in the dark, Johnny waited. Presently, the end of a clothesline came dangling down. Johnny inserted the hook in the end of the rope ladder into the loop in the end of the line. Ingelard hauled the ladder up and secured it, wishing that he and Johnny could change bodies for a while. That climb up the ivy had scared him and winded him badly, but he could climb ivy and Johnny couldn't. The ladder creaked under Johnny's five hundred pounds. A few minutes later it slid slowly, jerkily up the wall like a giant centipede. Then Ingelard, Johnny, ladder, and all were on top of the tower. Ingelard got out the soft speaker and trained the telescopic sight on the window of Dalrymple's room in the Taft, across the intersection of College and Chapel Streets. He found the yellow rectangle of light. He could see into about half the room. His heart skipped a few beats until a stocky figure moved into his field of vision. Dalrymple had not yet left, but he was packing a couple of suitcases. Ingelard slipped the transmitter clip around his neck so that the transmitter nestled against his larynx. The next time Dalrymple appeared, Inkelart focused the crosshairs on the steel man's head. He spoke. Hanscom Dalrymple! He saw the man stop suddenly. He repeated, Hanscom Dalrymple! Huh? said Dalrymple. Who the hell are you? Where the hell are you? Inglehart could not hear him, of course, but he could guess. Inglehart said in solemn tones, I am your conscience. By now Dalrymple's agitation was evident even at that distance. Ingelart continued, Who squeezed out all the common stockholders of Hephaestus Steel in that phony reorganization? Pause. You did, Hanscom Dalrymple. Who bribed a United States senator to swing the vote for a higher steel tariff with fifty thousand dollars and a promise of fifty thousand more which was never paid? Pause. You did, Hanscom Dalrymple. Who promised Wendell Cook the money for a new biophysics building and then let his greed get the better of him and backed out on the thin excuse that the man who was to have headed the new department had had a nervous breakdown? Pause, while Inglehart reflected that nervous breakdown was merely a nice way of saying gone nuts. You did, Hanscom Dalrymple. Do you know what'll happen to you if you don't atone, Dalrymple? You'll be reincarnated as a spider and probably caught by a wasp and used as live fodder for her larvae. How will you like that? Heh <laughs> heh. What can you do to atone? Don't be a sap. Call up Cook. Tell him you've changed your mind and are renewing your offer. Pause. Well, what are you waiting for? Tell him you're not only renewing it, but doubling it. Pause. Tell him... But at this point Dalrymple moved swiftly to the telephone. Ingelart said, Ah, that's better, Dalrymple, and shut off the machine. Johnny asked, How did you know all those things about him? I got his belief in reincarnation out of his obit down at the shop, and one of our rewrite men, who used to work in Washington, says everybody down there knows about the other things, only you can't print a thing like that unless you have evidence to back it up. They lowered the rope ladder and reversed the process by which they had come up. They gathered up their stuff and started for the Phelps mansion. But as they rounded the corner of Bingham, they almost ran into a familiar stork-like figure. Methuen was just setting up another contraption at the corner of Welch. Hello, he said. Man and Bear gaped at him. Ingelard asked, Did you escape again? Uh-huh. When I sobered up and got my point of view back, it was easy. Even though they'd taken my radio away, I invented a hypnotizer using a light bulb and a rheostat made of wire from my mattress and hypnotized the orderly into giving me his uniform and opening the doors for me. My, my, that was amusing. What are you doing now? Ingelart became aware that Johnny's black pelt had melted off into the darkness. This? Oh, I dropped around home and knocked together an improved soft speaker. This one'll work through masonry walls. I'm going to put all the undergraduates to sleep and tell them they're monkeys. When they wake up, 
It will be most amusing to see them running around on all fours and scratching and climbing the chandeliers. They're practically monkeys to begin with, so it shouldn't be difficult. But you can't, Professor. Johnny and I just went to a lot of trouble getting Dalrymple to renew his offer. You don't want to let us down, do you? What you and Johnny do doesn't matter to me in the slightest. Nothing matters. I'm going to have my fun, and don't try to interfere, Bruce. Methuen pointed another glass rod at Inglehart's middle. You're a nice young fellow, and it would be too bad if I had to let you have three hours' accumulation of sun-ray energy all at once. But this afternoon you said— I know what I said this afternoon. I was drunk and back in my old state of mind, full of responsibility and conscientiousness and such bunk. I'll never touch the stuff again if it has that effect on me. Only a man who has received the Methuen treatment can appreciate the futility of all human effort. Methuen shrank back into the shadows as a couple of undergraduates passed. Then he resumed work on his contraption, using one hand and keeping Inglehart covered with the other. Inglehart, not knowing what else to do, asked him questions about the machine. Methuen responded with a string of technical jargon. Inglehart wondered desperately what to do. He was not an outstandingly brave young man, especially in the face of a gun or the equivalent. Methuen's bony hand never wavered. He made the adjustments on his machine mostly by feel. Now, he said, that ought to be about right. This contains a sonic metronome that will send them a note of frequency of 349 cycles a second, with 68.4 pulses of sound a minute. This, for various technical reasons, has the maximum hypnotic effect. From here I can rake the colleges along College Street. He made a final adjustment. This will be the most amusing joke yet. And the cream of it is that, since Connecticut is determined to consider me insane, they can't do anything to me for it. Here goes, Bruce. Phew! Has somebody started a still here, or what? I've been smelling and tasting alcohol for the last five minutes. Ouch! The glass rod gave one dazzling flash, and then Johnny's hairy black body catapulted out of the darkness. Down went Ira Methuen, all the wind knocked out of him. Quick, Bruce, barked Johnny. Pick up that neater spray I dropped. Unscrew the container on the bottom. Don't spur it. Then come here and pour it down his throat. This was done, with Johnny holding Methuen's jaws apart with his claws, like Samson slaying the lion only conversely. They waited a few minutes for the alcohol to take effect, listening for sounds that they had been discovered, but the colleges were silent save for the occasional tick of a typewriter. Johnny explained, I ran home and got the neater spray from his room. Then I got Webb, the research assistant in biophysics, to rent me in a laboratory for the alcohol. Then I try to sneak up and squirt a spray in his mouth while he talks. I get some in, but I don't get the sprayer adjusted right, and the spray hit him before it breaks up and stings him. I don't have fingers, you know. So we have to use what the books call brute force. Methuen began to show signs of normalcy. As without his glass rod he was just a harmless old professor, Johnny let him up. His words tumbled out. I'm so glad you did, Johnny. You saved my reputation, maybe my life. Those fatheads at the hospital wouldn't believe I had to be kept full of alcohol, so of course I sobered up and went crazy again. Come on, let's get back there quickly. If they haven't discovered my absence, they might be willing to keep this last escape quiet. When they let me out... I'll work on a permanent cure for the Methuen treatment. I'll find it, if I don't die of stomach ulcers from all the alcohol I'll have to drink. Johnny waddled up Temple Street to his home, feeling rather smug. Maybe Methuen, sober, was right about the futility of it all. But if such a philosophy led to the upsetting of Johnny's pleasant existence, Johnny preferred Methuen drunk. He was glad Methuen would soon be well and coming home. Methuen was the only man he had any sentimental regard for. But as long as Methuen was shut up, Johnny was going to take advantage of that fact. When he reached the Phelps mansion, instead of going directly in, he thrust a foreleg around behind the hedge next to the wall. It came out with a huge slab of chewing tobacco. Johnny bit off about half the slab, thrust the rest back in its cache, and went in, drooling happily. Why not? Gone with the Gods by Andrew Offutt I was gagging my way through the day's third Gothic novel, 
trying to get myself into perpetuating one of the damned things so some artist could perpetuate another cover with an uptight-looking young woman in the foreground and a castle or old house in the background with a light in one window. It was one of those times when any sort of interruption was welcome, even a ringing phone. The phone rang. I bounced the castle of Malfoy off the far wall and reached for a cigarette with my right hand. My left went after the phone. I am totally incapable of handling a telephone without a cigarette. I try to control the nasty things, but on those days when I have to answer and place several calls, the tobacco industry gets a break, and I wake up next day with a throat like a piece of old harness leather. Hello, this is Harvey Moss, I said, wiping a book of matches off the desk. Harvey, sweetheart, how's a boy? Doing my damnedest to get into an Otranto mood, Mark, I said, with plenty of put-upon weariness in my voice. Mark Ventner's voice, naturally, was one I recognized instantly. I hunched my left shoulder to hold the phone against my ear while I tore off a match and lit up. Otranto? Otranto? I sighed smokily. The granddaddy of all Gothic novels, Mark. Very old novelette by a gent named Walpole. May his soul sizzle sickly. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that Otranto. Mark Ventner said in that raspy high voice of his, Sounds like Ed McMahon doing W.C. Fields sober, with a cold, and about to cry. Well, forget that gothic jazz, Harvey, sweetheart. I've got something I need you to do. Last week you needed me to do a gothic, I reminded him. By the first. That was last week. I just had a really weird phone call, Harvey. A really odd call. Me too, I muttered. This one. More loudly, I said, not without trepidation. Tell me about it, Mark. Yeah, listen, Harv, I just had a call from an old fraternity brother of mine, Dr. Hey, I never knew you were in a fraternity, I said, reaching for the ashtray and not quite making it. If it's true that ashes are good for rugs, I should keep one on my desk instead of a blotter. The ash is always longer than it should be. The tray is always a few centimeters too far away. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I was, he said, half blown away by the interruption. Sure I was. It was a long time ago. The cue ball headed boss of Morpheus Books added unnecessarily. So, an old fraternity brother, Dr. Ben Carrick, called me today. Marvy, I said, and you want me to ghost a book about his earth shaking new diet plan, right? There was a brief, accusing silence, heavy with hurt. Then, Harvey, this call is costing me money. It's my nickel, remember? Things are not so good I should listen to you shoot off your mouth every time I open mine, and before I close it, I— Right, Mark. Sorry. I heard his sigh. Oh, Lord, I'd done it again. I resisted apologizing for having interrupted to apologize. The silence just sort of sat there for a while, surly. Ben Corrick isn't a medical doctor, Mark said in the manner of the teacher in a retarded, I mean exceptional, class. He has one of those Ph.D.s, you know, in physics. Like, uh, you know, physics. He's stayed on at the old school all these years while I've been working my ass off up here in New York, and he's been working on an invention. I curved the automatic impulse to comment. An invention. Oh, boy. You still reading all those hardcore science articles the way kids read funny books, Harvey? Sure. What's the invention? Well, see, he's had this grant... He and his department. But he's been at work on a private project for years, too, see? He calls it a, a temporal traverser. A temporal traverser, I echoed, dry as the landscape around Sinai. Right, Mark said, with escalating excitement in his voice. Do you think it's possible, Harvey? The word impossible, I said, won't be in Webster's fourth. But how do I know what it's supposed to... A temporal traverser? Right. Mark? Time travel? Right, right. I could practically see him in his belly jiggling up and down in his excitement. You're sure he's not putting you on, Mark? I don't think so, but that's what I want to find out, Harv boy. Can you get over to Chinchilla, Pennsylvania and find out for me? Can I? You sending me a plane ticket, Mark? Chinchilla? I'll cover it, Harvey. Just try to hold it down, okay? Times are hard. I ignored that. Mark Ventner is a hyper, not to mention a shucker. He is also publisher, president, editor, and bigot in charge of Morpheus Books, which he founded. 
He's tried dozens of times, literally, to get a really big book out there, opportunistically, exploitatively jumping aboard every topical express to come down the track. It's never happened. I know. I've written most of the books for him. And so Mark sings the blues constantly, although the old phony does have money. Part of the reason is he hangs on to it the way fans hoard old magazines and books. I know. I've done 57 books for Mark Ventner in the past six years, with advances ranging from the embarrassing to admit $750 to a decent 3500 using 11 pen names. Subject matter has been very broad indeed. Attempt after attempt at get-rich exploitation, each about as effective as government economic plans. Not one of those books has ever sold enough to earn me any royalties beyond the advance. Or so Mark Ventner says, anyhow, and he's the one with the ledgers. And his mainstay, a seemingly endless stream of gothics, they sell. And now I knew we were off again. But Mark was talking. You know how academic types are, Harve. Ben had a, a little accident. They, uh, he isn't with the university anymore. And he... A little accident? Ben will tell you all about it, Harve. Dr. Corrick, just get over there. I've got money at stake. So then, while I lit another cigarette, Mark Ventner dropped the rest of it on me. There'd been a fair crowd on hand the day Dr. Ben Corrick was at last ready to demonstrate his device. He explained, re-explained, blinked, and finally closed the switch. Nothing happened. He then went across the big lab sort of room in which he'd constructed his thing, and he plugged it in. Fortuitous, his being on the other side of that big room, the temporal traverser did absolutely nothing for a moment or so. Then it removed, in a manner most noisy, the better part of the south and east walls of ivied old Smoir Hall, not to mention a large assortment of glass items in the surrounding area. The T.T. was not amid the rubble. Shamed, castigated, attacked, called charlatan, and worse, Ben Corrick, Ph.D., was forcibly sabbaticalized. Now, months later, he had called his old fraternity brother. The working model of his Mark II T.T. was nearly finished, but his bank account and savings were totally finished. All he needed to finish the device was another $10,000, and everybody knows publishers have lots of money. Ventner didn't have to tell me that he then relieved himself of a sermon on money. Inflation, hungry writers, and grasping incompetent distributors, inflation, prices, union printers, inflation, and so on. I'd heard it several times from Mark. It's improved signally since the advent of the recent unlamented administration. But somehow Ventner succumbed. Somehow Corrick persuaded and convinced him to check out the temporal traverser, at least. And so Mark Ventner, actually giving consideration to parting, after due tearfulness and lectures with ten thousand clams, told Corrick to hold tight. And Mark called in Harvey Moss. Me. I'm a writer. It's all I do. I make a living at it and from it. There are several ways that can be done. You can write a book about a garbage-eating bird with a sixth-grade philosophy, for instance, and be rich forever because that's one grade above Reader's Digest readers who are easily impressed. Or do a sort of fact novel about a couple convicted murderers and be rich and drop names forever. Or you can write science fiction and stay hungry. You can perpetuate gothics, for whoever it is that reads them, and know that every word you write will sell instantly and easily. Or you can do what I do. I make a nice, comfortable living the same way the A&P does, on volume. I write a lot, and I've never been late for a contract deadline. Fifty-seven books for Ventner in the last six years, as I said, and all on time. Dependable, that's me. Always dependable. A pussycat. And always hungry. Okay, I admit it. I have the usual booze and broads habit. Sure, writers get groupies. Writing's almost showbiz, you know. And we have to get down at the end of the day after hyping up on ideas and coffee all day, so broads and booze, right? It cuts into the old finances. I've also written some decent science fiction, and I read pure science articles, just as Mark said, constantly. Presumably, then, I know a few things. Certainly to a guy like Mark Ventner, who knows very few. So he called to sick me onto Korak to study his notes and his schematics, and to look at the thing in the garage behind his chinchilla Pennsylvania cottage, and to make a judgment, and to report back to Daddy Warbucks Ventner in Manhattan. He would then decide whether to risk ten of his thousands on Corrick's alleged temporal traverser. Flattering? I guess so. 
Mark trusted me and my knowledge. Also a drag. After all, a time machine. Didn't John Campbell prove the total impossibility of time travel? But maybe, I thought, there was a science fiction idea in it, and that would be having to do the damned gothic, since I'd written only one book in the past five weeks. I was in great need of something to do a book about, and gothics are icky, and writing pornography always makes me so damned horny. So I journeyed to the town of Chinchilla, Pennsylvania, to meet a kook named Corrick, Benjamin A., Ph.D., and listen to his nonsense and tell Mark Bentner what he should have known to do in the first place, save his ten thousand, or give it to me as an advance to go and interview Clifford Oiving. But that wasn't the way it turned out. First I met Dr. Ben Corrick, who was a call-me-Ben sort of guy you couldn't dislike if you tried, about Bentner's age, with hair, less weight, more wrinkles. Somehow he managed to look baggy and wrinkly and rumpled even in double knits, the trousers' pockets stuffed so full of this and that they resembled army fatigues. Quite a bit of reddish hair, curly, above a high forehead that was obviously a lot higher than when he and Mark Ventner had been fraternal brethren together. His blue eyes were of the sort usually called watery, set in a pleasant enough face, almost a boy's face. He was the sort of man you liked the moment you saw him. I had to remind myself to maintain a scientific attitude, to treat him not as a friend but as a charlatan. But he wasn't. I studied, I pored, I re-studied and asked questions, examined and re-examined the stuff in the garage. The temporal traverser, he called it. And so did I, finally. I said so to Mark Ventner. He acted incredulous, but his delight and excitement glowed through the careful, questioning attitude like the sun through closed Venetian blinds. With Corrick practically having signed away his birthright, not to mention his burial plot, thus including his death right as well, Mark Ventner financed the project he dubbed Project Fugit, and time fled while Ben Corrick worked away at finishing his brain baby and while Mark Ventner worked away at plotting, designing his grand scheme to be rich and famous at last. Me? To stay in money I wrote The Castle of Brandywine, gagging all the while. I had to cut the scene in which the hunchback raped the kitchen maid, too. The Traverser, Ben Corrick told me in that strangely near-breathless way of his, is ready for field testing. I blinked. Ready? Really ready? He nodded, maintaining his solemnity despite the twinkle in his eyes and the smile that was trying to tug at each corner of his mouth. It's really ready, Harve. And this time, I said, grinning, practically rubbing my hands together, you're going to do it from inside, hmm? Definitely. The other time there was an explosion, of course, and then the remote failed to work. I am convinced that the machine did work, and properly. That's why there was no sign of it amid the debris. Hmm. But suppose something goes wrong, then. You're a certified genius. You've got no business inside that thing before it's tested. It's been tested, Ben assured me. It's lost somewhere, the Mark I. I mean, some when. And it doesn't have to be plugged in any more? I mean, if you want to go back and have a talk with Ben Franklin... You're going to play hell finding a wall plug. Of course. And now we hire a truck and take the temporal traverser, Mark II, out for its field test. Out? I gave him a browse-up look. Out? What do you mean, out where? Ben Corrick smiled his boyish smile and made an uncharacteristically extravagant gesture. Out into the open. Into a field. Where else? His watery eyes studied me, waiting anxiously for my reaction. I saw that, and then I saw his joke. Field testing, in a field, of course. So we got the truck, a big flatbed, and we got a couple of guys to help us load the TT, although they were sure we were cracked wide open. We didn't tell them what it was. As a matter of fact, we told them it was a cloosh. Ever heard that old joke? Then we drove the temporal traverser out into the country, off the highway onto a back road, and off the back road into a field scaring the beak off a matronly bobwhite. The field was full of timothy that rose about halfway up my calves. I was still frowning, having doubts, prickly in the armpits, when Ben entered the temporal traverser and buttoned up. The T.T. Well, Ben had a real brainstorm this time, so as not to be too obtrusive when he materialized in the distant past or future. Very clever of him, really. And besides, he needed a power source at hand. So he had built the temporal traverser, into a yellow VW squareback station wagon, 
Lots of space in those things. It could even be driven. But he wasn't driving it now. I waited, standing well back, holding my breath, having palpitations, staring at that yellow car atop the big red flatbed truck he'd insisted on, just in case the VW couldn't be driven back. Happy thought. He was certain, he said, that the TT would move from surface to surface, not materialize elsewhere some five feet off the ground and drop with one hell of an impact. I hoped he was right. What if he came down on a cow, I thought, and started to yell, and... The explosion knocked me off my feet. It was the shock more than the shock waves, I feel sure, but it was a shock, and physical force or not, it was just as effective as had it been shock wave. I went down, and now my heart wasn't palpitating, it was pounding. Once I got myself sort of untangled and looked, there was the truck. It appeared to be okay, but there wasn't any VW on it. Well, I'll be damned, I muttered. He must have done it. He must be traveling in time. Darn! I didn't even think to ask where he was going. I mean, when? I glanced at my watch. During that glance, the VW reappeared. I stood frozen until he stepped out, beaming. I blurted, Are you all right? Sorry, it was the first thing I thought of. I realized I could have said something brilliant, such as, Mr. Watson, come here, I need you. I just hadn't thought about it in advance, as Neil Armstrong so obviously had, or as Ben Corrick had done. One small step for mankind, Ben Corrick said. One giant step for science. Then, of course I'm all right. I only went to tomorrow. Look at this. Oh, brother, I said, commenting on his first words, not on what he showed me, although it was worth no fancier comment. I frowned at it. A button? Corrick nodded vigorously. A button. Look familiar? No, but he soon showed me that it appeared to match those on my jacket. That didn't seem to prove anything, and I said so. Ben blinked. It proves that I went into the future, he said, dipping a hand into one stuffed pocket of his ever-baggy pants, and brought you back this button from your coat. It was lying right there on the ground. I checked. Ben... I think we ought to be dancing, screaming, getting drunk, whatever. Instead, we're standing here talking about a damn button. And there aren't any buttons missing from my jacket. Of course there is, Harvey, Ben said, opening the knife he'd brought out of his pocket. And he cut the lowest button off the front of my coat. Hey! Smiling, Ben dropped the button into the grass. I'm putting it there, he said, so it'll be there tomorrow. And then I walk over from the temporal traverser, bend over like this, and pick it up. He straightened up to show me the two buttons in his palm. They appeared to be identical. Be damned, I said. But, Ben, this... this isn't proof. I mean, you could have, you know... Hell, you're a scientist. This isn't any sort of scientific proof. Do you mean to stand there and... He broke off. You're right, he said slowly. So he thought a moment and then told me to take out my wallet and drop it on the ground, and I did, and off he went again, while I stood there and did as I was told. I stared at my wallet, lying there in the tall grass in the middle of someone's field of Timothy. The wallet didn't move. Then Ben was back, and walking over to me, and handing me my wallet. It was mine, all right, and it was still lying down there at my feet, too. Condition's not as good, Ben said as I examined it, since it spent the rest of the afternoon and tonight here on the ground, and then got covered with dew tomorrow morning, which the sun baked off, and kept on baking until I picked it up. I went through my wallet, the new one. I mean the second one. Wallet. I now had two of everything. Very convenient, but the currency with the identical serial numbers, I thought, could be pretty dangerous. Also a tempting way to make money. Put a wad of it down, go to tomorrow and bring it back. Again, and again, and again. If there's a paradox there, I'm not going to worry about it. I can see that it could be the money that folded itself somewhere up the line. I dropped the wallet beside its look-alike and hugged Ben Corrick. We danced around a little, and then I asked if he'd mind just going around again and picking up my wallet earlier before it got ruined. Ben stared at me, then started laughing, and I realized how chicken-shit ridiculous I was being under the circumstances— the circumstances being that he had just successfully traveled in time, and we hugged and whooped and did our jig again. 
We had ourselves a genuine, bona fide, certified, card-carrying time machine. Ben went around again as requested, handed me my wallet again. The second one vanished with a minor bang. I was still left with two, but he pointed out that I had to leave the original lying there, so it would be there for him to pick up tomorrow, because he just had. Twice. What if I don't, I asked, feeling sly. Please, Harvey. Right, I said, in manner businesslike. Now, what about next week or next year, Ben? Ben tried, but this time he came back crestfallen. The VW wouldn't go past tomorrow. So then he went back to yesterday. That worked out, and he came back just fine. But he couldn't make the day after tomorrow, or next week or next year. Nothing past tomorrow. Don't bother asking why. You can play with that sort of thing, theorizing all day and into the middle of next month. Yesterday is there to visit, because it was there, remember? So we can go back to it. Tomorrow? I don't know. Maybe it follows naturally out of today. But the day after tomorrow just isn't there yet. It hasn't happened. Maybe it can be changed, which is why we can't go there, then. Because it is subject to change, and thus doesn't exist yet. Buy it. You like the concept of freedom of choice, don't you? Would it be there if we could visit the future? Well, I said, a little dry in the mouth, there went a lot of Marvy get-rich-quick ideas. Okay, Ben, it's time to find out, right? Ben and I stood there in the middle of that field of slightly waving Timothy, looking at each other. He blinked those pale, watery eyes, stared another couple of seconds into mine, and turned away. He waded through the Timothy and mounted the truck, and got into the VW. Then he and that strange VW wagon went away. Bang! I squatted down and gazed at my wallet while I waited. That was the explanation for the unfortunate, precipitate, and lamented demise of the south and east walls of poor old ivied Smoir Hall, I mused. The bang! Thunder! Suddenly there's a VW-sized hole in the air, and the air rushes in to fill it. Bang! He had thought of that. And that's why we were here, way the hell out in the middle of this field, shaking up birds with bang after bang. Then Dr. Cork returned, obviously able to return to the same moment at which he'd left if he really wanted to, fine-tuning. He bore five comic books, five no less, all new stand fresh, all identical, the June 1938 edition of Action Comics. Chortling, he explained, I thought I might as well bring some worthwhile proof, he told me triumphantly, this is the origin of Superman issue. Each is worth a thousand dollars or more, in mint condition. And believe me, Harvey, these are in mint condition. The sound I made is what is known as a Comanche yell. A few more little experiments taught us a few more little things. For one, there's a weight loss, a nigh-weightless factor in trans-time movement. Let's don't go into too many details. But Ben and I learned that the VW could transport enormous weights so long as it was time-jumping. Time travel, Ben had postulated and now proven, is inextricably bound up with C bar and E equals MC squared. That led me to point out that since we got it all together out in the middle of a field, we had proven the Coric Unified Field Theorem. He did have a hard time selling those comic books, by the way. They were so perfect, so new, that dealers were decidedly wary. But he sold four of them at last, keeping one because he just couldn't bear to part with it, to some hotshot dealers out Dallas way. Some people kept insisting that those guys had been taken, and there was a lot of chatter in the dealers' magazines for a while about the Dallas con. We let a hyper-excited Mark Ventner know what we'd done, and he came down to Chinchilla to see, and then to try out the temporal traverser, which Ben and I by now referred to simply as the V-dub. Mark came back from his fourth jaunt into the very distant past, very shaken indeed. He had visited a consummately ancient gent named Abram, the same who later changed his name to Abraham. Much impressed, he indicated to his visitor that he was invited to dinner. Mutton? Ben asked. Mark nodded, frowning, unable to speak. Wow, I muttered. Ben was obviously deep in thought about something else. At last he said, But how is it that we can travel in time? without covering enormous astronomical distances as well. Mark stared at him, frowning. Uh, we've proven that we're all tied up with E equals MC squared, I said. 
So, we do cover enormous astronomical distances at faster than light speed. Mark stared at me, frowning. Then made a helpless, somewhat anguished gesture with his hands. Perhaps, but if we've discovered FTL, it isn't taking us anywhere. We stay, or return to, Earth. Look, Harve, our sun is moving along and dragging the Earth with it at something like two hundred kilometers a second. I nodded. Okay, a little over four astronomical units a year. Mark stared at us, frowning. That's right, Ben said. 4.2 AUs, to be a bit more precise. So, using a rough value of a hundred million kilometers for the AU, in, uh, say, ten thousand years, we've traveled nearly a light year. I thought about that. Meaning, if we go back ten thousand years, why the hell weren't we some 4.2 times, uh, times... Times ten to the twelfth, Ben supplied. Mark stared at him, frowning. Okay, I said, nodding. But we weren't. So? So we don't know all there is to know about what we're doing, Ben said quietly, and not without sadness. So we're engineers, not scientists. We're doing it, but we don't know how and why. Maybe, uh, gravity, I said, knowing how lame that was. But at least it was a comfortable scientific word. There's security in labels. So long as we can tack a scientific-sounding tag on it, we feel a lot better. A while back it was witchcraft, now it's science. Come to think, both witchcraft and science problems tend to yield to the same sort of solution, a lot of Latin words. Mark frowned at Ben, staring. What are you two chattering about? Mark, I began slowly, you just went back into time, a long, long way. Since the sun and therefore the earth are moving all the time, we figure you shouldn't have, uh, landed on earth at all. You should have wound up somewhere like 4.2 times 10 to the 12th kilometers away from the sun's position. My God, Mark said, staring and frowning. Ben nodded. Uh-huh. Is that what Abraham said? Maybe that was what gave Ventner his idea. Certainly he could have become rich merely by journeying relatively short distances into the past and bringing forward more comic books, postage stamps, or silver dollars, or betting on derbies, fights, and ball games. But that wasn't how he chose to make his mark. And what Mark Ventner chose to do was it. As noted, Ben Corrick did tend to overlook little things, such as the fact that the temporal traverser was no longer his, but the property of Trans Tempus Incorporated, 73% of the stock of which was owned by Marcus D. Ventner and Mrs. Ventner. Mark Ventner overlooks damned little. First we added the heavy-duty cables and huge sled-like runners to the V-dub, making it resemble a bright yellow forklift with panache. That way, time-jumping, it would be able to transport about anything. Then we liberated the new device that Westinghouse developed for NASA to use in space, an electron beam generator or gun. It was unfortunately too expensive to buy, but judicious use of the temporal traverser solved that problem. It is a great mystery how the E-beam generator Mark II just vanished one fine night and was back in place by the time the watchman came a-running with the two superiors he'd run for. How does something vanish for ten or so seconds, then reappear? And particularly when I tell you that I used it in this time period and that, this place and that, for several months? Right. We also equipped the V-Dug with a thermal drill, a truly marvelous invention. Although he wasn't ashamed to admit he wasn't sure how or why it worked, Korak meanwhile came up with a means of calibrating the V-Dub to the Earth's movements. Look, the machine was obviously somehow glued to the planet, and thus couldn't get left during Sol Earth's race through space. Using that as a premise, Korak modified things so that the traveler could get from one place in the world to another by time jumping. I practiced, and practiced some more, until I could bring the V-dub down on a dime in any given minute of time and could practically remove a splinter from my finger with the thermal drill. Practically. I learned how to make little jumps back and then forward to land in different areas. It was Ventner's ball game. He had signed a contract with me, written me out a fat check. His money covered the drill and a few other little knick-knacks I'd been taking with me on my mission into the past. Yes, I was going, along with the detailed instructions Mark had written out. And then the day came, and I slid into that extraordinary VW Squareback 
and I was off, into the past, the distant past. I was equipped with a suit resembling an astronaut's, because certainly I didn't want to spread any modern diseases among my remote ancestors, or bring any of theirs forward to our time. It was no lark. Using the electron beam generator and the thermal drill to dig all those smooth-walled tunnels and caverns was work, and a drag betimes. Two, I had to keep coming back for more fuel, power source. My favorite place in time for buying more gasoline was Louisville in 1961. A very little attention was paid to my car. There weren't that many VWs around then for anyone to have seen enough to realize mine was a later model. And there was more gasoline. Besides, Mary was in Louisville in 1961, and I deserved those periods of R&R. &R. Then back I went to create more tunnels with floors resembling Trinitite. I incised some most interesting pictures and pictograms on the wall, too, while I was at it. Then I went in search of pre-man. This time I was tightly suited up, and hopefully sterilized. I didn't want to be a carrier or something that would wipe out man before he got off the ground, or rather, out of the trees and caves. My sudden appearance in strange garb really shook up the first band of hominids I came upon. I endeared myself to that hairy host, though, after the manner of Dorothy of Kansas and Oz, by materializing precisely atop their big shaggy leader, who I soon learned had been the meanest son of a bitch in the valley. Bowing and genuflecting hadn't been invented yet, but they let me know they were most deferential and subservient indeed. A bit obscene, that demonstration. Think of a dog, showing his deference and trust. I was just able to refrain from laughing. My appearance and simultaneous ending of the tyrannical reign of Grunt made me both God and Savior, which, I mused, would be a fine combination for religion inventors to bear in mind in a few thousand years. I made that stooped, stupid, hairy, and homely lot understand, eventually, and after much agonizing work, that made me reaffirm my high respect for elementary school teachers. But I finally got the message across to those almost men. I wanted them to continue my drawings and carvings, and to make a few more little items in my honor. I showed them models. Their making themselves understood to me took considerably less time. My translation of their reply goes like this. Check. Okay. Right. Whatever you say, God, sir. I rewarded them. Taking time out from his busy schedule, God, sir, zapped them a nice big critter that looked like a super hirsute elephant with a glandular imbalance. A very big meal, and they were most grateful. I received the homage routine again. Although I didn't need petrol, I jumped straight up to 1961. I needed Mary. Back I went this time dropping in on a happy enough tribe of considerably more advanced near people. Their holy mackerel he's back reaction let me know that stories about my previous visit had been handed down. They were just about to sacrifice a flagrantly bosomy virgin in my honor before I stopped them. Though I considered making better use of her, I refrained. I said near people. Getting my new and revised message across to this more developed gaggle of humanoid geese was just as hard as last time, but I prevailed. I had to do a lot of gesturing and a lot of scratching out symbols in the dirt before, with an obvious mixture of fear and awe, they began to get the message. I worked harder, and they showed they had it all, but weren't happy about it. Here's what I told those poor progenitors of us all, liar that I am. Look, I am a good guy from the heavens, right? I came down here to this strange world among you in my skywalking thing, old Yaller over there, I was fleeing some bad guys, I mean real hard cases and lots of them who are after me. Now, I am afraid that I may have gotten all you nice, handsome, ugh, folks in a bit of a spot, because those bad dudes may track me here even as one tracks the food beasts. So, you folks had better stand by to dig in for swift shelter in case you need it, from aerial attack. Now, that shook them a bit, but it also sounded like work. They weren't too darned happy about the bad sky people, but they weren't too enchanted with the prospect of all that digging, either. So I told them a few tales about the followers. Communication was a problem, and it took a while. Signs and drawings and even postures and facial expressions served well, particularly inasmuch as I was obviously a god, anyhow. Besides, I'm a writer, and everybody knows writers are brilliant and resourceful, right? I punctuated the hair-raising tales, they raised the hairs all over the bodies of my audience, with bloodless little displays of god power. The matches made them go goggle-eyed and back away. The cherry bombs I tossed, no, not at anyone, were even more effective. 
With the semi-automatic rifle, United States Army surplus, how can they sell these things so cheap? I cut down a tree a hundred or so feet away. The thermal drill felled another, almost as spectacularly and far more aromatically. The small quantity of nitric acid I dribbled onto an animal hide blanket brought more wide eyes and oohs and ahs. Then, using the V-dub and some fine and careful settings, I moved some exceedingly weighty chunks of rock. The mighty bang that accompanied each mini-jump didn't hurt my cause any. My demonstrations, along with my tales of possible followers of the inimical persuasion, served, in a few words, to shake the Shinola out of them. Besides, I showed them how to set this kid's broken leg. Right willingly, they went to work. Despite their sorrowful importunings, I departed, and returned a couple of years later. It took me less than five minutes. Uh-oh, God's back, their attitude said, but I was taken on a little tour of inspection. Fascinating. Caves and tunnels, miracles of hard work and applied genius. Interesting, though crude, drawings adorn the walls, drawings of me in my atmosphere suit. All about them, as decor, had been traced pictogram representations of what I had scratched out in the dust in my efforts at communication. Circles for suns and planets, squiggles, bee lines with arrowheads, this and that. I smiled with pride at the genius and hard work of my people. Some of those pictures were very artistic indeed. Phidias and Michelangelo were on the way. But their mandated labors were otherwise pretty much petering out. After all, two years, no sky people, no returning good guy. So I conferred with the high priest of the Harvey Moss cult. Get their tails back to work on those tunnels and things, I laboriously conveyed to that pot-bellied, high-rolling do-naught, or I'll fry yours the same way I did that shrub. With a glance over at the burning bush, he got the message. In short order, our people were back at work, digging and carving. I time-jumped, returned to them one month after I'd left, a day and a half later, my time, and gave them their reward, enough fresh game and exotic fruits to feast twice their number. I let the headman fire the rifle, too, and preserved his fragile dignity by blocking him as, taken by surprise by the recoil, he started going over backward. I'm sure he wore that bruise on his weighty shoulder like a badge, and lamented its passing. In a cavern deep beneath what is now Normandy, there is a pictorial representation of a primitive man with a stick in his hand, belching fire, and with a great dark mark carefully traced out on his shoulder. It was work, but I had accepted the task, and it was a fascinating job and even sort of fun. Feeling like poor overworked Heracles, he was blonde, by the way, with ridiculously big feet, I repeated this labor organizing among other tribes, widely separated from the first. I even took one headman's daughter for a time jump, which she didn't appreciate over much, but she was returned to her people happy. My next jump was a long one, forward, and I had to bounce three times to get into the right time and place. That was some big river in those days. These people were advanced, and those bronze swords and the faces behind them looked nasty. But I got myself conveyed to their king, without having to kill or maim, and we talked. His wife also made eyes at me. Unfortunately, she looked just like him, his sister, I assumed. A lot of short-period bouncing around in time followed. He provided the slaves. The electron gun and the thermal drill easily carved out huge, I mean H-U-G-E, blocks of stone. The V-dub transported them to the appointed place in no time, if you'll pardon the expression. All the slaves had to do was shove those megatherian building blocks onto the V-dub's runners. It and I took over from there. Piling them up in the proper form and shape was up to them and their ugly king, who was crazy about the whole idea. I provided a few instructions and suggestions, even diagrams, on clay tablets and papyrus, both of which I knew would never survive the centuries. Thus I started those Egyptians and their megalomaniac king off on a nice project, the Great Pyramid. I think they did very nicely with it. So did the Incas and Aztecs. I started on the same project a few days and several thousand years later. In Peru, Mexico, and Ecuador, I picked up some perfectly lovely groupies of both sexes, though I assured them I suffered from a hopeless heterosexual hang-up. I'd had a vasectomy long ago. It seemed the thing to do. Now I was glad. Harvey Moss simply could not afford to have any Inca or Aztec offspring. I did several other things in several other times and places, but I think I've given the general flavor and manner of it. And then, with a lot of hair and a quite respectable beard, I returned to home time, 
with more projects to my credit than Frank Lloyd Wright or even FDR ever envisioned. I spent the next two months collecting and collating material on my activities from articles in newspapers, scientific and popular journals, and worse. The range was from the Washington Post and the Louisville Courier Journal to the Moorhead News and the L.A. Free Press, from the Smithsonian through Escapade, and specialized journals such as Fate Magazine. I said material on my activities. Right. Except that none of the writers knew that the strange finds were my works. I was at first surprised to discover a lot of things I hadn't put there, but I smiled, realizing that I, carrying out the weird genius plan of Marcus D. Ventner, had fostered much of what we now call spin-offs. That required two months, as I said. Then I wrote the book with photographs. Oh, they're excellent. Most of them I took on location while time-tripping. They are, for the most part, extraordinarily clear. The actual writing of the book was the tedious part. Writing that damned manuscript took three long weeks, man, and four more to edit and type it up pretty. Good writing, as Snoopy once observed, is hard work. I didn't have to worry about finding a publisher. Ventner was waiting for the manuscript with glowing eyes and dangling tongue. He rushed it into print, the bastard, using not the name I'd used as author, my own for a change, but the French pen name you now know so well, André de Vries. I dragged out our contract and learned that I'd been a lot more excited about the advance and the prospect of my extended tripping into the past than ever shrewd Ventner. No wonder the advance had been so fat. It wasn't an advance against royalties at all. It was the sale price. Just as he owned the temporal traverser, Ventner owned my book, totally. You know what came of it. The book made a mint. Ventner and the invisible writer were hailed, kudoed, attacked, and castigated. It was a work of genius. It was charlatanry. It was the discovery of the age. It was the work of the anti-god. It was also bought by nearly everyone in the United States and overseas. It was also Ventner making the money and the appearances on Today and Carson and Cabot, not me. Then there was the big television special, one hour long and a full page and TV guide. MGM bought movie rights and immediately contacted and contracted Charlton Heston to play the part of the man from outer space the book postulated had visited Earth so long ago. Mark, you slimy bastard, you're rich! I roared at the fat, hawk-nosed, bald man across his own desk, brand new brushed walnut. You're rich! You're famous! Dear God, why not share some of it with me? It was all my work! Ventner sighed exaggeratedly. But my idea, Harf baby... And as I pointed out to an equally screechy Ben Corrick just yesterday, my money financed the project. Come, look at it this way. I hired him to make it possible. I hired you to plant the evidence and write the book. And you were both paid. Hired? You... You damn Jay Gould. I'll... He lurched forward in his swivel chair, so knew it was squeakless. Don't, Harvey. Whatever it is, don't. Try suing or making wild claims, and I'll smash you. We have a contract. You've received the highest advance on a book you ever saw in your life. I tried not to splutter. My face felt as if I had a fever of 105. Advance? You mean price? Then that book's made millions. He shook his head. Ah, oh, Harvey, Harvey, price, then. But why quibble over terminology? When did you ever do a book that earned royalties? Come on! This is more than you ever made on a book in your life! Okay. There was nothing to be done aside from murder. I tried to get hold of Ben for some mutual commiseration. He linked me with Mark and wouldn't even talk with me. He did own 27% of Trans Stamps Incorporated, but unfortunately, T.I. didn't publish the book. Morpheus Books Incorporated did. Transtemps had turned no profit. I sat down and started wanging out a science fiction novel, since I didn't dare do an expose. It was about this guy who went back in time and planted all the evidence in the DeVries book, and it became obvious very quickly that no one wanted to publish it. So I thought and thought, and my money dwindled. Then I hit upon a unique plan of vengeance, and practically cackled in my laughter. It took a while, and it took some more of my dwindling assets. But I regained the V-dub, and I went back again, on a mission of vengeance. Mark Ventner would be the biggest laughingstock on the planet. 
This time I labored long and hard over an enormous statue, a crude stone monstrosity that was a caricature of big-nosed, bald Mark Ventner of the basilisk eyes. More hard work. I placed it on a platform on the coast of an unpopulated island, facing inland. Then I hauled Polynesian settlers to that island, trio after trio, trip after trip. You can only get so many people into a VW. And I showed them how to catch fish more rapidly, so they wouldn't have to sweat food gathering. Thus, they'd have plenty of time, and I started them to work, creating duplications of my statue. More Mark Ventner caricatures. It required only a few hours, subjective time, to pop back on five occasions, thus throwing the fear of, uh, moss into them and ensuring that they would continue the project. The next trick was to keep the V-dub. I had liberated it from where Mark had it stashed in Manhattan. Now I set the controls carefully for two months after the date of my departure, so I'd materialize elsewhere. Near, as a matter of fact, Chinchilla, PA. Then, chuckling at my colossal joke on that bastard Ventner, I consulted the records, encyclopedias and so on. Yep, there were now many such stone busts on the Isle de Pasqua, Easter Island. So much for Mr. Marcus D. Ventner. Then I saw a copy of News Time on the newsstand. It featured a story of the new book by André de Vries, all about the Eastern Island phenomena. And there was a picture of the man who must have churned out that second book, the bastard, Mark Ventner. The miserable mother had used part of his first book's vast proceeds to get a nose job to root hair in his no longer cue ball noggin, and he had raised a mustache. I stood there staring at that picture, and I groaned. Mark Ventner no longer bore the faintest resemblance to my Easter Island caricatures. I didn't just nurse my wounds. I planned and plotted again. I worked it all out carefully, and I admit to feeling like a genius. We were all afflicted or blessed with it at one time or another. This plan I even talked over with Ben Corrick. We were friends now, and allies. I went back again, back this time to 1816. A bit of jockeying, June 1816. A bit more, Switzerland, June 15th, 1816. I hid the V-dub pretty damned cleverly, I thought, and reached my destination in the midst of a cold, nasty rain that I knew would continue for several days. And I knocked at the door, the door of the Maison Chapuy. Out back, I knew, was a vineyard and, about fifteen minutes' stroll away, the Via Diodati. Naturally, they had had to take me in. I was obviously what passed for a gentleman in those days, and just as obviously a stranger in a strange land, not to mention a passing intelligence, and wetly bedraggled and hungry. They were all there, Mary, Claire, George, Percy, and John. Claire, Mary's half-sister and George's mistress, obviously wished we'd all bug off and leave her and her lover alone so they could continue the relationship they'd begun in England. We didn't. We talked constantly. George kept writing down pieces of a long, heroic poem he was working on and stuffing them into his pockets. I wondered if he'd ever get all that fire-starter sorted out and pieced together. Mary was a shy girl. Yeah, you female sexists. Girl. She was nineteen who was manifestly content to listen to the rest of us. She exhibited the presence of a good brain, though, and was well-read. Her husband and his friend were fervently interested in modern science, that is, what was modern then and past for science. Galvanism, for instance. No, no, not galvanizing. Galvanism, after Luigi Galvani, who died only eighteen years before. He had serendipitously discovered what he was to call animal electricity and learned how to create a metallic arc that caused the muscles of frogs' legs to contract so that they twitched. The new discipline was still called galvanism, although by the time of my visit to Maison Chapuy, Alessandro Volta had slipped paper soaked in salt water between alternating plates of copper and zinc and had been proclaimed a count by Napoleon, who also hung a gold medal on him. The point is, George said, gesturing with his glass of sherry, that galvanism appears to enliven the limbs of the deceased. Now, might it not be possible, as some say, to impart life to the entire organism by the same means? John, whose father had been a countryman of both Volta and Galvani, smiled, obviously making a small effort not to sneer. George seeks little, friend Moss. He would but revive the dead, you see. I sighed. I agree that it seems not too likely, I admitted, that a body can be made to jerk does not necessarily mean that it possesses life. 
though perhaps in future, with more knowledge and more sophisticated machinery, electricity may provide means for uh, treating sudden death. Dear God, said Percy the atheist, what a phrase. What a phrase indeed, John said. And you actually believe that some day the dead might be raised by men of medicine, using these lightning tools of Volta and Galvani. Oh, and the American, Franken. Franklin, I muttered noting how Mary was sitting forward in a tense posture of concentration. Perhaps, doctor. Certainly there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our simple philosophies, and what it pleases us to call science. Meanwhile, it would seem the only means at hand of raising the dead is through the East European superstition, vampirism. Well, George confessed to being fascinated by that subject, though just now he was into Charlemagne pretty heavily again. So we talked on. Outside it was a proper night for such a conversation. The wind blew and cracked its cheeks, the rain sluiced down with viciousness. Eventually Percy was nodding off, and we had to call a halt. George and John stayed the night, though I think Claire slept alone. I did. The following night we were reminded that Percy had on two occasions penned what were then Gothic romances of the castle of Otranto school, not like the Gothics of the twentieth century. Zastrozzi and... St. Irvine, or the Rosicrucian. That led us to the fact that John's father was guilty of having translated Walpo's Otranto into his native tongue. Ah, the interconnections. I tried to tell them Ruth Ben Todd's surrealist tale of the boy who found himself in a sort of Erewhon and eventually turned into a Greek Alk, the lost traveler. They weren't much interested, though John was taken with the name Ruthven and made a note of it. This night was even worse. Somehow we all agreed to an appropriate reading of stories of the occult. There was one about the legend of poor old Prometheus, another, history of the inconstant lover, about a man whose bride turned out to be either ancient or a corpse, I forget which. Then, all excited George was suggesting that we all try our hands at a ghost story, or something supernatural. I suggested a vampire tale, with George excitedly interrupting the outline to embellish, and John assiduously making notes in his illegible physician's hand. Mary demurred. She had no supernatural ideas. Suppose, I said, that a scientist of brilliant mind, a physician such as our esteemed friend here, were convinced that galvanism could be used to revive the dead, or impart life to a humanoid creature of his own devising. There, dear, Percy said, yawning, combine that with your fascination with Prometheus, and perhaps you will unburden your sweet self of a story of surpassing horror. So? George Gordon started his vampire story, half-heartedly, and Claire, too, started one, while John tinkered with the vampire idea that was mine and George's. Eventually he wrote it as a novella about a vampire named Lord Ruthven, no less, and for a while it was attributed to George. It was Mary, though, who commenced to skip meals and make her fingers sore, writing her yarn of Prometheus Rebound, or The Strange Tale of Dr. Schmidt, it was I who suggested that the entire novel might be handled as a flashback. She thought that was very clever indeed, and hopped to it. Convincing her that Victor Schmidt was a nowhere name was rather more difficult. Why not the name of that American electricity man, Franken, John suggested. Franklin, I muttered. Franklinson? Claire amended. In German, enthusiastic George cried, Frankenstein. That's a nice name, Mary said. At last the rains let up. I departed, with Mary thanking me profusely, and all of them begging me to return. I promised. And I did. That was part of my master plan. By that time, two years later, John Polidori had been canned as George's companion and tame physician, and had published The Vampire in London. George Gordon had abandoned his novel in favor of fitting together the scraps of paper into the third canto of Child Harold, which he signed Lord Byron, as usual, and Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus, was doing very well indeed. I was welcomed with open arms and bottles, naturally, and both Byron and Shelley agreed to what I wanted and had gone through the whole business to set up, personal interviews. I made sure never to goof up and let them hear any sounds from the tape recorder. Nor would Count Alessandro Volta, over Como Way, have recognized its power source, the successor to the Voltaic Pile and the Voltaic Cell. I see. Once again, I departed my dear friends George, of course we didn't call him Lord, Percy, Mary, and Claire, and let Tuman Capote top that. 
I moved myself forward only a few years to England in 1846. There, then, by diverse devious means, I made the acquaintance of two lamentably homely and relentingly neurotic sisters. One thing led to another, according to plan, and each became a bit less neurotic, via method similar to that which the service station man means when he tells you your car needs to be taken out and have its carburetor adjusted. Thus, a bit happier and more knowledgeable, and having less trouble with their monthlies, at least, those two did not, that year or any other year, write the novels that were to be the progenitors of the modern flood of what we call Gothic romances. Thus the Bronte sisters perpetuated neither Jane Eyre nor Wuthering Heights. A quick bounce up to the end of that century showed me that Henry James, without those books as catalysis, never thought of his novella about the poor, sweet governess who comes to the mysterious house inhabited by ghosts out to get her and the children, the turn of the screw. I had not only made the career of Boris Karloff, I had effectively stopped all those novels with girl plus castle mansion with one lighted window on the cover. The modern Gothic was stillborn. My work was nearly done, except for the few weeks I took off to transcribe the notes and tapes of my conversations with Byron and Shelley. Although we'd spent most of our time at Shelley's chalet, I called the book after Byron's Via Diodati. It hath a better ring, and doth fall more trippingly off the tongue. Published in 1954, Via Diodati became the definitive work on those gentlemen. The movie starred Robert Taylor and Tyrone Power, with George Sanders as Polidori and Grace Kelly as Mary. Though it received far less critical acclaim than the book, and certainly nothing but the back-of-me-hand treatment from academia, the movie was a blockbuster. The gross was enormous, of which my ten percent was, well, we needn't get too specific, need we? The publishing firm I then launched, beginning with my own novel based on the unwritten turn of the screw, not only prospered, but utterly swamped another firm that was being launched at the same time. Faced with bankruptcy, its owner-founder accepted my less-than-munificent terms. You know who it was, the bastard. Mark Ventner is the oldest slush-pile reader in the publishing business. As to Benjamin A. Corrick, Ph.D., and now F.R.S., I financed his researches personally, when he was just beginning them. He was kind enough to give me a great deal of the credit last year, when he received honorable mention in the Stockholm Nobel Ceremonies for having proven graphically and conclusively the utter possibility of time travel. Male Supremacy by Hayford Pierce It all seems so inevitable now that mankind is spreading out through the galaxy. The only question is, why wasn't it done sooner? Why did the road to the stars have to wait until 1984 when an Anglo-Chinese merchant fell to musing over his correspondence? But perhaps all of mankind's greatest advances, from fire through the wheel, from penicillin through hydrogen fusion, seem inevitable only in retrospect. Who remembers the faceless thousands who unlocked the secret of nuclear energy, the man who dropped the first atomic bomb? Mankind remembers Einstein. Who remembers the faceless thousands who built the first moonship, the man who first stepped upon an alien world? Mankind remembers Verne and Lay and Campbell as mankind remembers Chap Foey Ryder. Chap Foey Ryder's main offices were in New York, not far from Grand Central Station. From then he directed an import-export firm that blanketed the globe. On November 8, 1984, a Friday, his secretary brought him the day's mail. It was 11.34 in the morning. Chap Foey Ryder frowned. Nearly noon, and only now was the mail delivered. How many years had it been since there had been two deliveries a day, morning and afternoon? At least twenty-five. Where was the much-vaunted progress of the age of technology? He remembered his childhood in London long before the war, when there had been three daily deliveries, when his father would post a letter in the morning asking an associate to tea and receive a written reply before tea-time. It was enough to make a bloke shake his head. Chap Bowie Ryder shook his head and picked up his mail. There was a bill of loading from his warehouse in Brooklyn, seven miles away, mailed eight days ago. There was a portfolio printout from his investment counselor in Boston, 188 miles away, mailed seven days ago. There was an inquiry from his customs broker in Los Angeles, 2,451 miles away, mailed four days ago. There was a price list from a pearl merchant in Papiti, Tahiti, 6,447 miles away, mailed three days ago. Chap Foey Ryder reached for his slide rule. He then called his branch manager in Honolulu. 
He told him to mail a letter to the branch manager in Cape Town, 11,535 miles away. The Cape Town manager called Chap Foy Ryder two days later to advise him that the letter from Honolulu had arrived. Although still Sunday in New York, it was early Monday morning in Cape Town. Chap Foy Ryder pondered. The length of the equator was 24,901.55 miles. No spot on earth could be farther than 12,450.78 miles from any other. He reached for the World Almanac. Bangkok was 12,244 miles from Lima. He smiled. He had offices in each city. A letter from Bangkok reached Lima in a single day. Chap Foey Ryder returned to his slide rule. The extrapolation was staggering. One further test was required to prove his theory. He pursed his lips, then carefully addressed an envelope. Occupant, 614 Starshine Boulevard, Alpha Centauri 4. He looked at his watch. Good. The post office was open for another hour. He personally pushed the envelope through the out-of-town slot and strolled home. Returning to his office the next morning, he found in his stack of mail the envelope addressed to Alpha Centauri. Frowning, he picked it up. Stamped across the front in purple ink were the words, Addressee Unknown, Return to Sender. Chap Foey Ryder lighted his first cigarette of the day, and to conceal his discontent, puffed perfect rings toward the ceiling. Was the test actually conclusive? True, the envelope had been returned, but with suspicious speed. He reviewed the chain of logic, then studied the envelope with a magnifying glass. There was, after all, nothing to indicate which post office had stamped it. He ground the cigarette out and reached for a piece of paper. He wrote firmly, without hesitation, The Right Honorable Chairman of the Supreme Galactic Council, Sagittarius. Sir, I feel I must draw to your attention certain shortcomings in your general post office system. Only yesterday I mailed a letter. Chap Foey Ryder awaited the morning's delivery. Eventually it arrived. There was an envelope-sized piece of thick, creamy parchment, folded neatly and held together by a complex red seal. His name appeared on one side, apparently engraved in golden ink. Expressionless, he broke the seal, unfolded the parchment, and read the contents. It was from the Executive Secretary, Office of the Mandator of the Galactic Confederation. Dear Sir, in reply to yours of the fourteenth instant, the Mandator begs me to inform you that as per your speculation, the Galactic Confederation does indeed exist as primarily a postal union, its purpose being to promote trade and commerce between its 27,000 members. Any civilization is invited to join our Confederation, the sole qualification of membership being the independent discovery of our faster-than-light postal union. His Excellency is pleased to note that you, on behalf of your fellow Terrans, have at long last fulfilled the necessary conditions, and in consequence, an ambassador plenipotentiary from the Galactic Confederation will be arriving on Terra within the next two days. Please accept, Mr. Ryder, on behalf of the Mandator, the expression of his most distinguished sentiments. To promote trade and commerce. Chap Foey Ryder restrained himself from rubbing his hands together in glee. Instead, he pushed a buzzer to summon his four sons to conference. The stars were coming to mankind. Ryder Factoring Limited would be ready for them. He called the mailroom to tell them to be on the alert for a large package from Sagittarius. The Gentle Earth by Christopher Anvil Plashed Bade, Supreme Commander of Invasion Forces, drew thoughtfully on his slim cigar. The scouts are all back? Sishian Runkle, Chief of the Supreme Commander's Staff, nodded. They all got back safely, though one or two had difficulties with some of the lower life forms. Is the climate all right? Runkle abstractedly reached in his tunic and pulled out a thing like a short piece of thick, tarred rope. As he trimmed it, he scowled. There's some discomfort, apparently because the air is too dry. But on the other hand, there's plenty of oxygen near the planet's surface, and the gravity's about the same as it is back home. We can live there. Bade glanced across the room at a large blue, green, and brown globe, with irregular patches of white at top and bottom. What are the white areas? Apparently chalk. One of our scouts landed there, but he's in practically a state of shock. The brilliant reflectivity in the area blinded him. 
a huge white furry animal attacked him, and he barely got out alive. To cap it all, his ship's insulation apparently broke down on the way back, and now he's in the sick bay with a bad case of space gripe. All we can get out of him is that he had severe prickling sensations in the feet when he stepped out onto the chalk dust. Probably a pile of little spiny shells. Did he bring back a sample? He claims he did, but there's only water in his sample box. I imagine he was delirious. In any case, this part of the planet has little to interest us. Bade nodded. What about the more populous regions? Just as we thought, a huge web of interconnecting cities, manufacturing centers, and rural areas. Our mapping procedures have proved to be accurate. That's a relief. What about the natives? Erect, land-dwelling, ill-tempered bipeds, said Runkle. They seem to have little or no planet-wide unity. Of course, we have large samplings of their communications media. When these are all analyzed, we'll know a lot more. What do they look like? They're pink or brown in color, quite tall, but not very broad or thick through the chest. A little fur here and there on their bodies. No webs on their hands or feet. And their feet are fantastically small. Otherwise, they look quite human. Their technology? Runkle sucked in a deep breath and sat up straight. Every bit as bad as we thought. He picked up a little box with two stiff handles, squeezed the handles hard, and touched a glowing wire on the box to his piece of black rope. He puffed violently. Bade turned up the air conditioning. Billowing clouds of smoke drew away from Runkle in long streamers so that he looked like an island looming through heavy mist. His brow was creased in a foreboding scowl. Technologically, he said, they are deadly. They've got fission and fusion, indirect molecular and atomic reaction control, and a long-reaching development of electron flow and pulsing devices. So far they don't seem to have anything based on deep rearrangement or keyed focusing, but who knows when they'll stumble on that, and then what? Even now, properly warned and ready, they could give us a terrible struggle. Runkle knocked a clinker off his length of rope and looked at Bade with the tentative, judging air of one who was not quite sure of another's reliability. Then he said loudly and with great firmness, We have a lot to be thankful for. Another five or ten decades delay getting the watch ships up through the cloud layer, and they'd have had us by the throat. We've got to smash them before they're ready, or we'll end up as their colony. Bade's eyes narrowed. I've always opposed this invasion on philosophical grounds, but it's been argued and settled. I'm willing to go along with the majority opinion. Bade wrapped the ash off his slender cigar and looked Runkle directly in the eyes. But if you want to open the whole argument up all over again... No, said Runkle, breathing out a heavy cloud of smoke. But our micro-mapping and radiation analysis shows a terrific rate of progress. It's hard to look at those figures and even breathe normally. They're gaining on us like a shark after a minnow. In that case, said Bade, let's wake up and hold our lead. This business of attacking the suspect before he has a chance to commit a crime is no answer. What about all the other planets in the universe? How do we know what they might do some day? This planet is right beside us. Is murder honorable as long as you do it only to your neighbor? Your argument is self-defense, but you're straining it. Let it strain, then, said Runkle angrily. All I care about is that chart showing our comparative levels of development. Now we have the lead. I say drag them out by their necks and let them submit, or we'll thrust their heads under water and have done with them. And anyone who says otherwise is a doubtful patriot. Bade's teeth clamped, and he set his cigar carefully on a tray. Runkle blinked, as if he only appreciated what he had said by echo. Bade's glance moved over Runkle deliberately, as if stripping away the emblems and insignia. Then Bade opened the bottom drawer of his desk and pulled out a pad of dun-colored official forms. As he straightened, his glance caught the motto printed large on the base of the big globe. The motto had been used so often in the struggle to decide the question of invasion that Bade seldom noticed it any more. But now he looked at it. The motto read, Them or Us. Bade stared at it for a long moment, looked up at the globe that represented the mighty planet, then down at the puny motto. He glanced at Runkle, who looked back dully but squarely. Bade glanced at the motto, shook his head in disgust, and said, Go get me the latest reports. Runkle blinked. Yes, sir. 
he said, and hurried out. Bade leaned forward, ignored the motto, and thoughtfully studied the globe. Bade read the reports carefully. Most of them, he noted, contained a qualification. In the scientific reports, this generally appeared at the end. Owing to the brief time available for these observations, the conclusions presented herein must be regarded as only provisional in character. In the reports of the scouts, this reservation was usually presented in bits and pieces. And this thing, that looked like a tiny crab, had a pair of pincers at one end, and I didn't have time to see if this was the end it got me with, or if it was the other end. But I got a jolt, as if somebody squeezed a lighter and held the red-hot wire against my leg. Then I got dizzy and sick to my stomach. I don't know for sure if this was what did it, or if there are many of them, but if there are, and if it did, I don't see how a man could fight a war and not be stung to death when he wasn't looking. But I wasn't there long enough to be sure. Another report spoke of a crawling army of little six-legged things with a set of oversized jaws on one end that came swarming through the shrubbery straight for the ship, went right up the side, and set to work eating away the superplast binder around the viewport. With that gone, the ship would leak air like a fishnet. But when I tried to clear them away, they started in on me. I don't know if this really proves anything, because Ruft landed not too far away, and he swears the place was like a paradise. Nevertheless, I have to report that I merely set my foot on the ground, and I almost got marooned and eaten up right on the spot. Bade was particularly uneasy over reports of a vague respiratory difficulty some of the scouts noticed in the region where the first landings were planned. Bade commented on it, and Runkle nodded. I know, said Runkle, the air's too dry. But if we take time to try to provide for that, at the same time, they may make some new advance that will more than nullify whatever we gain. And right now their communications media show a political situation that fits right in with our plans. We can't hope for that to last forever. Bade listened as Runkle described a situation like that of a dozen hungry sharks swimming in a circle, each getting its jaws open for a snap at the next one's tail. Then Runkle described his plan. At the end, Bade said, Yes, it may work out as you say, but listen, Runkle, isn't this a little too much like one of those whirlpools in the treacherous islands? If everything works out, you go through in a flash, but one wrong guess, and you go around and around and around and around, and you're lucky if you get out with a whole skin. Runkle's jaw set firmly. This is the only way to get a clear-cut decision. Bade studied the far wall of the room for a moment. I'm sorry I didn't get a hand at these plans sooner. Sir, said Runkle, you would have if you hadn't been so busy fighting the whole idea. He hesitated, then asked, Will you be coming to the staff review of plans? Certainly, said Bade. Good, said Runkle. You'll see that we have it all worked to perfection. Bade went to the review of plans and listened as the details were gone over minutely. At the end, Runkle gave an overall summary. The colony planet, he said, wrapping a pointer on maps of four hemispheric views, is only 75% water, so the land areas are immense. The chief land masses are largely dominated by two hostile power groups, which we may call East and West. At the fringes of influence of these power groups live a vast mass of people not firmly allied to either. The territory of this uncommitted group is well suited to our purposes. It contains many pleasant islands and comfortable seas. Unfortunately, analysis shows that the dangerous military power groups will unite against us if we seize this territory directly. To avoid this, we will act to stun and divide them at one stroke. Runkle wrapped his pointer on a land area lettered North America and said, On this land mass is situated a politico-economic unit known as the U.S. The U.S. is the dominant power both in the Western Hemisphere and in the West Power Group. It is surrounded by side seas that separate it from its allies. Our plan is simple and direct. We will attack and seize the central plain of the U.S. This will split it into helpless fragments, any one of which we may crush at will. The loss of the U.S. will, of course, destroy the power balance between East and West. The East will immediately seize the scraps of Western power and influence all over the globe. During this period of disorder, we will set up our key tools factories, and a light-duty forceway network. In rapid stages, 
will then come ore converters, staging plants, fabricators, heavy-duty forceway stations, and self-operated production units. With these last, we will produce energy conversion units and storage piles by the million in a network to blanket the occupied area. The linkage produced will power our damper units and blot out missile attacks that may now begin in earnest. We will thus be solidly established on the planet itself. Our base will be secure against attack. We will now turn our energies to the destruction of the USSR as a military power. He reached out with his pointer to wrap the new land mass. The USSR is the dominant power of the East Power Group. This will by now be the only hostile power group remaining on the planet. It will be destroyed in stages. In stage one, we will confuse the USSR by propaganda. We will profess friendship while we secretly multiply our productive facilities to the highest possible degree. In stage two, we will seize and fortify the western and northern islands of Britain, Novaya Zemlya, and New Siberia. We will also seize and heavily fortify the Kamchatka Peninsula in the extreme eastern USSR. We will now demand that the USSR lay down its arms and surrender. In the event of refusal, we will, from our fortified bases, destroy by missile attack all productive facilities and communication centers in the USSR. The resulting paralysis will bring down the East Power Group in ruins. The planet will now lie open before us. Runkel looked at each of his listeners in turn. Everything has been done to make this invasion a success. To crush out any possible miscalculation, we are moving with massive reserves close behind us. Certain glory and a mighty victory await us. Let us raise our heads in prayer, then join in the oath of battle. The first wave of the attack came down like an avalanche on the central U.S. Multiple transmitters went into action to throw local radar stations into confusion. Stull gas missiles streaked from the landing ships to explode over nearby cities. Atmospheric flyers roared off to intercept possible enemy attacks. A stream of guns, tanks, and troop carriers rolled down the landing ways and fanned out to seize enemy power plants and communication centers. The commander of the first wave reported, Everything proceeding according to plan. Enemy resistance negligible. Runkel ordered the second wave down. Bade, watching it on a number of giant view screens in the operations room of a ship coming down, had a peculiar feeling of numbness, such as might follow a deep cut before the pain is felt. Runkel, his face intense, said, Their position is hopeless. The main landing site is secure, and the rest will come faster than the eye can see. He turned to speak into one of a bank of microphones, then said, Our glider missiles are circling over their capital. A loudspeaker high on the wall said, Landing minus three. Take your stations, please. The angle of vision of one of the view screens tilted suddenly to show a high, dome-topped building set in a city filled with rushing beetle shapes, obviously ground cars of some type. Abruptly, these cars all pulled to the sides of the streets. That, said Runkel grimly, means their capital is out of business. The picture on the view screen blurred suddenly, like the reflection from water ruffled by a breeze. There was a clang like a ten-ton hammer hitting a twenty-ton gong. Walls, floor, and ceiling of the room danced and vibrated. Two of the view screens went blank. Bade felt a prickling sensation travel across his shoulders and down his back. He glanced sharply at Runkel. Runkel's expression looked startled but firm. He reached out and snapped orders into one of his microphones. There was an intense, high-pitched ringing, then a clap like a nuclear cannon of six paces distance. The wall loudspeaker said, Landing minus two. An intense silence descended on the room. One by one, the view screens flickered on. Bade heard Runkel say, The ship is totally damped. They haven't anything that can get through it. There was a dull, low-pitched thud, a sense of being snapped like a whip, and the screens went blank. The wall loudspeaker dropped and jerked to a stop, hanging by its cord. Then the ship sat down. Runkel's plan assumed that the swift-moving advance from the landing site would overrun a sizable territory during the first day. With this maneuvering space quickly gained, the landing site itself would be safe from enemy ground attack by dawn of the second day. Now that they were down, however, Bade and Runkel looked at the operations room's big view screen and saw their vehicles standing still all over the landscape. 
The troops crowded about the rear of the vehicles to watch cursing drivers pull the motors up out of their housings and spread them out on the ground. Here and there a stern officer argued with grim-faced troops who stared stonily ahead as if they didn't hear. Meanwhile, the tanks, trucks, and weapons carriers stood motionless. Runkel, infuriated, had a cluster of microphones gripped in his hand and was pronouncing death by strangling and decapitation on any officer who failed to get his unit in motion right away. They'd studied the baffled expressions on the faces of the drivers, then glanced at the enemy ground cars abandoned at the side of the road. He turned to see a tall officer with general's insignia stagger through the doorway and grip Runkel by the arm. Bade recognized Rost, general forces commander. Sir, said Rost, it can't be done. It has to be done, said Runkel grimly. So far we've decoyed the enemy missiles to a false sight. Before they spot us again, those troops have got to be spread out. They won't ride in the vehicles. It's that or get killed. Sir, said Rost, you don't understand. I came back here in a gun carrier. To start with, the driver jammed the speed lever all the way to the front shield, and nothing happened. He got up to see what was wrong. The carrier shot ahead with a flying leap, threw the driver onto his back, and almost snapped our heads off. Then it coasted to a stop. We pulled ourselves together and turned around to get the cover off the motor box. Wham! The carrier took off, ripped the cover out of our hands, threw us against the rear shield, and knocked us senseless. Then it rolled to a stop. That's how we got here. Jump! Roll! Stop! Wait! Jump! Roll! Stop! Wait! On one of those jumps, the gun went out the back of the carrier, mount, bolts, and all. The driver swore he'd turn off the motor and fangjaw take the planet and the whole invasion. We aren't going to win a war with troops in that frame of mind. Runkel took a deep breath. Bade said, What about the enemy's ground cars? Will they run? Rast blinked. I don't know. Maybe. Bade snapped on a microphone lettered, Aerial Wreck. A little screen in a half circle atop the microphone lit up to show an alert, harried-looking officer. Bade said, You've noticed our vehicles are stopped? Yes, sir. Were the enemy's ground cars affected at the same time as ours? No, sir. They were still moving after ours were stuck. Any motor trouble in atmospheric fire command? None that I know of, sir. Bade glance at Rast. Try using the enemy ground cars. Meanwhile, get the troops who can't move back under cover of the ship's dampers. Rast saluted, whirled, and went out at a staggering run. Bade called atmospheric flyer command and ground forces maintenance, and arranged for the captured enemy vehicles to be identified by a large yellow X painted across the top of the hood. Then he turned to Runkel and said, We're going to need all the support we can get. See if we can bring Landing Force 2 down late today instead of tomorrow. I'll try, said Runkel. It seemed to Bade that the events of the next twenty-four hours unrolled like the scenes of a nightmare. Before the troops were all under cover, an enemy reconnaissance aircraft leaked in very high overhead. The detector screens of Atmospheric Flyer Command were promptly choked with enemy aircraft coming in low and fast from all directions. These aircraft were of all types— some heaved their bombs in underhand, barreled over, and streaked home for another load. Others were flying hives of anti-aircraft missiles. A third type were suicide bombers or winged missiles. These roared in head-on and blew up on arrival. While the dampers labored and overheated, and flyer commands struggled with enemy fighters and bombers overhead, a long-range reconnaissance flyer spotted a sizable convoy of enemy ground forces rushing up from the southwest. Bade and Runkel concentrated first on living through the air attack. It soon developed that the enemy planes, though extremely fast, were not very maneuverable. The enemy's missiles did not quite overload the dampers. The afternoon wore on in an explosive violence that was severe, but barely endurable. It began to seem that they might live through it. Toward evening, however, a small enemy missile streaked in on one end of a wire and smashed the grid of an auxiliary damper unit. Before this unit could be repaired, a heavy missile came down near the same place and overloaded the damper network. Another missile streaked in. One of the ships tilted and fell headlong. The engines of this ship were ripped out of the circuit that powered the dampers. With the next enemy missile strike, another ship was heaved off its base. This ship housed a large proportion of Flyer Command's detector screens. Bade and Runkel looked at each other. Bade's lips moved, and he heard himself say, Prepare to evacuate. 
At this moment, the enemy attack let up. It took an instant for Bay to realize what had happened. He cancelled his evacuation order before it could be transmitted, then had the two thrown ships linked back into the power circuit. He turned around, and his glance fell on one of the view screens, showing the shadowy plane outside. A brilliant flash lit the screen, and he saw dark, low shapes rushing in toward the ships. Bade immediately gave orders to defend against ground attack, but not to pursue beyond range of the dampers. A savage, half-lit struggle developed. The enemy, whose weapons failed to work in range of the dampers, attacked with bayonets and used guns, shovels, and picks in the manner of clubs and battle axes. In a spasm of bloody violence, they fought their way in among the ships, then, confused in the dimness, were thrown back with heavy losses. As night settled down, the enemy dug in to make a fortified ring close around the landing site. The enemy missile attack failed to recover its former violence. Bade gave silent thanks for the deliverance. As the comparative quiet continued, it seemed clear that the enemy high command was holding back to avoid hitting their own men dug in nearby. It occurred to Bade that now might be a good time to get a little sleep. He turned to go to his cot, and there was a rush of yellow dots on Flyer Command's pilot screen. As he stared wide-eyed, auxiliary screens flickered on and off to show a ghostly dish-shaped object that led his flyers on a wild chase all over the sky, then vanished at an estimated speed twenty times that the enemy planes were thought capable of doing. Runkle said, Landing Force 2 can get here at early dawn. That's the best we can manage. Bade nodded dully. The ground screens now lit in brilliant flashes as the enemy began firing monster rockets at practically point-blank range. Night passed in a continuous bombardment. At early dawn of the next day, Bade put in all his remaining missiles and bomber and interceptor flyers. For a brief interval of time, the enemy bombardment was smothered. Landing Force 2 sat down beside Landing Force 1. Bade ordered the stull gas missiles of Landing Force 2 exploded near the enemy ground troops. In the resulting confusion, the ground forces moved out and captured large numbers of enemy troops, weapons, and vehicles. The captured vehicles were marked and promptly put to use. Bade spoke briefly with General Rast, commanding the ground forces. Now's your chance, said Bade. Move fast, and we can capture supplies and reinforcements flowing in before they realize we've broken their ring. Under the protection of the flyers of Landing Force 2, Rast's troops swung out onto the central plain of the North American continent. The advance moved fast. Enemy troops and supply convoys were caught off guard on the road. When the enemy fought, his resistance was patchy and confused. Bade, feeling drugged from lack of sleep, lay down on his cot for a nap. He awoke feeling fuzzy-brained and dull. They're whipped, said Runkle gleefully. We've got back the time we lost yesterday. There's no resistance to speak of. And we've just made a treaty with the East Block. Bade sat up dizzily. That's wonderful, he said. He glanced at the clock. Why wasn't I called sooner? No need, said Runkle. It's all just a matter of form. Landing Force 3 is coming down tonight. The war's over. Runkle's face, as he said this, had a peculiar shine. Bade frowned. Isn't the enemy making any reaction at all? Nothing worth mentioning. We're driving them ahead of us like a school of minnows. Bade got to his feet uneasily. It can't be this simple. He stepped out into the operations room and detected unmistakable signs of holiday jubilation. Nearly everyone was grinning, and gawkers were standing in a thick ring before the screen showing the map room's latest plot. Bade said sharply, Don't these men have anything to do? His voice carried across the room with the effect of a shark surfacing in the midst of a ladies' swimming party. Several of the men at the map jumped. Others glanced around jerkily. There was a concerted bumping of elbows, and the ring of gawkers evaporated briskly in all directions. In every part of the room there was abruptly something approaching a businesslike atmosphere. Bade looked around angrily and sat down at his desk. Then he saw the map. He squeezed his eyes shut, then looked again. In the center of the map of North America was a big blot, as if a bottle of red ink had been thrown at it. Bade turned to Runkle and asked harshly, is that map correct? Absolutely, said Runkle, his face shining with satisfaction. Bade looked back at the map and performed a series of rapid calculations. He glanced at the view screens, 
and saw that those which would normally show the advanced ground troops weren't in use. This, he supposed, meant that the advance had outrun the technical crews. Bade snapped on a microphone lettered, Supply, Ground. In the half-circle atop the microphone appeared an officer in the last stage of sleepless exhaustion. The officer's eyes twitched, and his skin had a drawn, dull look. His head was slumped on his hand. Supply? said Bade in alarm. Sorry, mumbled the officer. We can't do it. We're overstretched already. Try flyer command. Maybe they'll parachute it to you. Bade switched off and glanced at the map again. He turned to Runkle. Listen, what are we using for transport? The enemy ground cars. Fast, aren't they? Runkle smiled cheerfully. They're built for speed. Rast grabbed a whole fleet of them to start with, and they've worked fine ever since. A few wrecks, some bad cases of kinkfoot, but that's all. What the devil is kinkfoot? Well, the enemy have tiny feet with little toes and no webs at all. Some of their ground car controls are on the floor. There just isn't much space, so our men's feet get cramped. It's just a mild irritation. Runkle smiled vaguely. Nothing to worry about. Bade squinted hard at Runkle. What supply using for transport? Steam trucks, of course. Do they work all right, or do they jump? Runkle smiled dreamily. They work fine. Bade snapped on the supply microphone. The same weary officer appeared, his head in his hands, and mumbled, Sorry, we're overloaded. Try flyer command. Bade said angrily, Wake up a minute! The man raised his head, blinked at Bade, then straightened as if hauled by the back of the collar. Sir? What's the overall supply picture? Sir, it's awful. Terrible. What's the matter? The advance is so fast, and the units are all mixed up, and when we get to a place, they've already pulled out. Worse yet, the steam trucks. He hesitated, as if afraid to go on. Speak up, snapped Bade. What's wrong with the trucks? Is it the engine? Fuel? Running gear? What is it? It's... The water, sir. The water? Sir, there's that constant loss of steam out the exhaust. At home we just throw a few more buckets of water in the tank and go on, but here... Oh, said Bade, the situation dawning on him. But around here, sir, said the officer, they've had something called a severe drought. The streams are dry. Can you dig down? Sir, at best there's just muck. We know there's water here somewhere, but meanwhile our trucks are stalled all over the country, with the men dug down out of sight, and the natives standing around shaking their heads. And sure, there's got to be water down there somewhere, but what do we use right now? Bade took a deep breath. What about the enemy trucks? Can't you use them? If we'd started off with them, I suppose we could have, but ground forces has requisitioned most of them. Now we're spread out in all directions, with the front getting farther away all the time. Bade switched off and got in touch with ground forces maintenance. A spruce-looking major appeared. Bade paused a moment, then asked, How's your workload, major? Are you behind schedule? The major looked shocked. No, sir. Far from it. We're away ahead of schedule. Aren't these enemy vehicles giving you any trouble? Any difficulties in repair? The major laughed. Fangjaw, General. We don't repair them. When they burn out, we throw them away. We pried up the hoods of some of them, pulled off the top two or three layers of machinery, and took a good look underneath. That was enough. There are hundreds of parts, all shapes and sizes, and dozens of different kinds of motors. Half of the parts are stuck, so they won't move when you try to get them out. And to top it all, there isn't enough room in there to squeeze in an extra grain of sand, so what's the use? If something goes wrong with one of those things, we give it a shove off the road and forget it. There are plenty of others. I see, said Bade. Do you send your repair crews out to shove the ground cars off the road? Oh, no, sir, said the Major, looking startled. Like the Colonel says. Let the ground forces do it. Sir, it doesn't take any skill to do that. It's just that that's our policy. Don't repair them, throw them away. What about our vehicles, then? Have you found out what's wrong? The Major looked uncomfortable. Well, the difficulty is that the vehicles work satisfactorily inside the ship, and for a little while outside, but then, after they've been out a while, a malfunction occurs in the mechanism. That's what causes the trouble. 
He looked at Bade hopefully. Was there anything else, sir? Yes, said Bade dryly. It's the malfunction I'm interested in. What is it that goes wrong? The Major looked unhappy. Well, sir, we've had the motors apart and put back together I don't know how many times, and the fact is, there's nothing at all wrong with them. There's nothing wrong, but they still won't work. That's not our department. We've handed the whole business over to the testing lab. Then, said Bade, you actually don't have any work to do? The Major jumped. Oh, no, sir, I didn't say that. We... We're holding ourselves in readiness, sir, and we've got our shops in order, and some of the men are doing some very, uh, important research on the, the structure of the enemy ground car, and fine, said Bade. Get your colonel on this line. When the colonel appeared, Bade said, Ground Forces Supply has its steam trucks out of service for lack of water. Get in touch with their HQ, find out the location of the trucks, and get out there with the water. Find out where they can replenish in the future. Take care of this as fast as you can. The colonel worked his mouth in a way that suggested a weak valve struggling to hold back a large quantity of compressed air. Bade looked at him hard. The colonel's mouth blew open and, Yes, sir, came out. The colonel looked startled. Bade immediately switched back to supply and said, Ground forces maintenance is going to help you water your trucks. Why didn't you get in touch with them yourselves? It's the obvious thing. Well, sir, we did hours ago. They said water supply wasn't in their department. Bade seemed to see the bursting of innumerable bubbles before his eyes. It dawned on him that he was bogged down in petty details while big events rushed on unheeded. He switched back to the colonel briefly, and when he switched off, the colonel was plainly vibrating with energy from head to toe. Then Bade looked forebodingly at the map and ordered liaison to get General Rast for him. This took a long time which Bade spent trying to anticipate the possible enemy reaction if supply broke down completely and a retirement became necessary. By the time Rast appeared on the screen, Bade had thought it over carefully and could see nothing but trouble ahead. There was a buzz, and Bade looked up to see a fuzzy picture of Rast. Rast, as far as Bade could judge, had a look of victory and exhilaration. But the communicator's reception was uncommonly bad, and Rast's image had a tendency to flicker, fade, and slide up and down. Judging by the trend of the conversation, Bade decided reception must be worse yet on the other end. Bade said, Supply is in a mess. You'd better choose some sort of defensible perimeter and halt. Rast said, Thank you. The enemy is in full flight. Listen, said Bade. Supply is stopped. We can't get supplies to you. Supply can't catch up with you. We'll pursue them day and night, said Rast. Listen to me, said Bade. Break off the pursuit. We can't get supplies to you. Rast's form slowly dimmed and expanded till it filled the screen, then burst and reappeared as a brilliant image the size of a man's thumb. His voice cut off, then came through as a crackle. said the image, expanding again. This noise was accompanied by earnest gestures on the part of Rast and a very determined facial expression. The image grew huge and dim and burst, then started over again. Bade spat out a word he had promised himself never to say again under any circumstances whatever. Then he sat helpless while the image, large and clear, leaned forward earnestly and pounded one huge fist into the other. <laughs> Listen, said Bade. I can't make out a word you're saying, he leaned forward. We can't get supplies to you. The image burst and started over, bright and small. Bade sucked in a deep breath. He grabbed the communications microphone. Listen, he snapped. I've got General Rast on the screen here, and I can't hear anything but a crackle. The image constantly expands and contracts. I know, sir, said a gray smock technician with a despairing look. I can see the monitor screen from here. It's the best we can do, sir. Out of the corner of his eye, Bade could see Rast's image growing huge and dim. Hiss! said Rast earnestly. What causes this? roared Bade. Sir, all we can guess is some terrific electrical discharge between here and General Rast's position. What such a discharge might be, I can't imagine. Bade scowled and looked at a thumb-sized Rast. 
Bade opened his mouth to roar out that there was no way to get supplies through. Rath's image suddenly vibrated like a twanged string, then stopped expanding. Rath's voice came through clearly. Will you repeat that, sir? We can't supply you, said Bade. Halt your advance. Pick a good spot and halt. Rast's image was expanding again. Sis, he said, and saluted. His image vanished. Bade immediately snapped on the communications microphone. Do you have anyone down there who can read lips, he demanded. Read lips? Sir, I... The technician squinted suddenly and swung off the screen. He was back in a moment, his face clear and hopeful. Sir, we've got a man in the section that's a fanatic on communications methods. The other men think he can read lips, and I've sent for him. Good, said Bade. Set him to work on the record of that conversation with General Rast. Another thing, is there any way you can get a message through to Rast? The technician looked doubtful. Well, sir, I don't know. His face cleared slightly. We can try, sir. Good, said Bade. Send supply situation bad. Strongly suggest you halt your advance and consolidate position. Bade's glance fell on the latest plot from the map room. Glumly he asked himself how Rast or anyone else could hope to consolidate the balloon-like situation that was coming about. Sir? asked the technician. Is that all? Yes, said Bade. And let me know when you get through to Rast. Yes, sir. Bade switched off and turned to ask Runkle for the exact time Landing Force 3 would be down. Bade hesitated, then squinted hard at Runkle. Runkle's face had an unusually bright, animated look. He was glancing rapidly through a sheaf of reports, quickly scribbling comments on them, and tossing them to an excited-looking clerk, who rushed off to slap them on the desks of various exhilarated officers and clerks. These men eagerly transmitted them to their various sections. This procedure was normal, but the faces of the men all looked too excited. Their movements were jerky and fast. Bade became aware of the sensation of watching a scene in a lunatic asylum. The excited-looking clerk rushed to Runkle's desk to snatch up a sheaf of reports, and Bade snapped, Bring those here! The clerk jumped, rushed to Bade's desk, halted with the jerky bounce, and saluted snappily. He flopped the papers on the desk, whirled around, and raced off toward the desks of the officers who usually got the reports Bade was now holding. The clerk stopped suddenly, looked at his empty hands, spun around, stared at Runkle's desk, then at Bade's. A look of enlightenment passed across his face. Oh, he said, with a foolish grin. He teetered back and forth on his heels, then rushed over to look at the latest plot from the map room. Bade set his jaw and glanced at the reports Runkle had marked. The top two or three reports were simple routing and had merely been initialed. The next report, however, was headed Testing Lab, Report on Cause of Vehicle Failure, Recommendations. Bade quickly glanced over several sheets of technical diagrams and figures and turned to the summary. He read, In short, the breakdown of normal function and the resultant slow violent pulsing action of the motor is caused by the abnormally low conductivity of surface conduction layer S3. The pulsar current, which would normally flow across this layer, is blocked and instead builds up on projection L26. Eventually a sufficient charge accumulates and arcs across air gap B. This throws a shock current through the exciter, such as is normally experienced only during violent acceleration. The result is that the vehicle shoots ahead from a standing start, then rolls to a stop, while the current again slowly accumulates. The root cause of this malfunction is the fantastically low moisture content of the atmosphere on this planet. It is this that causes the loss of conductivity across layer S3. Recommended measures to overcome this malfunction include a. Artificial humidification of the air entering the motor by means of sprayer and fan. b. Sealing of the motor unit. c. Coating of surface condition layer S3 with a top-sealed permanent conducting film. a or b probably can be carried out as soon as the requisite devices and materials are obtainable. This, however, may involve a considerable delay. c, on the other hand, will require a good deal of initial testing and experimentation, but may then be carried into effect very quickly, as the requisite tools and materials are already at hand. We will immediately carry out the initial measures for whichever plan you deem preferable. Bade looked the report over again carefully. 
then glanced at Runkle's scrawled comment. Good work. Carry this out immediately. S.R. Bade glared. Carry what out immediately? Bade glanced angrily at Runkle, then sat up in alarm. Runkle's hands clenched the side of his desk. Runkle's back was straight as a rod. His chest was inflated to huge dimensions, and he was slowly drawing in yet more air. His face bore a fixated, inward-turned look that might indicate either horror or ecstasy. Bade shoved his chair back and glanced around for help. His glance stopped at the map screen, where the huge overblown blot in the center of the continent had sprouted a long, narrow pencil reaching out toward the west. There was a quick, low, gong-like sound, and the semicircular rim atop the communications microphone lit up in red. Bade snapped the microphone on, and a scared-looking technician said, Sir, we've worked out what General Rast said. What? Bade demanded. At Bade's side, there was a harsh scraping noise. Bade whipped around. Runkle lurched to his feet, his face tense, his eyes shut, his mouth half open and his hands clenched. Runkle twisted. There was a gagging sound, then a harsh roar. Ka, 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 ka choo! Bade sat down in a hurry and grabbed the microphone marked Medical Corps. A crowd of young doctors and attendants swarmed around Runkle with pulse beat snoopers, blood pressure gauges, little lights on long rubber tubes, and bottles and jars, which they filled with fluid sucked out of the suffering Runkle with long hollow needles. They whacked Runkle, pinched him, and thumped him, then jumped for cover as he let out another blast. Sir, said a young doctor wearing a medical officer on duty badge, I'm afraid I shall have to quarantine this room and all its occupants. That includes you, sir. He said this in a gentle but firm voice. Bade glanced at the doorway. A continuous stream of clerks, officers, and messengers moved in and out on necessary business. Some of these officers, Bade noticed, were speaking in low, angry tones to idiotically smiling members of the staff. As one of the angry officers slapped a sheaf of papers on a desk, the owner of the desk came slowly to his feet. His chest inflated to gigantic proportions, he let out a terrific blast, reeled back against a wall, and let out another. The young medical officer spun around excitedly. Epidemic, he yelled. Seal that door. Back, all of you. His face had a faint glow as he turned to Bade. We'll have this under control in no time, sir. He went briskly to the door. His hand came up and plastered a red and yellow sticker over the joint where door and wall came together. He faced the room. Everyone here is quarantined. It's death to break that seal. From Bade's desk came an insistent ringing, and the small voice of the communications technician pleaded, Sir, please, sir, this is important. On the map across the room, the bloated red space now had two sizable dents driven into it, such as might be expected if the enemy were opening a counteroffensive. The thin pencil line reaching toward the west was wobbling uncertainly at its far end. Bade became aware of a fuzzy quality in his own thinking, and struggled to fix his mind on the scene around him. The young doctor and his assistants hustled Runkle toward the door. As Bade stared, the doctor and assistants went out the door without breaking the quarantine seal. The sticker was plastered over the joint on the hinge side of the door. The seal bent as the door opened, then straightened out unhurt as the door shut. Phew, said Bade. He picked up the communications microphone. What did General Rast say? Sir, he said, I can't reach the coast any faster than a day and a half. The coast? That's what he said, sir. Did you get that message to him? Not yet, sir. We're trying. Bade switched off and tried to think. His army was stretched out like a rubber balloon. His headquarters machinery was falling apart fast. An epidemic was loose among his men and plainly spreading fast. The base was still secure, but without sane men to man it, the enemy could be expected to walk in any time. Bade's eyes were watering. He blinked and glanced around for some sane face in the sea of hysterically cheerful people. He spotted an alert-looking officer with his back against the wall and a chair leg in his hand. Bade called to him. The officer looked around. Bade said, do you know when Landing Force 3 is coming down? Sir, they're coming down right now. Bade stayed conscious long enough to watch the beginning of the enemy's counteroffensive. 
and also to see the start of the exploding sickness spread through the landing site. He grimly summarized the situation to the man he chose to take over command. This man was the leader of Landing Force Three, a general by the name of Kotek. General Kotek was a fanatic, a man with a rough, hypnotic voice and a direct, unblinking stare. General Kotek's favorite drink was pure water. Food was a matter of indifference to him. His only known amusements were regular physical exercise and the dissection of military problems. To hesitate to obey a command of General Kotek's was unheard of. To bungle in the performance of it was as pleasant as to sit down in the open mouth of a shark. General Kotek's officers were usually recognizable by their lean athletic appearance and a tendency to jump at unexpected noises. General Kotek's men were nearly always to be seen in a state of good order and high spirits. As soon as Bade, aching and miserable, summarized the situation and ordered Kotek to take over, Kotek gave a sharp, precise salute, turned, and immediately began snapping out orders. Heavily armed troops swung out to guard the site. Military police forced wandering gangs of sick men back to their ships. The crews of Landing Force Three divided up to bring the depleted crews of the other ships up to minimum standards. The ship's damper units were turned to full power, and the outside power network and auxiliary damper units were disassembled and carried into the ships. Word came that a large enemy force had made an airborne landing not far away. Kotick's troops marched in good order back to their ships. The ships of all three landing forces took off. They set down together in the center of the largest mass of Rast's encircled troops. The next day passed embarking these men under the protection of Kotick's fresh troops and the ship's dampers. Then the ships took off and repeated the process. In this way, some sixty-five percent of the surrounded men were saved in the course of the week. Two more landing forces came down. General Rast and a small body of guards were found unconscious part way up an unbelievably high hill in the west. The situation at this point became hopelessly complicated by the exploding sickness. This sickness, which none of the doctors were able to cure or even relieve, manifested itself in various forms. The usual form began by exhilarating the victim. In this state, the patient generally considered himself capable of doing anything, however foolhardy, and regardless of difficulties. This lasted until the second phase set in with violent contractions of the chest and a sudden outrush of air from the lungs, accompanied by a blast like a gun going off. This second stage might or might not have complications such as digestive upset, headache, or shooting pains in the hands and feet. It ended when the third and last phase set in. In this phase, the victim suffered from mental depression, considered himself a hopeless failure, and was as likely as not to try to end his life by suicide. As a result of this suicidal impulse, there were nightmarish scenes of soldiers disarming other soldiers, which brought the whole invasion force into a state of quaking uncertainty. At this critical point, and despite all precautions, General Kotick himself began to come down with the sickness. With him, the usual exhilaration took the form of a stream of violent and imperative orders. Troops who should have retreated were ordered to fight to the death where they stood. Savage counterattacks for worthless objectives were driven home to the last drop of blood. Because General Kotick ordered it, people obeyed without thought. The hysterical light in his eye was masked by the fanatical glitter that had been there to begin with. The general himself only realized what was wrong when his chest tightened up, his body tensed, and a racking concatenation of explosions burst from his chest. He immediately brought his body to the position of attention and crushed out by sheer will a series of incipient tickling sensations way down in his throat. General Kotick handed the command over to General Runkle and reported himself to sick bay. Runkle, by this time, had recovered enough from the third phase to be untied and allowed to walk around with only two guards. As he had not fully recovered his confidence, however, he immediately went to see Bade. Bade's illness took the form of nausea, weakness, cold hands and feet, and a sensation of severe pressure in the small of the back. Bade was lying on a cot when Runkle came in, followed by his two watchful guards. Bade looked up and saw the two guards lean warily against the wall, their eyes narrowed as they watched Runkle. Runkle paused at the foot of Bade's bed. "'How do you feel?' Runkle asked. "'Except for yesterday and the day before,' said Bade, "'I never felt worse in my life. How do you feel?' "'All right most of the time,' he cleared his throat. "'Kotick's down with it now. Did he know in time?' "'No. I'm afraid he's left things in a mess.' 
Spade shook his head. Do we have a general officer who isn't sick? Not in the top brackets. Who did Kotick hand over to? Me, Runkle looked a little embarrassed. I'm not sure I can handle it yet. Who's in actual charge right now? I've got the pieces of our own staff and the staff of Landing Force 2 working on it. Kotick's staff is hopeless. Half of them are talking about sweeping the enemy off the planet in two days. Bade grunted. What's your idea? Well, said Runkle, I still get a little excited now and then. If you could possibly provide a sort of general supervision. Bade looked away weakly. How's Rast? Tied to his bunk, with half a dozen men sitting on him. What about Volk? Tearing his lungs out every two or three minutes. Sokis, then? Runkle shook his head grimly. I'm afraid they didn't hear the gun go off in time. The doctors are still working on him, though. Well, is Frotch all right? Yes, thank heaven. But then he's flyer command. And worse yet, there's nobody to put in his place. All right. How about Sozzle? Well, said Runkle, Sozzle may be a good propaganda man, but personally I wouldn't trust him to command a platoon. Yes, said Bade, rolling over to try to ease the pain in his back. I see your point. He took a deep breath. I'll try to supervise the thing. He swung gingerly to a sitting position. Runkle watched him, then his face twisted. The whole thing is all my fault, he said. He choked. I'm just no good. The two guards sprang across the room, grabbed Runkle by the arms, and rushed him out the door. Harsh grunts and solid thumping sounds came from the corridor outside. There was a heavy crash. Somebody said, All right, get the general by the feet and I'll take him by the shoulders. Phew, let's go. Bade sat dizzily on the edge of the bed. For a moment, he had a mental image of Runkle before the invasion, leaning forward and saying impressively, Certain glory and a mighty victory await us. Bade took several slow, deep breaths. Then he got up, carefully found a towel, and cautiously went to wash. It took Bade almost a week to disentangle the troops from the web of indefensible positions and hopeless last stands Kotick had commanded them to in a day and a half of peremptory orders. The enemy, meanwhile, took advantage of opportunity, using ground and air attacks, rockets, missiles, and artillery in such profusion as to stun the mind. It was not until Bade's men and officers had recovered from circulating attacks of the sickness and another landing force had come down, that it was possible to temporarily resume the offensive. Another two weeks, and another sick landing force recovered, saw the invasion army in control of a substantial part of the central plain of the continent. Bade now had some spare moments to squint at certain reports that were piled up on his desk. Exasperatedly, he called a meeting of high officers. Bade was standing with Runkle at a big map of the continent when their generals came in, Bade and Runkle each looked grim and intense. The generals looked uniformly dulled and worn down. Bade took a last hard look at the map. Then he and Runkle turned round. Bade glanced at Veth, landing site commander. What's your impression of the way things are going? Veth scowled. Well, we're still getting eight to ten sizable missile hits a day. Of course, there's no predicting when they'll come in. With the men working outside the ships, any single hit could vaporize large numbers of essential technical personnel. Until we get the underground shelters built, the only way around this is to have the whole site damped out all the time. He shook his head. This takes a lot of energy. Bade nodded and turned to Rast, ground forces commander. So far, said Rast, frowning, our situation on paper looks not too bad. Morale is satisfactory. Our weapons are superior. We have strong forces in a reasonable large central area, and in theory we can shift rapidly from one front to the other and be superior anywhere. But in practice, the enemy has so many missiles of all types and sizes that we can't take advantage of the position. Suppose, for instance, that I order twenty and twenty-two tank armies from the eastern to the western front. They can't go under their own power, because of fuel expenditure, the wear on their tracks, and the resulting delay for repairs. They can't go by forceway network because there isn't any built yet. The only way to send them is by the natives' iron track roads. That would be fine, 
except that the iron track roads make beautiful targets for missile attacks. Thanks to the enemy, every bridge and junction either is, has been, or will be blown up, and not once either. The result is we have to use slow filtration of troops from one front to the other, or we have to accept very heavy losses en route. In addition, we now know that the enemy has formidable natural defenses in the east and west, especially in the west. There's a range of hills there that surpass anything I've ever seen or heard of. Not only is the difficulty of the terrain an obstacle, but as our men go higher, movement finally becomes practically impossible. I know this from personal experience. The result of it is, the enemy need only guard the passes, and he has a natural barrier behind which he can mass for attack at any chosen point. Bade frowned. Don't the hills have the same harmful effect on the enemy? No, sir, they don't. Why not? I don't know. But that and their missiles put us in a nasty spot. Bade absorbed this, then turned to General Frotch, head of Atmospheric Flyer Command. Frotch said briskly, Sir, so far as the enemy air forces are concerned, we have the situation under control, and various foreign long-range reconnaissance aircraft that might have been filtering in from distant native countries have also been successfully batted out of the sky. However, as far as, uh, missiles are concerned, the situation is a little strained. Bade snapped. Go on. Well, sir, said Frotch, the enemy has missiles that can be fired at the fastest atmospheric flyers, that can be made to blow up near them, that can be guided to them, and even that can be made to chase and catch them. What about our weapons? They're fine on a percentage basis, but the enemy has a lot more missiles than we have pilots. I see, said Bade. Well, he turned to speak to the director of intelligence, but Frotch went on. Moreover, sir, we are having atmospheric troubles. Atmospheric troubles? What's that? For one thing, gigantic traveling electrical displays that disrupt plane-to-ground and ground-to-plane communications and have to be avoided, or else the pilots either don't come out, or else come out fit for nothing but a rest cure. Then there are mass movements of air traveling from one part of the planet to another, like land breezes and sea breezes at home, but here the breezes can be pretty forceful. The effect is to put an unpredictable braking force on all our operations. Bade nodded slowly. Well, we'll have to make the best of it. He turned to General Sazel, who is disseminator of propaganda. Sazel cleared his throat. I can make my report short and to the point. Our propaganda is getting us nowhere. For one thing, the enemy is apparently used to being ambushed daily by something called advertising, which seems to consist of a series of subtle propaganda traps. By comparison, our approach is so crude, it throws them into hysterics. Bade glanced at the director of intelligence, who said dully, Sir, it's too early to say for certain how our work will eventually turn out. We've had some successes, but so far we've been handicapped by translation difficulties. Bade frowned. For instance... Take the single word snow, said the intelligence director. You can't imagine the snarl my translators get into over that word. It apparently means white, solid, which falls in crystals from the sky. Figure that out. Bade squinted, then looked relieved. Oh, it means dust. That's the way the interpreters translated it. Now consider this sentence from a school book. When April comes, the dust all turns to water and flows into the ground to fill the streams. That doesn't make any sense at all. No, but that's what happens if you accept dust as the translation for snow. There are other words such as winter, blizzard, tornado. Ask a native for an explanation, and with a straight face he'll give you a string of incomprehensible nonsense that will stand you on your ear. Not that it's important in itself, but it seems to show something about the native psychology that I can't quite figure out. You can fight your enemy best when you can understand him. Well, from this angle, they're completely incomprehensible. Keep working on it, said Bade after a short silence. He turned to Runkel. Runkel said, The overall situation looks about the same from my point of view. Namely, the natives are driven back, but by no means defeated. What we have to remember is that we never expected to have them defeated at this stage. True, our time schedule has been set back somewhat, but this was due not to enemy action, but to purely accidental circumstances. That is, 
First, the atmosphere was so deficient in moisture that our ground vehicles were temporarily out of order, and second, we were disabled by an unexpected disease. But these troubles are over with. My point is that we can now begin the decisive phase of operations. Good, said Bade. But to do that, we have to firmly hold the ground we have. I want to know if we can do this. On the surface, perhaps, it looks like it. But there are signs here I don't like. As the old saying goes, a shark shows you his fin, not his teeth. Take warning from the fin. When you see the teeth, it's too late. Yes, said Frotch, turning excitedly to Rast. That's the thought exactly. Now, will you mention it or shall I? Holy fangjaw, growled Rast. Maybe it doesn't really mean anything. The supreme commander, said Runkle angrily, was trying to talk. Bade said, What is it, Rast? Speak up. Well, Rast hesitated, glanced uneasily at Runkle, then thrust out his jaw. Sir, it looks like the whole master plan of the invasion may have come unhinged. Runkle angrily started to speak. Bade glanced at Runkle, took out a long, slender cigar, and sat down on the edge of the table to watch Runkle. He lit the cigar and put down the lighter. As far as Bade was concerned, his face was expressionless. Things seemed to have an unnatural clarity, however, as he looked at Runkle and waited for him to speak. Runkle looked at Bade, swallowed hard, and said nothing. Bade glanced at Rast. Rast burst out, Sir, for the last ten days or so, we've been wondering how long the enemy could keep up his missile attacks. Flyer Command has blasted factories vital to missile manufacture and destroyed all their known stockpiles. Well, grant we didn't get all their stockpiles, that's logical enough. Grant that they had tremendous stocks stored away. Even grant that before we got here, they made missiles all the time for the sheer love of making them. Maybe every man, woman, and child in the country had a missile, like a pet. Still, there's got to be an end somewhere. Bade nodded soberly. Well, sir, said Rast, we get these missiles fired at us all the time, day after day after day, one missile after the other, like an army of men tramping past in an endless circle forever. It's inconceivable that they'd use their missiles like this unless their supply is inexhaustible. Frotch gets hit with them, I get hit with them, Beth gets hit with them. For every job there's a missile. We put our overall weapon superiority in one pan of the balance. They pour an endless heap of missiles into the other pan. Where do all these missiles come from? For an instant, Rast was silent. Then he went on. At first we thought, underground factories. Well, we did our best to find them, and it was no use. And whenever we managed to spot moving missiles, they seemed to be coming from the coast. About this time, some of my officers were trying to convert a bunch of captives to our way of thinking. One of the officers noticed a peculiar thing. Whenever he clinched his argument by saying, Moreover, you are alone in the world. You cannot defeat us alone. The captives would all look very serious. Most of them would be very still and attentive. But here and there among them, a few would choke, gag, make sputtering noises, and shake all over. The other soldiers would secretively kick these men and jab them with their elbows until they were still and attentive. Now, however, the question arose... What did all this mean? The actions were described to intelligence, who said they meant exactly what they seemed to mean, suppressed mirth. In other words, whenever we said, you can't win, you're alone in the world, they wanted to burst out laughing. My officers now varied the technique. They would say, for instance, the USSR is our faithful ally. Our captives would sputter, gasp, and almost strangle to death. Put this together with their inexhaustible supply of missiles, and the thing takes on a sinister look. You think, said Bade, that the USSR and other countries are shipping missiles to the U.S. by sea? General Frotch cleared his throat apologetically. Sir, excuse me, I have something new to add to this. I've set some merger planes down along all three of their coasts. Not only are the ports alive with shipping, but some of our men swam into the harbors at night and hid and either they're the victims of mass hypnosis, or else those ships are unloading missiles like a fish unloads spawn. Bade looked at Runkle. Runkle said dully, In that case, we have the whole planet to fight. That was what we had to avoid at any cost. This comment produced a visible deterioration of morale. Before this attitude had a chance to set, 
Bade said forcefully and clearly, I was never in favor of this attack, and this fortifies my original views. But from a strictly military point of view, I believe we can still win. He went to the map, and speaking to each of the generals in turn, he explained his plan. In the three following days, each of the three remaining landing forces set down. The men of each landing force, as expected, became violently ill with the exploding sickness. With the usual course of the sickness known, it proved possible to care for this new horde of patients, with nothing worse than extreme inconvenience for the invasion force as a whole. The enemy, meanwhile, strengthened his grip around the occupied area, and at the same time cut troop movements within the area to a feeble trickle. Day after day the enemy missiles fell in an increasingly heavy rain on the road and rail centers. During the height of this bombardment, Bade succeeded in gradually filtering all of Landing Force 3 back to the protection of the ships. Rast now reported that the enemy attacks were mounting in force and violence, and requested permission to fall back and contract the defense perimeter. Bade replied that help would soon come, and Rast must make only small local withdrawals. Landing forces 7, 8, and 9, cured of the exploding sickness, now took off. Immediately afterward, Landing Force 3 took off. Landing forces 3 and 7, under General Kotick, came down near the base of the upper peninsula of Michigan, and struck south and west to rip up communications in the rear of the main enemy forces attacking General Rast. Landing Force 8 split, its southern section seizing the western curve of Cuba to cut the shipping lanes of the Gulf of Mexico. Its northern section seized Long Island to block shipping entering the port of New York, and to subject shipping in the ports of Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington to heavy attack from the air. Landing Force 9 remained aloft until the enemy's reaction to General Kotick's thrust from the rear became evident. This reaction proved to be a quickly improvised simultaneous attack from north and south to pinch off the flow of supplies from Kotick's base to the point of his advance. Landing Force 9 now set down, broke the attack of the southern pincer, then struck southeastward to that road and rail supplying the enemy's northern armies. The overall situation now resembled two large, roughly concentric circles, each very thick in the north and very thin in the south. A large part of the outer circle, representing the enemy's forces, was now pressed between the inner circle and the inverted Y of Kotick's attack from the north. A large percentage of the enemy missile launching sites were now overrun, and Rast for the first time found it possible to switch his troops from place to place without excessive losses. The enemy opened violent attacks in both east and west to relieve the pressure on their trapped armies in the north, and Rast fell back slowly, drawing forces from both these fronts and putting them into the northern battle. The outcome hung in a treacherous balance until the enemy's supplies gave out in the north. This powerful enemy force then collapsed, and Rast swung his weary troops to the south. Three weeks after the offensive began, it ended with the fighting withdrawal of the enemy to the east and west. The enemy's long eastern and southern coasts were now sealed against all but a comparative trickle of supplies from overseas. General Kotick held the upper peninsula of Michigan in a powerful grip. From it he dominated huge enemy industrial regions and threatened the flank of potential enemy counterattacks from north or east. Within the main occupied region itself, the Forceway Network and Key Tool Factories were being set up. Runkel was only expressing the thought of nearly the whole invasion army when he walked into the operations room, heaved a sigh of relief, and said to Bade, Well, thank heaven that's over. Bade heard this and gave a noncommittal growl. He had felt this way himself some time before. During Runkel's absence, however, certain reports had come to Bade's desk and left him feeling like a man who goes down a flight of steps in the dark, steps off briskly, and finds there was one more step than he thought. Look at this, said Bade. Runkel leaned over his shoulder, and together they looked at a report headed, Enemy Equipment. Bade passed over several pages of drawings and descriptions devoted to enemy knives, guns, grenades, helmets, canteens, mess equipment, and digging tools, then paused at a section marked Enemy Clothing. 1. Normal enemy clothing consists of light two-piece underwear, an inner and an outer foot covering, and either a light two-piece or light one-piece outer covering for the arms, chest, abdomen, and legs. 2. However, capture of enemy supply trains in the recent northern offensive uncovered the following fantastic variety. A. Thick inner and outer hand coverings. B. Heavy one-piece undergarment covering legs, arms, and body. C. Heavy upper outer garment. D. Heavy lower outer garment. E. Heavy inner foot covering. 
F. Massive outer foot covering. G. Additional heavy outer garment. H. Extraordinarily heavy outer garment designed to cover entire body with exception of head, hands, and lower legs. In addition, large extra quantities of the heavy cover normally issued to the troops for sleeping purposes were also found. The purpose of all this clothing is difficult to understand, insofar as the activity of a soldier encased in all these garments would be cut to a minimum. It can only be assumed that all these coverings represent body shielding against some abnormal condition. The presence of poisonous chemicals in large quantities seems a likely possibility, yet with the exception of the massive outer foot covering, these garments are not impermeable. Bade looked at Runkle. They do have war chemicals. Of course, said Runkle, frowning, but we have protective measures, and our own war chemicals if trouble starts. Bade nodded thoughtfully, slid the report aside, and picked up one headed Medical Report on Enemy Skin Condensation. Runkle shook his head. I can never understand those. We've had a flood of reports like that from various sources. At most, I just initial them and send them back. Well, said Bade, read the summary at least. I'll try, growled Runkle, and leaned over Bade's shoulder to read. To summarize these astonishing facts, enemy captives have been observed to form, on the outer layer of their skin, a heavy beading of moisture. This effect is similar to that observed with laboratory devices maintained at depressed temperatures, that is, at reduced degrees of heat. The theory was, therefore, formed that the enemy's skin is, similarly, maintained at a temperature lower than that of his surroundings. Complex temperature-determining apparatus were set up to test this theory. As a result, this theory was disproved, but an even more astonishing state of affairs was discovered. The enemy's internal temperature varied very little, regardless of considerable experimental variation of the temperature of his environment. The only possible conclusion was that the enemy's body contains some built-in mechanism that actually controls the degree of heat and maintains it at a constant level. Now, according to Poff's widely accepted principle, no complex bodily mechanism can long maintain itself in the absence of need or exercise. And what is the need for a bodily mechanism that has the function of holding body temperature constant despite wide external fluctuation? What is the need for a defense against something unless the something exists? We are forced to the conclusion that the degree of heat on this planet is subject to variations sufficiently severe as to endanger life. A new examination of what has hitherto been considered to be the enemy's mythology indicates that, contrary to conditions on our own planet, this planet is subject to remarkable fluctuations of temperature that alternately rise to a peak, then fall to an incredible low. According to this new theory, our invasion force arrived as the temperature was approaching its maximum. Since then, it has reached and passed its peak, and is now falling. All this has passed unnoticed by us, partly because the maximum here approaches the ordinary condition on our home planet. The danger, of course, is that the minimum on this planet would prove insupportable to our form of life. This was followed by a qualifying phrase, that further tests would have to be made, and the conclusions could not be considered final. Bade looked at Runkle. Runkle snapped. What do you do with a report like that? I'd tear it up, but why waste strength? It's easier to throw them in the wastebasket and go on. Wait a minute, said Bade. If this report just happens to be right, then where are we? Frankly, said Runkle, I don't know or care. Skin condensation. These scientists should keep their minds on things that have some chance of being useful. It would help if they'd figure out how to cut down flareback on our subtron guns. Instead, they talk about skin condensation. Bade wrote on the report, This may turn out to be important. List on no more than two sheets of paper possible defenses against reduced degree of heat. Get it to me as soon as possible. Bade. Bade signaled to a clerk. Snap a copy of this. Send the original out. And bring me the copy. Yes, sir. Now, said Bade, we have one more report. Well, I have to admit, said Runkle, that I can't see that either of these reports were of any value. Well, read this one, then. Runkle shook his head in disgust and leaned over. His eyes widened. This paper was headed, For the Supreme Commander Only, Special Report of General Kotick. The report began, Sir, it is an officer's duty to state, plainly and without delay, any matter that requires the immediate attention of his superior, 
I therefore must report to you the following unpleasant but incontrovertible facts. 1. Since their arrival in this region, my troops have on three recent occasions displayed a strikingly low level of performance. Two simulated night attacks revealed feeble command and exaggerated sluggishness on the part of the troops. A defense exercise carried out at dawn to repulse a simulated amphibious landing was a complete failure. Troops and officers alike displayed insufficient energy and initiative to drive the attack home. 2. On other occasions, troops and officers have maintained a high, sometimes strikingly high, level of energy and activity. 3. No explanation of this variability of performance has been forthcoming from the medical and technical personnel attached to my command. Neither have I any assurance that these fluctuations will not take place in the future. 4. It is, therefore, my duty to inform you that I cannot assure the successful performance of my mission. Should the enemy attack with his usual energy during a period of low activity on the part of my troops, the caliber of my resistance will be that of wax against steel. This is no exaggeration, but plain fact. 5. This situation requires the immediate attention of the highest military and technical authorities. What is in operation here may be a disease, an enemy nerve gas, or some natural factor unknown to us. Whatever its nature, the effect is highly dangerous. 6. A mobile, flexible defense in these circumstances is impossible. A rigid linear defense is worthless. A defense by linked fortifications requires depth. I am therefore constructing a deep fortified system in the western section of the region under my control. This is no cure, but a means of minimizing disaster. 7. Enemy missile activity since the defeat of their northern armies has been somewhat less than 40% of that expected. Runkle's face was somber. This is serious, he said. When Kotick yells for help, we've got trouble. We'll have to put all our attention on this thing and get it out of the way as fast as we can. Bade nodded and reached over to take a message from a clerk. He glanced at it and scowled. The message was from Atmospheric Flyer Command. It read, Warning! Tornado sighted approaching main base. Runkle leaned over to read the message. What's this? he said angrily. Tornado is just a myth. Everybody knows that. Bade snapped on the microphone to aerial reconnaissance. What's this tornado warning? he demanded. What's a tornado? Sir? A tornado is a whirling, severe breeze of destructive character, conjoined with a dark cloud in the shape of a funnel, with a smaller end down. Runkle gave an inarticulate snarl. Bade squinted. This thing is dangerous? Yes, sir. The natives dig holes in the ground and jump in when one comes along. A tornado will smash houses and ground cars to bits, sir. Listen, snarled Runkle. It's just air, isn't it? Bade snapped on landing site command. Get all the men back in the ships, he ordered. Turn the dampers to full power. Holy fangjaw, Runkle burst out. Air can't hurt us. What's bad about a breeze, anyway? He seized the aerial reconnaissance microphone and snarled up. Stand up, you! What have you been drinking? They took Runkle by the arm. Look here! On the nearest wall screen, a wide black cloud warped across the sky and stretched down a long arc to the ground. The whole thing grew steadily larger as they watched. Bade seized the landing site command microphone. Can we lift ships? No, sir. Not without tearing the power and damper networks to pieces. I see, said Bade. He looked up. The cloud overspread the sky. The screen fell dark. There was a heavy clang, a thundering crash. The ship trembled, tilted, heeled, and slowly, painfully, settled back upright as Bade hung onto the desk and Runkle dove for cover. The sky began to lighten. Bade gripped the microphone and asked what had happened. He listened blank-faced as, after a moment, the first estimates of the damage came in. One of the thousand-foot-long ships had been tipped off its base. In falling, it struck another ship, which also fell, striking a third. The third ship struck a fourth, which fell unhindered, and split up the side like a bean pod. The mouth of the tornado's funnel then ran along the split, and the ship's inside looked as if it had been cleaned out with a vacuum hose. A few stunned survivors and scattered bits of equipment were clinging here and there. That was all. The enemy chose this moment to land its heaviest missile strike in weeks. It took the rest of the day, all night, and all the following day to get the damage moderately well cleaned up. 
Then a belated report came in that Forceway Station 1 had been subjected to a bombardment of desks, chairs, communications equipment, and odd bolts and nuts that had riddled the installation from one end to the other, and set completion date back four weeks. An intensive search now located most of the missing equipment and personnel, strewn over forty miles of territory. It was, said Runkle weakly, only air. That's all. Yes, said Bade grimly. He looked up from a scientific report on the tornado. A whirlpool is only water, whirling water. Apparently this planet has traveling whirlpools of air. Runkle groaned. Then a sudden thought seemed to hit him. He reached into his wastebasket, fished around, and drew out a crumpled ball of paper. He smoothed it out, read for a while, then growled, Scientific reports. Here's some kind of report that came in right in the middle of a battle. According to this thing, the native name for the place we've set down is Cyclone Alley. Is there some importance in knowing a thing like that? Bade felt severe prickling sensations across his back and neck. Cyclone, he said. Where did I hear that before? Give me that paper. Runkle shrugged and tossed it over. Bade smoothed it out and read, In this prevalent fairy tale, the cyclone, corresponding to our sea serpent, or ogre of the deep, makes recurrent visits to communities in certain regions, frightening the inhabitants terribly and committing all sorts of prankish violence. On some occasions, it carries its chosen victims aloft to set them down again far away. The cyclone is a frightening giant, tall and dark, who approaches in a whirling dance. An interesting aspect is the contrast of this legend with the equally prevalent legend of Santa Claus. Cyclone comes from the south, Santa from the north. Cyclone is prankish, frightening. Santa is benign, friendly, and even brings gifts. Cyclone favors springtime, but may come nearly any time except winter. Santa comes only in winter. Cyclone is secular. Santa reflects some of the holy aura of the religious festival, Christmas. Christmas comes but once a year. When it comes, it brings good cheer. Though Cyclone visits but a few favored towns at a time, Santa visits at once all, everyone, even the lowliest dweller in his humble shack. The natives are immensely earnest about both of these legends. An amusing aspect is that our present main base is almost ideally located for visits by that local ogre of the sea, Cyclone, we are, in fact, situated in a location known as Cyclone Alley. Perhaps the ogre will visit us. At the bottom of the page was a footnote. Cyclone is but one name for this popular ogre. Another common name is Tornado. Bade sat paralyzed for a moment, staring at this paper. Tornado Alley, he muttered. He grabbed the flyer command microphone to demand how the tornado warning system was coming. Then, groggily, he set the paper aside and turned his attention to the problem of General Kotick's special report. He looked up again as a nagging suspicion began to build up in him. He turned to Runkle. How many of these myths have we come across, anyway? Runkle looked as though a heavy burden were settling on him. He groped through his bulging wastebasket and fished out another crumpled ball of paper, then another. He located the one he wanted, smoothed it out, sucked in a deep breath, and read... Cyclone, winter, spring, summer, hurricane, Easter bunny, autumn, blizzard, cold wave, snow white and the seven dwarfs, lightning, Santa Claus, typhoon, mental telepathy, earthquake, levitation, volcano, he looked up. You want the full report on each of these things? I've got most of them here somewhere. Bade looked warily at Runkle's overstuffed wastebasket. No, he said. But what about that report you're reading from? Isn't that an overall summary? Why didn't I get a copy of that? Runkle looked it over and growled. Try to train them to send their reports to the right place. Yes, it's an overall summary. Here, want it? Yes, said Bade. He took the report, then stopped to wonder, where was that report he had asked for on reduced degree of heat? He reached for a microphone, then remembered General Kotick's special report. Bade first sent word to Kotick, that he approved what Kotick was doing, and that the problem was getting close attention. Then he read the crumpled overall summary Runkle had given him, and ended up thinking he had been on a trip through fairyland. His memory of the details evaporated even as he tried to mentally review the paper. Halloween, he growled. Icebergs, typhoons. 
This planet must be a mass of mythology from one end to the other. He picked up a microphone to call his intelligence service. A messenger hurried across the room to hand him a slip of paper. The paper was from Atmospheric Flyer Command. It read, Warning! Tornado sighted approaching main base. This time the tornado roared past slightly to the west of the base. It hit instead Forceway Station 1 and scattered sections of it all over the countryside. For good measure, the enemy fired in an impressive concentration of rockets and missiles. The attack did only slight harm to the base, but it finished off Forceway Station 1. An incoherent report now came in from the occupied western end of Cuba to the effect that a hurricane had just gone through. Bade fished through Runkle's wastebasket to find out exactly what a hurricane might be. He looked up at the end of this, pale and shaken, and sent out a strong force to put his Cuban garrison back on its feet. Then he ordered intelligence and some of his technical and scientific departments to get together right away and break down the so-called myths into two groups, harmful and non-harmful. The non-harmful group was to be arranged in logical order, and each item accompanied by a brief, straightforward description. As Bade sent out this order, General Kotick reported that, as a supplement to his fortified system, he was making sharp raids whenever conditions were favorable, in order to keep the enemy in his section off balance. In one of these raids, his troops had captured an enemy document, which had since been translated. The document was titled, Characteristics of Unheatful-Blooded Animals. Kotick enclosed a copy. Unheatful-blooded animals have no built-in system for maintaining their bodily rate of molecular activity. If the surrounding temperature falls, so does theirs. This lowers their physical activity. They cannot move or react as fast as normally. Heatful-blooded animals, properly clothed, are not subject to this handicap. In practical reality, this means that as unheatful conditions set in, the invader should always be attacked during the most unheatful period possible. Night attacks have much to recommend them. So do attacks at dusk or dawn. In general, avoid taking the offensive during heatful periods, such as early afternoon. Forecasts indicate that winter will be late this year, but severe when it comes. Remember, there is no year on record when temperatures have not dropped severely in the depths of winter. In such conditions, it is expected that the invader will be killed in large numbers by, untranslatable, of the blood. Our job is to make sure they are kept worn down until winter comes. Our job, then, will be to make sure none of them live through the winter. Bade looked up, feeling as if his digestive system were paralyzed. A messenger hurried across the room to hand him a thick report hastily put together by the intelligence service. It was titled, Harmful Myths and Definitions. Bade spent the first part of the night reading this spine-tingling document. The second part of the night he spent in nightmares. Toward morning, Bade had one vivid and comparatively pleasant dream. A native, wearing a simple cloth about his waist, looked at Bade intently and asked, Does the shark live in the air? Does a man breathe under water? Who will eat grass when he can have meat? Bade woke up feeling vaguely relieved. This sensation was swept away when he reached the operations room and saw the expression on Runkle's face. Runkle handed Bade a slip of paper. Hurricane Hannah approaching Long Island base. Intercepted enemy radio and television broadcasts spoke of Hurricane Hannah as the worst in thirty years. As Bade and Runkle sat by helplessly, Hurricane Hannah methodically pounded Long Island base to bits and pieces, then swept away the pieces. The hurricane moved on up the shoreline, treating every village and city along the way like a personal enemy. When Hurricane Hannah ended her career and retired to sink ships farther north, the Atlantic coast was a shambles from one end to the other. Out of this shambles moved a powerful enemy force, which seized the bulk of what was left of Long Island base. The remnant of survivors were trapped in the underground installations, and reported that the enemy was lowering a huge bomb down through the entrance. In Cuba, the reinforced garrison was barely holding on. A flood of recommendations now poured in on Bade. 1. Long Island base needed a whole landing force to escape capture. 2. Cuba base had to have at least another half landing force for reinforcements. 3. The Construction Corps required the ships of two full landing forces in order to power the forceway network. Otherwise, work on the key tools factories would be delayed. 4. Landing Site Command would need the ships and dampers of three landing forces to barely protect the base if the power supply of two landing forces were diverted to the Construction Corps. 5. 
The present main base was now completed and should be put to efficient use at once. 6. The present main base was worthless because Forceway Station 1 could not be repaired in time to link the base to the Forceway network. 7. Every field commander except General Kotick urgently needed heavy reinforcements without delay. 8. Studies by the staff showed the urgent need of building up the Central Reserve without delay at the expense of the field commanders if necessary. Bade gave up Long Island Base, ordered Cuba Base to hold on with what it had, told the landing site commander to select a suitable new main base near some southern forceway station free of tornadoes, and threw the rest of the recommendations into the wastebasket. Brunkle now came over with a rope smoldering stub jutting out of the corner of his mouth. Listen, he said to Bade, we're going to have a disciplinary problem on our hands. That Cuban garrison has been living on some kind of native paint remover called rum. The whole lot of them had a bad case of the staggering lurch from it. Not even the hurricane sobered them up. Poff knew what was going on, but he and his staff covered it over. His troops are worthless. Mulch and the reinforcements are doing all the fighting. Bade said, Poff is still in command? I put Mulch in charge. Good. We'll have to court-martial Poff and his staff. Can Mulch hold the base? He said he could, if we'd get Poff off his neck. Fine, said Bade. Once he gets things in order, ship the regular garrison to a temporary camp somewhere. We don't want Mulch's troops infected. Runkle nodded. A clerk apologized and stepped past Runkle to hand Bade a message. It was from General Frotch, who reported that all his atmospheric flyers based on Long Island had been lost in Hurricane Hannah. Bade showed the message to Runkle, who shook his head wearily. As Runkle strode away, another clerk put a scientific report on Bade's desk. Bade read it through, got Frotch on the line, and arranged for a special mission by Flyer Command. Then he located his report on harmful myths and definitions. Carefully, he read the definition of winter. To the best of our knowledge, winter is a severe periodic disease of plants, the actual onset of which is preceded by the vegetation turning various colors. The tall vegetables known as trees lose their foliage entirely, except for some few which are immune and are known as evergreens. As the disease progresses, the juices of the plants are squeezed out and crystallize in white feathery forms known as frost. Sufficient quantities of this squeezed out dry juice is snow. The mythology refers to snow falling from the sky. A possible explanation of this is that the large trees also snow, producing a fall of dry juice crystals. These crystals are clearly poisonous. Frostbite, chillblains, and even freezing to death are mentioned in the enemy's communication media. Even the atmosphere filled with the resulting vapor is said to be cold. Totally unexplainable is the common reference to children rolling up balls of this poisonous dried plant juice and hurling them at each other. This can only be presumed to be some sort of toughening exercise. More research on this problem is needed. Bade set this report down, reread the latest scientific report, then got up and slowly walked over to a big map of the globe. He gazed thoughtfully at various islands in the South Seas. Late that day, the ships lifted and moved to land again near Forceway Station 2. Power cables were run to the station across a sort of long, narrow valley at the bottom of which ran a thin trickle of water. By early morning of the next day, the Forceway network was in operation. Men and materials flashed thousands of miles in a moment, and work on the key tools factories accelerated sharply. Bade immersed himself in intelligence summaries of the enemy communications media. An item that especially interested him was winter late this year. By now there were three viewpoints on winter. A die-hard faction doggedly insisted that it was a myth, a mere quirk of the alien mentality. A large and very authoritative body of opinion held the plant juice theory and bolstered its stand with reams of data sheets and statistics. A small vociferous group asserted the heretical water crystal hypotheses and ate alone at small tables for doing so. General Frotch called Bade to say that the special flyer command mission was coming in to report. General Kotick sent word that enemy attacks were becoming more daring, that his troops' periods of inefficiency were more frequent, and that the vegetation in his district was turning color. He mentioned, for what it was worth, that troops within the fortifications seemed less effective than those outside. Troops far underground, however, seemed to be slowed down automatically, regardless of conditions on the surface, unless they were engaged in heavy physical labor. 
Bade scowled and sent off inquiries to his scientific sections. Then he heard excited voices and looked up. Four flyer command officers were coming slowly into the room, bright metal poles across their shoulders. Slung from the poles was a big plastic-wrapped bundle. The bundle was dripping steadily and leaving a trail of droplets that led out the door into the hall. The plastic was filmed over with a layer of tiny beads of moisture. Runkle came slowly to his feet. The officers, breathing heavily, set the big bundle on the floor near Bade's desk. Here it is, sir. Bade's glance was fastened on the object. Unwrap it. The officers bent over the bundle, and with clumsy fingers pulled back the plastic layer. The plastic stood up stiffly and bent only with a hard pull. Underneath was something covered with several of the enemy's thick, dark sleeping covers. The officers rolled the bundle back and forth and unwound the covers. An edge of some milky substance came into view. The officers pulled back the covers and a milky, semi-transparent block sat there, white vapor rolling out of it along the floor. There was a concerted movement away from the block and the officers. Bade said, Was the whole place like that? No, sir, but there was an awful lot of this stuff, and there was a compacted powdery kind of substance, too. We didn't bring enough of it back, and it all turned to water. Did you wear the protective clothes we captured? Yes, sir, but they had to be slit and zippered up the legs, because the enemy's feet are so small. The arms were a poor fit, and there had to be more material across the chest. How did they work? They were a great help, sir, as long as we kept moving. As soon as we slowed down, we started to stiffen up. The hand and foot gear was improvised and hard to work in, though. Bade looked thoughtfully at the smoldering block, then got up, stepped forward, and spread his hand close to the block. A numbness gradually dulled his hand and moved up his arm. Then Bade straightened up. He found he could move his hand only slowly and painfully. He motioned to Runkle. I think this is what cold is. Want to try it? Runkle got up held his hand to the block, then straightened, scowling. Bade felt a tingling sensation and worked his hand cautiously as Runkle, his face intent, slowly spread and closed his fingers. Bade thoughtfully congratulated the officers, then had the block carried off to the testing lab. The report on defense against reduced degree of heat now came in. Bade read this carefully several times over. The most striking point, he noticed, was the heavy energy expenditure involved. That afternoon, several ships took off, separated, and headed south. The next few days saw the completion of the first key tool factory, the receipt of reports from insect-bitten scouts in various regions far to the south, and a number of terse messages from General Kotick. Bade ordered plans drawn up for the immediate withdrawal of General Kotick's army, and for the possible withdrawal by stages of other forces in the north. He ordered preparations made for the first completed factories to produce anti-reduced degree of heat devices. He read a number of reports on the swiftly changing state of the planet's atmosphere. Large quantities of rain were predicted. Bade saw no reason to fear rain and turned to a new problem. The enemy's missiles had produced a superabundance of atomic debris in the atmosphere. Testing Lab was concerned over this and suggested various ways to get rid of it. Bade approved the projects and turned to the immediate problem of withdrawing the bulk of General Kotick's troops from their strong position without losing completely the advantages of it. Bade was considering the idea of putting a forceway station somewhere in Kotick's underground defenses so that he could be reinforced or withdrawn at will. This would involve complicated production difficulties, but then Kotick had said the slowing down was minimized under cover, and it might be worthwhile to hold an option on his position. While weighing the various intangibles and unpredictables, Bade received a report from General Rast. Rast was now noticing the same effect Kotick had reported. Word came in that two more key tool factories were now completed. Intelligence reports of enemy atmospheric data showed an enormous cold air mass moving down through Canada. General Frotch, personally supervising high-altitude atmospheric tests, now somehow got involved in a rushing high-level air stream. Having the power of concentrating his attention completely upon whatever he was doing, Frotch got bound up in the work and never realized the speed of the air stream until he came down again just behind the enemy lines. When Bade heard of this, he immediately went over the list of officers and found no one to replace Frotch. Bade studied the latest scientific reports and the disposition of his forces, then ordered an immediate switching of troops and aircraft through the forceway network toward the place where Frotch had vanished. 
A sharp thrust with local forces cut into the enemy defense system was followed up by heavy reinforcements flowing through the forceway network and developed an overpowering local superiority that swamped the enemy defenses. Runkel studied the resulting dispositions and said grimly, Heaven help us if they hit us hard in the right place just now. Yes, said Bade, and heaven help us if we don't get Frotch back. He continued his rapid switching of forces and ordered General Kotick to embark all his troops and set down near the main base. Flyer Command, meanwhile, began to show signs of headless disorientation. The ground commanders preemptorily ordering the air forces around as nothing more than close support and flying artillery. The enemy behind the line's communications network continued to function. Runkel now reported to Bade that no reply had been received from Kotick's headquarters. Runkel was sending a ship to investigate. Anguished complaints poured in from the technical divisions that their work was held up by the troops flooding the forceway network. The map now showed Bade's men driving forward in what looked like a full-scale battle to break the enemy's whole defensive arrangements and thrust clear through to the sea. Reports came in that, with the enemy's outer defense belt smashed, signs of unbelievable weakness were evident. The enemy seemed to have nothing but local reserves, and only a few of them. The general commanding on the spot announced that he could end the war if given a free hand. Bade now wondered, if the enemy's reserves weren't there, where were they? He repeated his original orders. Runkel now came over with the look of a half-drowned swimmer and motioned Bade to look at the two nearest view screens. One of the view screens showed a scene in shades of white. A layer of white covered the ground. Towering ships were plastered on one side with white. Obstacles were heaped over with white. The air filled with horizontal streaks of white. Everything on the screen was white or turning white. Kotick's base, said Runkel dully. The other screen gave a view of the long, narrow valley just outside. This valley was now a rushing torrent of foaming water, sweeping along chunks of floating debris that bobbed a hand's breadth under the power cables from the ships to Forceway Station 2. The only good news that day and the next was the recapture of General Frotch. In the midst of crumbling disorder, Flyer Command returned to normal. They'd sent off a specially equipped mission to try and find out what had happened to General Kotick. Then he looked up to see General Rast walking wearily into the room. Rast conferred with Runkel in low, dreary tones. Then the two of them started over toward Bade. Bade returned his attention to a chart showing the location of the key tools factories in the Forceway network. A sort of groan announced the arrival of Rast and Runkel. Bade looked up. Rast saluted. Bade returned the salute. Rast said stiffly, Sir, I have been defeated. My army no longer exists. Bade looked Rast over quickly, studying his expression and bearing. It's a plain fact, said Rast. Sir, I should be relieved of command. What's happened, said Bade. I have no reports of any new enemy attack. No, said Rast. There won't be any formal report. The whole northern front is anesthetized from one end to the other. Snow, said Bade. White death, said Rast. A messenger stepped past the two generals to hand Bade a report. It was from General Frotch. 1. Aerial reconnaissance shows heavy enemy forces moving south on a wide front through the snow-covered region. No response or resistance has been noted on the part of our troops. 2. Aerial reconnaissance shows light enemy forces moving in to ring General Kotick's position. The enemy appears to be moving with extreme caution. 3. It has so far proved impossible to get in touch with General Kotick. 4. It must be reported that on several occasions our ground troops have, as individuals, attempted to seize from our flyer pilots and crews their special protective anti-reduced degree of heat garments. This problem is becoming serious. Bade looked up at Rast. Your ground forces, Commander, not Commander of a single front. That's so, said Rast. I should be. But all I command now is a kind of mob. I've tried to keep the troops in order, but they know one thing after another is going wrong. Naturally... They put the blame on their leaders. The room seemed to Bay to grow unnaturally light and clear. He said, Have you had an actual case of mutiny, Rast? Rast stiffened. No, sir, but it is possible for troops to be so laggardly and unwilling that the effect is the same. What I mean is that there is a steady growth of a cynical attitude everywhere, not only in the troops, but in the officers. Bade looked off at the far corner of the room for a moment. He glanced at Runkel. What's the state of the key tools factories? Almost all completed, but the northern ones are now in the reduced degree of heat zone. 
Part of the Forceway network is, too. Using the key tools plants remaining, it might be possible to patch together some kind of a makeshift, but the reduced degree of heat zone is still moving south. A pale clerk apologized, stepped around the generals, and handed Bade two messages. The first was from intelligence. Enemy propaganda broadcasts beamed at our troops, announced General Kotick's unconditional surrender with all his forces. We have no independent information on Kotick's actual situation. The second message was from the commander of Number 1 Shock Infantry Division. This report boiled down to a miserable confession that the commanding officer found himself unable to prevent 1. Fraternization with the enemy 2. The use of various liquid narcotics that rendered troops unfit for duty 3. The unauthorized wearing of red, white, and blue buttons lettered Vote Republican 4. An ugly game called Foot Base in which the troops separated into two long lines armed with bats to hammer, pound, beat, and kick a ball called the officer from one end of the field to the other. Bade looked up at Rast. How is it I only find out about this now? Sir, said Rast, each of the officers was ashamed to report it to his superior. Bade handed the report to Runkle, who read it through and looked up somberly. If it's hit the shock troops... The rest must have it worse. Yet, said Bade, the troops fought well when we recaptured Frotch. Yes, said Rast, but it's the damned planet that's driving them crazy. The natives are remarkable propagandists, and the men can plainly see that even when they win a victory, some freak like the exploding sickness or some kind of atmospheric jugglery is likely to take it right away from them. They're in a bad mood, and the only thing that might snap them out of it is definite action— but if they go the other way, we're finished. This, said Bade, is no time for you to resign. Sir, it's a mess, and I'm responsible. I have to make the offer to resign. Well, said Bade, I don't accept it. But we'll have to try to straighten out this mess. Bade pushed over several sheets of paper. On the first he wrote, Official News Bureau, 1. Categorically deny the capture of General Kotick and his base. State that General Kotick is in full control of the North, that the enemy has succeeded in infiltrating troops into the general region under cover of snow, but that he has been repulsed with heavy losses in all attacks on the base itself. 2. State that the enemy announcement of victory in the area is a desperation measure, time to coincide with their almost unopposed advance through the evacuated northern front. 3. The larger part of the troops in the northern front were withdrawn prior to the attack and switched by forceway network to launch a heavy fainting attack against the enemy. State that the enemy, caught by surprise, appears to be rushing reserves from his northern armies to cover the areas threatened by the feint. 4. Devoted troops who held the northern front to make the deception succeed have now been overrun by the enemy advance under cover of the snow. Their heroic sacrifice will not be forgotten. 5. The enemy now faces the snow time alone. His usual preventive measures have been drastically slowed down. His intended decisive attack has failed of its object. The snow this year is unusually severe and is already working heavy punishment on the enemy. 6. Secret measures are now for the first time being brought into the open that will place our troops far beyond the reach of snow. On the second sheet of paper, Bade wrote, Director of Protocol, prepare immediately. 1. Supreme Commander's citation for extraordinary bravery and resourcefulness in action to be awarded General Kotick. 2. Supreme Commander's Citation for Extraordinary Devotion to Duty, to be awarded singly to each soldier on duty during the enemy attack on the entire Northern Front. 3. These awards are both to be mentioned promptly in the daily notices. Bade handed the papers to Runkle. Send these out yourself. As Runkle started off, Bade looked at Rast, then was interrupted by a messenger who stepped past Rast and handed Bade two slips of paper. With an effort of will... Bade extended his hand and took the papers. He read, Sir, Exploration Team South 3 has located Ideal Island Base. Full details follow. Frotch. Sir, we have finally contacted General Kotick. He and his troops are dug into underground warrens of great complexity beneath his system of fortifications. Most of the ships above ground are mere shells, all removable equipment having been stripped out and carried below for the comfort of the troops. Most of the ship's engines have also been disassembled one at a time, carried below, and set up to run the dampers, which are likewise below ground, and the heating units, devised by Kotick's technical personnel. His troops appear to be in good order and high spirits. 
Scaff, Commander, AFC, forwarded by Frotch. Bade sucked in a deep breath and gave silent thanks. Then he handed the two reports to Rast. Bade snapped on a microphone and got in touch with Frotch. Listen, can you get pictures of Kotick and his men? Frotch held up a handful of pictures, spread like playing cards. The men took them for souvenirs and gave me copies. You can have all you want. Bade immediately called his photoprint division and gave orders for the pictures to be duplicated by the thousands. The photoprint division slaved all night, and the excited troops had the pictures on their bulletin boards by the next morning. The official news service, meanwhile, was dinning Bade's propaganda into the troops' ears at every opportunity. The appearance of the pictures now plainly caught the enemy propaganda out on a limb. Doubting one thing the enemy propaganda had said, the troops suddenly doubted all. A violent revulsion of feeling took place. Before anything else could happen, Bade ordered the troops embarked. By this time, the apparently harmless rain had produced a severe flood, which repeatedly threatened the power cables supplying the Forceway network. The troops had to use this network to get to the ships in time. As Bade's military engineers blasted out alternate channels for the rising water, and a fervent headquarters group prayed for a drought, the troops poured through the still operative Forceway stations and marched into the ships with joyful shouts. The enemy joined the celebration with a mammoth missile attack. The embarkation, together with the disassembling of vital parts of the accessible key tools factories, took several days. During this time, the enemy continued his steady, methodical advance well behind the front of the cold air mass. The enemy, however, made no sudden thrust on the ground to take advantage of the embarkation. Bade pondered this sign of tiredness, then sent up a ship to radio a quarry home. When the answer came, Bade sent a message to the enemy government. The message began, Sirs, this scouting expedition has now completed its mission. We are now withdrawing to winter quarters, which may be A, an unspecified distant location, B, California, C, Florida. If you are prepared to accept certain temporary armistice conditions, we will understand we must choose A. Otherwise, you will understand we must choose B or C. If you are prepared to consider these armistice conditions, you are strongly urged to send a plenipotentiary without delay. The plenipotentiary should be prepared to consider both the temporary armistice and the matters of mutual benefit to us. Bade waited tersely for the reply. He had before him two papers, one of which read, The enemy-held peninsula of Florida has thus been found to be heavily infested with heartworm, parasites which live inside the heart, slow circulation, and lower vital activity sharply. While the enemy appears to be immune to infestation, our troops plainly are not. The four scouts who returned here have at last, we believe, been cured, but they have not as yet recovered their strength. The state of things in nearby Cuba is not yet known for certain. Possibly the troops' enormous consumption of native rum has interacted medicinally with our blood chemistry to retard infestation. If so, we have our choice of calamities. In any case, a landing in Florida would be ruinous. As for California, the other report concluded, Statistical studies based on past experience lead us to believe that, myth or no myth, immediately upon our landing in California, there will be a terrific earthquake. Bade had no desire to go to Florida or California. He fervently hoped the enemy would not guess this. At length the reply came. Bade read through ominous references to the growing might of the United States of the world, then came to the operative sentence. Our plenipotentiary will be authorized to treat only with regard to an armistice. He is authorized only to transmit other information to his government. He is not empowered to make any agreement whatever on matters other than an armistice. The plenipotentiary was a tall, thin native who constantly sponged water off his neck and forehead, and who looked at Bade as if he would like to cram a nuclear missile down his throat. Getting an agreement was hard work. The plenipotentiary finally accepted Bade's first condition— that General Kotick not be attacked for the duration of the armistice, but flatly refused the second condition, allowing the continued occupation of western Cuba. After a lengthy verbal wrestling match, the plenipotentiary at last agreed to a temporary continuation of the western Cuban occupation, provided that the Gulf of Mexico blockade be lifted. Bade agreed to this, and the plenipotentiary departed, mopping his forehead. Bade immediately lifted ships and headed south, his ships came down to seize sections of Sumatra, Java, and Borneo, with outposts on the Christmas and Cocoa Islands, and on small islands in the Indonesian archipelago. 
Bade's personal headquarters were on a pleasant little island, conveniently located in the Sundra Strait between Java and Sumatra. The name of the island was Krakatoa. Bade was under no illusion that the inhabitants of the islands welcomed his arrival. Fortunately, however, the armament of his troops outclassed anything in the vicinity, with the possible exception of a bristly-looking place called Singapore. Bade's scouts, after studying Singapore carefully, concluded it was not mobile, and if they left it alone, it would leave them alone. The enemy plenipotentiary now arrived in a large battleship and was greeted in the islands with frenzied enthusiasm. Bade was too absorbed in reports of rapidly improving morale and highly successful mass swimming exercises to care about this welcome, although the ominous document titled War in the Islands, U.S. Japan, sat among the translated volumes of history at Bade's elbow and served as a constant reminder that this pleasant situation could not be expected to last forever. Bade intended to enjoy it while it did last. Bade greeted the plenipotentiary in his pleasant headquarters on the leveled top of the tall picturesque cone-shaped hill that rose high above Krakatoa, then dropped off abruptly by the sea. The plenipotentiary, on entering the headquarters, mopped his brow constantly, kept glancing furtively around, and was plainly ill at ease. The interpreters took their places, and the conversation opened. "'As you see,' said Bade, "'we are comfortably settled here for the winter.' The plenipotentiary looked around and gave a hollow laugh. "'We are,' added Bade, "'perfectly prepared to return next, uh, summer, "'and take up where we left off.' "'By next summer,' said the plenipotentiary, "'the United States will be a solid mass of guns "'from one coast to the other.' Bade shrugged, and the plenipotentiary added grimly, "'And missiles.' Despite himself, Bade winced. One of Bade's clerks, carrying a message across the far end of the room, became distracted in his effort to be sure he heard everything. The clerk was busy watching Bade when he banged into the back of a tall filing case. The case tilted off balance, then started to fall forward. A second clerk sprang up to catch the side of the case. There was a low, heavy rumble as all the drawers slid out. The plenipotentiary sprang to his feet and looked wildly around. The filing case twisted out of the hands of the clerk and came down on the floor with a thundering crash. The plenipotentiary snapped his eyes tightly shut, clenched his teeth, and stood perfectly still. Bade and Runkle looked blankly at each other. The plenipotentiary slowly opened his eyes, looked wonderingly around the room, jumped as the two clerks heaved the filing case upright, turned around to stare at the clerks and the case, turned back to look sharply at Bade, then clamped his jaw. Bade, his own face as calm as he could make it, decided this might be a good time as any to throw in a hard punch. He remarked, You have two choices. You can make a mutually profitable agreement with us, or you can force us to switch heavier forces and weapons to this planet and crush you. Which is it? We, said the plenipotentiary coldly, have the resources of the whole planet at our disposal. You have to bring everything from a distance. Moreover, we have captured a good deal of your equipment, which we may duplicate. Lesser weapons, said Bade, as if an enemy captured your rifles, duplicated them at great expense, and was then confronted with your nuclear bomb. This is our planet, said the plenipotentiary grimly, and we will fight for it to the end. We don't want your planet. The plenipotentiary's eyes widened. Then he burst into a string of invective that the translators couldn't follow. When he had finished, he took a deep breath and recapitulated the main point. If you don't want it, what are you doing here? Bade said, Your people are clearly warlike. After observing you for some time, a debate arose on our planet as to whether we should hit you or wait till you hit us. After a fierce debate, the first faction won. Wait a minute. How could we hit you? You come from another planet, don't you? Yes, that's true, but it's also true that a baby shark is no great menace to anyone, except that he will grow up into a big shark. That is how our first faction looked on Earth. The plenipotentiary scowled. In other words, you'll kill the suspect before he has a chance to commit the crime. Then you justify it by saying the man would have committed a crime if he'd lived. We didn't intend to kill you, only to disarm you. How does all this square with your telling us you're just a scout party? Are you under the impression, said Bade, that this is the main invasion force? 
Would we attack without a full reconnaissance first? Do you think we would merely make one sizable landing on one continent? How could we hope to conquer in that way? The plenipotentiary frowned, sucked in a deep breath, and mopped his forehead. What's your offer? Disarm yourselves voluntarily. All hostilities will end immediately. The plenipotentiary gave a harsh laugh. Bade said, What's your answer? What's your real offer? As I remarked, said Bade, there were two factions on our planet. One favored the attack as self-preservation. The other faction opposed the attack on moral and political grounds. The second faction at present holds that it is now impossible to remain aloof, as we had hoped to before the attack. One way or the other, we are now bound up with Earth. We either have to be enemies or friends. As it happens, I am a member of the bloc that opposed the attack. The bloc that favored the attack has lost support owing to the results of our initial operations. Because of this political shift, I have practically a free hand at the moment. Bade paused as the plenipotentiary turned his head slightly and leaned forward with an intent look. Bade said, Your country has suffered by far the most from our attack. Obviously it should profit the most. We have a number of scientific advances to offer as bargaining counters. Our essential condition is that we retain some overt standing, some foothold, some way of knowing by direct observation that this planet, or any nation of it, won't attack us. The plenipotentiary scowled. Every nation on Earth is pretty closely allied as a result of your attack. We're a world of United States, all practically one nation, and all the land on the globe belongs to one of us or the other. While there's bound to be considerable regional rivalry even when we have peace, that's all. Otherwise we're united. As a result, there's not going to be any peace, as long as you've got your foot on land belonging to any of us. That includes Java, Sumatra, and even this, uh, mountain we're on now. He looked around uneasily and added, We might let you have a little base somewhere, maybe in Antarctica, but I doubt it. We won't want any foreign planet sticking its nose in our business. Bade said, My proposal allows for that. I don't see how it could, said the plenipotentiary. What is it? Bade told him. The plenipotentiary sat as if he had been hit over the head with a rock. Then he let out a mighty burst of laughter, banged his hand on his knee, and said, You're serious? Absolutely. The plenipotentiary sprang to his feet. I'll have to get in touch with my government. Who knows? Maybe. Who knows? He strode out briskly. About this time, a number of fast ships arrived from home. These ships were much in use during the next months. Delegations from both planets flew in both directions. Runkel was highly uneasy. Incessantly, he demanded, Will it work? What if they flood our planet with a whole mob? I have it on good authority, said Bade, that our planet is every bit as uncomfortable for them as theirs is for us. We almost lost one of their delegates straight down through the mud on the last visit. They have to use dozens of towels for handkerchiefs every day, and that trace of ammonia in the atmosphere doesn't seem to agree with them. Some of them have even gotten fog sick. Why should they go along with the idea, then? It fits in with their nature. Besides, where else are they going to get another one? As one of their senators put it, everything here on Earth is sewed up. There's even a manifest destiny argument. Well, the idea has attractions, but... Listen, said Bade, I'm told not to prolong the war, because it's too costly and dangerous, not to leave behind a reservoir of fury to discharge on us in the future, not to surrender, not in the present circumstances to expect them to surrender. I am told to somehow keep a watch on them and bind their interests to ours, and not to forget the tie must be more than just on paper. It's got to be emotional as well as legal. On top of that, if possible, I'm supposed to open up commercial opportunities. Can you think of any other way? Frankly, no, said Runkel. There was a grumbling sound underneath them, and the room shivered slightly. What was that? said Runkel. Bade looked around, frowning. I don't know. A clerk came across the room and handed Runkel a message, and Bade another message. Runkel looked up, scowling. The sea water here is beginning to have an irritating effect on our men's skin. Never mind, said Bade. Their plenipotentiary is coming. We'll know one way or the other shortly. Runkel looked worried and began searching through his wastebasket. 
the plenipotentiary came in grinning. Okay, he said. The Russians are a little burned up, and I don't think Texas is any too happy. But nobody can think of a better way out. You're in. He and Bade shook hands fervently. Photographers rushed in to snap pictures. Outside, Bade's band was playing the Star-Spangled Banner. Another state, said the plenipotentiary, grinning expansively. How's it feel to be a citizen? Runkel erupted from his wastebasket and bolted across the room. Krakatoa is a volcano, he shouted, and here's what a volcano is. There was a faint but distinct rumble underfoot. The room emptied fast. On the way home, they were discussing things. Bade was saying, I don't claim it's perfect, but then our two planets are so mutually uncomfortable, there's bound to be little travel either way till we have a chance to get used to each other. Yet, we can go back and forth. Who has a better right than a citizen? And there's a good chance of trade and mutual profit. There's a good emotional tie, he frowned. There's just one thing. What's that? said Runkle. Bade opened a translated book to a page he had turned down. He read silently. He looked up perplexedly. Runkle, he said, there are certain technicalities involved in being a citizen. Runkle tensed. What do you mean? Oh, well, like this. He looked back at the book for a moment. What is it? demanded Runkle. Well, said Bade, what do you suppose income tax is? Runkle looked relieved. He shrugged. Don't worry about it, he said. It's too fantastic. Probably it's just a myth. 